part one chapter five section six of the possessed by fyodor dostoevsky translated by constance garnett this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter five the subtle serpent section six it was very little of it talk however it was mostly exclamation i've forgotten a little the order in which things happened for a scene of confusion followed stepan trofimovitch uttered some exclamation in french clasping his hands but varvara petrovna had no thought for him even mavriki nikolaevitch muttered some rapid jerky comment but pyotr stepanovitch was the most excited of all he was trying desperately with bold gesticulations to persuade varvara petrovna of something but it was a long time before i could make out what it was he appealed to praskovya ivanovna and lizaveta nikolaevna too even in his excitement addressed a passing shout to his father in fact he seemed all over the room at once varvara petrovna flushing all over sprang up from her seat and cried to praskovya ivanovna did you hear what he said to her here just now did you hear it but the latter was incapable of replying she could only mutter something and wave her hand the poor woman had troubles of her own to think about she kept turning her head towards liza and was watching her with unaccountable terror but she didn't even dare to think of getting up and going away until her daughter should get up in the meantime the captain wanted to slip away that i noticed there was no doubt that he had been in a great panic from the instant that nikolai vsyevolodovitch had made his appearance but pyotr stepanovitch took him by the arm and would not let him go it is necessary quite necessary he pattered on to varvara petrovna still trying to persuade her he stood facing her as she was sitting down again in her easy chair and i remember was listening to him eagerly he had succeeded in securing her attention it is necessary you can see for yourself varvara petrovna that there is a misunderstanding here and much that is strange on the surface and yet the things as clear as daylight and as simple as my finger i quite understand that no one has authorized me to tell the story and i dare say i look ridiculous putting myself forward but in the first place nikolai vsyevolodovitch attaches no sort of significance to the matter himself and besides there are incidents of which it is difficult for a man to make up his mind to give an explanation himself and so it's absolutely necessary that it should be undertaken by a third person for whom it's easier to put some delicate points into words believe me varvara petrovna that nikolai vsyevolodovitch is not at all to blame for not immediately answering your question just now with a full explanation it's all a trivial affair i've known him since his petersburg days besides the whole story only does honour to nikolai vsyevolodovitch if one must make use of that vague word honour you mean to say that you were a witness of some incident which gave rise to this misunderstanding asked varvara petrovna i witnessed it and took part in it pyotr stepanovitch hastened to declare if you'll give me your word that this will not wound nikolai vsyevolodovitch's delicacy in regard to his feeling for me from whom he never conceals anything and if you are convinced also that your doing this will be agreeable to him certainly it will be agreeable and for that reason i consider it a particularly agreeable duty i am convinced that he would beg me to do it himself the intrusive desire of this gentleman who seemed to have dropped on us from heaven to tell stories about other people's affairs was rather strange and inconsistent with ordinary usage but he had caught varvara petrovna by touching on too painful a spot i did not know the man's character at that time and still less his designs i am listening varvara petrovna announced with a reserved and cautious manner she was rather painfully aware of her condescension it's a short story in fact if you like it's not a story at all he rattled on though a novelist might work it up into a novel in an idle hour it's rather an interesting little incident praskovya ivanovna and i am sure that lizaveta nikolaevna will be interested to hear it because there are a great many things in it that are odd if not wonderful five years ago in petersburg nikolai vsyevolodovitch made the acquaintance of this gentleman 
this very mr lebyadkin who's standing here with his mouth open anxious i think to slip away at once excuse me varvara petrovna i don't advise you to make your escape though you discharged clerk in the former commissariat department you see i remember you very well nikolai vsyevolodovitch and i know very well what you've been up to here and don't forget you'll have to answer for it i ask your pardon once more varvara petrovna in those days nikolai vsyevolodovitch used to call this gentleman his falstaff that must be he explained suddenly some old burlesque character at whom everyone laughs and who is willing to let everyone laugh at him if only they'll pay him for it nikolai vsyevolodovitch was leading at that time in petersburg a life so to say of mockery i can't find another word to describe it because he is not a man who falls into disillusionment and he disdained to be occupied with work at that time i'm only speaking of that period varvara petrovna lebyadkin had a sister the woman who was sitting here just now the brother and sister hadn't a corner of their own but were always quartering themselves on different people he used to hang about the arcades in the gostiny dvor always wearing his old uniform and would stop the more respectable-looking passers-by and everything he got from them he'd spend in drink his sister lived like the birds of heaven she'd help people in their corners and do jobs for them on occasion it was a regular bedlam i'll pass over the description of this life in corners a life to which nikolai vsyevolodovitch had taken at that time from eccentricity i'm only talking of that period varvara petrovna as for eccentricity that's his own expression he does not conceal much from me mademoiselle lebyadkin who was thrown in the way of meeting nikolai vsyevolodovitch very often at one time was fascinated by his appearance he was so to say a diamond set in the dirty background of her life i am a poor hand at describing feelings so i'll pass them over but some of that dirty lot took to jeering at her once and it made her sad they always had laughed at her but she did not seem to notice it before she wasn't quite right in her head even then but very different from what she is now there's reason to believe that in her childhood she received something like an education through the kindness of a benevolent lady nikolai vsyevolodovitch had never taken the slightest notice of her he used to spend his time chiefly in playing preference with a greasy old pack of cards for stakes of a quarter farthing with clerks but once when she was being ill-treated he went up without inquiring into the cause and seized one of the clerks by the collar and flung him out of a second-floor window it was not a case of chivalrous indignation at the sight of injured innocence the whole operation took place in the midst of roars of laughter and the one who laughed loudest was nikolai vsyevolodovitch himself as it all ended without harm they were reconciled and began drinking punch but the injured innocent herself did not forget it of course it ended in her being completely crazy i repeat i'm a poor hand at describing feelings but a delusion was the chief feature in this case and nikolai vsyevolodovitch aggravated that delusion as though he did it on purpose instead of laughing at her he began all at once treating mademoiselle lebyadkin with sudden respect kirillov who was there a very original man varvara petrovna and very abrupt you'll see him perhaps one day for he's here now well this kirillov who as a rule is perfectly silent suddenly got hot and said to nikolai vsyevolodovitch i remember that he treated the girl as though she were a marquise and that that was doing for her altogether i must add that nikolai vsyevolodovitch had rather a respect for this kirillov what do you suppose was the answer he gave him you imagine mr kirillov that i am laughing at her get rid of that idea i really do respect her for she's better than any of us and do you know he said it in such a serious tone meanwhile he hadn't really said a word to her for two or three months except good morning and good-bye i remember for i was there that she came at last to the point of looking on him almost as her betrothed who dared not elope with her simply because he had many enemies and family difficulties or something of the sort there was a great deal of laughter about it 
it ended in nikolai vsyevolodovitch's making provision for her when he had to come here and i believe he arranged to pay a considerable sum three hundred roubles a year if not more as a pension for her in short it was all a caprice a fancy of a man prematurely weary on his side perhaps it may even have been as kirillov says a new experiment of a blasé man with the object of finding out what you can bring a crazy cripple to you picked out on purpose he said the lowest creature a cripple forever covered with disgrace and blows knowing too that this creature was dying of comic love for you and set to work to mystify her completely on purpose simply to see what would come of it though how is a man so particularly to blame for the fancies of a crazy woman to whom he had hardly uttered two sentences the whole time there are things varvara petrovna of which it is not only impossible to speak sensibly but it's even nonsensical to begin speaking of them at all well eccentricity then let it stand at that anyway there's nothing worse to be said than that and yet now they've made this scandal out of it i am to some extent aware varvara petrovna of what is happening here the speaker suddenly broke off and was turning to lebyadkin but varvara petrovna checked him she was in a state of extreme exultation have you finished she asked not yet to complete my story i should have to ask this gentleman one or two questions if you'll allow me you'll see the point in a minute varvara petrovna enough afterwards leave it for the moment i beg you oh i was quite right to let you speak and note this varvara petrovna pyotr stepanovitch said hastily could nikolai vsyevolodovitch have explained all this just now in answer to your question which was perhaps too peremptory oh yes it was and wasn't i right in saying that in some cases it's much easier for a third person to explain things than for the person interested yes yes but in one thing you were mistaken and i see with regret are still mistaken really what's that you see but won't you sit down pyotr stepanovitch oh as you please i am tired indeed thank you he instantly moved up an easy chair and turned it so that he had varvara petrovna on one side and praskovya ivanovna at the table on the other while he faced lebyadkin from whom he did not take his eyes for one minute you are mistaken in calling this eccentricity oh if it's only that no 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 wait a little said varvara petrovna who was obviously about to say a good deal and to speak with enthusiasm as soon as pyotr stepanovitch noticed it he was all attention no it was something higher than eccentricity and i assure you something sacred even a proud man who has suffered humiliation early in life and reached the stage of mockery as you so subtly called it prince harry in fact to use the capital nickname stepan trofimovitch gave him then which would have been perfectly correct if it were not that he is more like hamlet to my thinking at least et vous avez raison stepan trofimovitch pronounced impressively and with feeling thank you stepan trofimovitch i thank you particularly too for your unvarying faith in nicholas in the loftiness of his soul and of his destiny that faith you have even strengthened in me when i was losing heart cher cher stepan trofimovitch was stepping forward when he checked himself reflecting that it was dangerous to interrupt and if nicholas had always had at his side varvara petrovna almost shouted a gentle horatio great in his humility another excellent expression of yours stepan trofimovitch he might long ago have been saved from the sad and sudden demon of irony which has tormented him all his life the demon of irony was a wonderful expression of yours again stepan trofimovitch but nicholas has never had an horatio or an ophelia he had no one but his mother and what can a mother do alone and in such circumstances do you know pyotr stepanovitch it's perfectly comprehensible to me now that a being like nicholas could be found even in such filthy haunts as you have described i can so clearly picture now that mockery of life a wonderfully subtle expression of yours that insatiable thirst of contrast that gloomy background against which he stands out like a diamond to use your comparison again pyotr stepanovitch and then he meets there a creature ill-treated by every one crippled half insane and at the same time perhaps filled with noble feelings hm yes perhaps and after that you don't understand that he's not laughing at her like every one oh you people 
you can't understand his defending her from insult treating her with respect like a marquise this kirillov must have had an exceptionally deep understanding of men though he didn't understand nicholas it was just this contrast if you like that led to the trouble if the unhappy creature had been in different surroundings perhaps she would never have been brought to entertain such a frantic delusion only a woman can understand it pyotr stepanovitch only a woman how sorry i am that you not that you're not a woman but that you can't be one just for the moment so as to understand you mean in the sense that the worse things are the better it is i understand i understand barbara petrovna it's rather as it is in religion the harder life is for a man or the more crushed and poor the people are the more obstinately they dream of compensation in heaven and if a hundred thousand priests are at work at it too inflaming their delusion and speculating on it then i understand you varvara petrovna i assure you that's not quite it but tell me ought nicholas to have laughed at her and have treated her as the other clerks in order to extinguish the delusion in this unhappy organism why varvara petrovna used the word organism i couldn't understand can you really refuse to recognize the lofty compassion the noble tremor of the whole organism with which nicholas answered kirillov i do not laugh at her a noble sacred answer sublime muttered stepan trofimovitch and observe too that he is by no means so rich as you suppose the money is mine and not his and he would take next to nothing from me then i understand i understand all that varvara petrovna said pyotr stepanovitch with a movement of some impatience oh it's my character i recognize myself in nicholas i recognize that youthfulness that liability to violent tempestuous impulses and if we ever come to be friends pyotr stepanovitch and for my part i sincerely hope we may especially as i am so deeply indebted to you then perhaps you'll understand oh i assure you i hope for it too pyotr stepanovitch muttered jerkily you'll understand then the impulse which leads one in the blindness of generous feeling to take up a man who is unworthy of one in every respect a man who utterly fails to understand one who is ready to torture one at every opportunity and in contradiction to everything to exalt such a man into a sort of ideal into a dream to concentrate in him all one's hopes to bow down before him to love him all one's life absolutely without knowing why perhaps just because he was unworthy of it oh how i've suffered all my life pyotr stepanovitch stepan trofimovitch with a look of suffering on his face began trying to catch my eye but i turned away in time and only lately only lately oh how unjust i've been to nicholas you would not believe how they have been worrying me on all sides all all enemies and rascals and friends friends perhaps more than enemies when the first contemptible anonymous letter was sent to me pyotr stepanovitch you'll hardly believe it but i had not strength enough to treat all this wickedness with contempt i shall never never forgive myself for my weakness i had heard something of anonymous letters here already said pyotr stepanovitch growing suddenly more lively and i'll find out the writers of them you may be sure but you can't imagine the intrigues that have been got up here they have even been pestering our poor praskovya ivanovna and what reason can they have for worrying her i was quite unfair to you to-day perhaps my dear praskovya ivanovna she added in a generous impulse of kindliness though not without a certain triumphant irony don't say any more my dear the other lady muttered reluctantly to my thinking we'd better make an end of all this too much has been said and again she looked timidly towards liza but the latter was looking at pyotr stepanovitch and i intend now to adopt this poor unhappy creature this insane woman who has lost everything and kept only her heart varvara petrovna exclaimed suddenly it's a sacred duty i intend to carry out i take her under my protection from this day and that will be a very good thing in one way pyotr stepanovitch cried growing quite eager again excuse me i did not finish just now it's just the care of her i want to speak of would you believe it that as soon as nikolai vsyevolodovitch had gone i'm beginning from where i left off varvara petrovna this gentleman here this mr lebyadkin 
instantly imagined he had the right to dispose of the whole pension that was provided for his sister and he did dispose of it i don't know exactly how it had been arranged by nikolai vsyevolodovitch at that time but a year later when he learned from abroad what had happened he was obliged to make other arrangements again i don't know the details he'll tell you them himself i only know that the interesting young person was placed somewhere in a remote nunnery in very comfortable surroundings but under friendly superintendence you understand but what do you think mr lebyadkin made up his mind to do he exerted himself to the utmost to begin with to find where his source of income that is his sister was hidden only lately he attained his object took her from the nunnery assorting some claim to her and brought her straight here here he doesn't feed her properly beats her and bullies her as soon as by some means he gets a considerable sum from nikolai vsyevolodovitch he does nothing but get drunk and instead of gratitude ends by impudently defying nikolai vsyevolodovitch making senseless demands threatening him with proceedings if the pension is not paid straight into his hands so he takes what is a voluntary gift from nikolai vsyevolodovitch as a tax can you imagine it mr lebyadkin is that all true that i have said just now the captain who had till that moment stood in silence looking down took two rapid steps forward and turned crimson pyotr stepanovitch you've treated me cruelly he brought out abruptly why cruelly how but allow us to discuss the question of cruelty or gentleness later on now answer my first question is it true all that i have said or not if you consider it's false you are at liberty to give your own version at once i you know yourself pyotr stepanovitch the captain muttered but he could not go on and relapsed into silence it must be observed that pyotr stepanovitch was sitting in an easy chair with one leg crossed over the other while the captain stood before him in the most respectful attitude lebyadkin's hesitation seemed to annoy pyotr stepanovitch a spasm of anger distorted his face then you have a statement you want to make he said looking subtly at the captain kindly speak we're waiting for you you know yourself pyotr stepanovitch that i can't say anything no i don't know it it's the first time i've heard it why can't you speak the captain was silent with his eyes on the ground allow me to go pyotr stepanovitch he brought out resolutely no not till you answer my question is it all true that i've said it is true lebyadkin brought out in a hollow voice looking at his tormentor drops of perspiration stood out on his forehead is it all true it's all true have you nothing to add or to observe if you think that we've been unjust say so protest state your grievance aloud no i think nothing did you threaten nikolai vsyevolodovitch lately it was it was more drink than anything pyotr stepanovitch he suddenly raised his head if family honour and undeserved disgrace cry out among men then then is a man to blame he roared suddenly forgetting himself as before are you sober now mr lebyadkin pyotr stepanovitch looked at him penetratingly i am sober what do you mean by family honour and undeserved disgrace i didn't mean anybody anybody at all i meant myself the captain said collapsing again you seem to be very much offended by what i've said about you and your conduct you are very irritable mr lebyadkin but let me tell you i've hardly begun yet what i've got to say about your conduct in its real sense i'll begin to discuss your conduct in its real sense i shall begin that may very well happen but so far i've not begun in a real sense lebyadkin started and stared wildly at pyotr stepanovitch pyotr stepanovitch i am just beginning to wake up hm and it's i who have waked you up yes it's you who have waked me pyotr stepanovitch and i've been asleep for the last four years with a storm cloud hanging over me may i withdraw at last pyotr stepanovitch now you may unless varvara petrovna thinks it necessary but the latter dismissed him with a wave of her hand the captain bowed took two steps towards the door stopped suddenly laid his hand on his heart tried to say something did not say it and was moving quickly away but in the doorway he came face to face with nikolai vsyevolodovitch the latter stood aside the captain shrank into himself as it were before him and stood as though frozen to the spot his eyes fixed upon him like a rabbit before a boa constrictor 
after a little pause nikolai vsyevolodovitch waved him aside with a slight motion of his hand and walked into the drawing-room end of chapter five section six recording by expatriate in bangor maine part one chapter five section seven of the possessed by fyodor dostoevsky translated by constance garnett this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter five the subtle serpent section seven he was cheerful and serene perhaps something very pleasant had happened to him of which we knew nothing as yet but he seemed particularly contented do you forgive me nicolas varvara petrovna hastened to say and got up suddenly to meet him but nicolas positively laughed just as i thought he said good-humouredly and jestingly i see you know all about it already when i had gone from here i reflected in the carriage that i ought at least to have told you the story instead of going off like that but when i remembered that pyotr stepanovitch was still here i thought no more of it as he spoke he took a cursory look round pyotr stepanovitch told us an old petersburg episode in the life of a queer fellow varvara petrovna rejoined enthusiastically a mad and capricious fellow though always lofty in his feelings always chivalrous and noble chivalrous you don't mean to say it's come to that laughed nicholas however i'm very grateful to pyotr stepanovitch for being in such a hurry this time he exchanged a rapid glance with the latter you must know maman that pyotr stepanovitch is the universal peacemaker that's his part in life his weakness his hobby and i particularly recommend him to you from that point of view i can guess what a yarn he's been spinning he's a great hand at spinning them he has a perfect record office in his head he's such a realist you know that he can't tell a lie and prefers truthfulness to effect except of course in special cases when effect is more important than truth as he said this he was still looking about him so you see clearly maman that it's not for you to ask my forgiveness and if there's any craziness about this affair it's my fault and it proves that when all's said and done i really am mad i must keep up my character here then he tenderly embraced his mother in any case the subject has been fully discussed and is done with he added and there was a rather dry and resolute note in his voice varvara petrovna understood that note but her exaltation was not damped quite the contrary i didn't expect you for another month nicolas i will explain everything to you maman of course but now and he went towards praskovya ivanovna but she scarcely turned her head towards him though she had been completely overwhelmed by his first appearance now she had fresh anxieties to think of at the moment the captain had stumbled upon nikolai vsyevolodovitch as he was going out liza had suddenly begun laughing at first quietly and intermittently but her laughter grew more and more violent louder and more conspicuous she flushed crimson in striking contrast with her gloomy expression just before while nikolai vsyevolodovitch was talking to varvara petrovna she had twice beckoned to mavriky nikolaevitch as though she wanted to whisper something to him but as soon as the young man bent down to her she instantly burst into laughter so it seemed as though it was at poor mavriky nikolaevitch that she was laughing she evidently tried to control herself however and put her handkerchief to her lips nikolai vsyevolodovitch turned to greet her with the most innocent and open-hearted air please excuse me she responded speaking quickly you you've seen mavriky nikolaevitch of course my goodness how inexcusably tall you are mavriky nikolaevitch and laughter again mavriky nikolaevitch was tall but by no means inexcusably so have you been here long she muttered restraining herself again genuinely embarrassed though her eyes were shining more than two hours answered nicholas looking at her intently i may remark that he was exceptionally reserved and courteous but that apart from his courtesy his expression was utterly indifferent even listless and where are you going to stay here varvara petrovna too was watching liza but she was suddenly struck by an idea where have you been all this time nicholas more than two hours she said going up to him 
the train comes in at ten o'clock i first took pyotr stepanovitch to kirillov's i came across pyotr stepanovitch at matveyev three stations away and we travelled together i had been waiting at matveyev since sunrise put in pyotr stepanovitch the last carriages of our train ran off the rails in the night and we nearly had our legs broken your legs broken cried liza maman maman you and i meant to go to matveyev last week we should have broken our legs too heaven have mercy on us cried praskovya ivanovna crossing herself maman maman dear maman you mustn't be frightened if i break both my legs it may so easily happen to me you say yourself that i ride so recklessly every day mavriky nikolaevitch will you go about with me when i'm lame she began giggling again if it does happen i won't let anyone take me about but you you can reckon on that well suppose i break only one leg come be polite say you'll think it a pleasure a pleasure to be crippled said mavriky nikolaevitch frowning gravely but then you'll lead me about only you and no one else even then it'll be you leading me about lizaveta nikolaevna murmured mavriky nikolaevitch even more gravely why he's trying to make a joke cried liza almost in dismay mavriky nikolaevitch don't you ever dare take to that but what an egoist you are i am certain that to your credit you're slandering yourself it will be quite the contrary from morning till night you'll assure me that i have become more charming for having lost my leg there's one insurmountable difficulty you're so fearfully tall and when i've lost my leg i shall be so very tiny how will you be able to take me on your arm we shall look a strange couple and she laughed hysterically her jests and insinuations were feeble but she was not capable of considering the effect she was producing hysterics pyotr stepanovitch whispered to me a glass of water make haste he was right a minute later everyone was fussing about water was brought liza embraced her mother kissed her warmly wept on her shoulder then drawing back and looking her in the face she fell to laughing again the mother too began whimpering varvara petrovna made haste to carry them both off to her own rooms going out by the same door by which darya pavlovna had come to us but they were not away long not more than four minutes i am trying to remember now every detail of these last moments of that memorable morning i remember that when we were left without the ladies except darya pavlovna who had not moved from her seat nikolai vsyevolodovitch made the round greeting us all except shatov who still sat in his corner his head more bowed than ever stepan trofimovitch was beginning something very witty to nikolai vsyevolodovitch but the latter turned away hurriedly to darya pavlovna but before he reached her pyotr stepanovitch caught him and drew him away almost violently towards the window where he whispered something quickly to him apparently something very important to judge by the expression of his face and the gestures that accompanied the whisper nikolai vsyevolodovitch listened inattentively and listlessly with his official smile and at last even impatiently and seemed all the time on the point of breaking away he moved away from the window just as the ladies came back varvara petrovna made liza sit down in the same seat as before declaring that she must wait and rest another ten minutes and that the fresh air would perhaps be too much for her nerves at once she was looking after liza with great devotion and sat down beside her pyotr stepanovitch now disengaged skipped up to them at once and broke into a rapid and lively flow of conversation at that point nikolai vsyevolodovitch at last went up to darya pavlovna with his leisurely step dasha began stirring uneasily at his approach and jumped up quickly in evident embarrassment flushing all over her face i believe one may congratulate you or is it too soon he brought out with a peculiar line in his face dasha made him some answer but it was difficult to catch it forgive my indiscretion he added raising his voice but you know i was expressly informed did you know about it yes i know that you were expressly informed but i hope i have not done any harm by my congratulations he laughed and if stepan trofimovitch what what's the congratulation about pyotr stepanovitch suddenly skipped up to them what are you being congratulated about darya pavlovna bah surely that's not it 
your blush proves i've guessed right and indeed what else does one congratulate our charming and virtuous young ladies on and what congratulations make them blush most readily well accept mine too then if i've guessed right and pay up do you remember when we were in switzerland you bet you'd never be married oh yes apropos of switzerland what am i thinking about only fancy that's half what i came about and i was almost forgetting it tell me he turned quickly to stepan trofimovitch when are you going to switzerland uh, i to switzerland stepan trofimovitch replied wondering and confused what aren't you going why you're getting married too you wrote pierre cried stepan trofimovitch well why pierre you see if that'll please you i've flown here to announce that i'm not at all against it since you were set on having my opinion as quickly as possible and if indeed he pattered on you want to be saved as you wrote beseeching my help in the same letter i am at your service again is it true that he is going to be married varvara petrovna he turned quickly to her i hope i'm not being indiscreet he writes himself that the whole town knows it and every one's congratulating him so that to avoid it he only goes out at night i've got his letters in my pocket but would you believe it varvara petrovna i can't make head or tail of it just tell me one thing stepan trofimovitch are you to be congratulated or are you to be saved you wouldn't believe it in one line he's despairing and in the next he's most joyful to begin with he begs my forgiveness well of course that's their way though it must be said fancy the man's only seen me twice in his life and then by accident and suddenly now when he's going to be married for the third time he imagines that this is a breach of some sort of parental duty to me and entreats me a thousand miles away not to be angry and to allow him to please don't be hurt stepan trofimovitch it's characteristic of your generation i take a broad view of it and don't blame you and let's admit it does you honour and all the rest but the point is again that i don't see the point of it there's something about some sort of sins in switzerland i'm getting married he says for my sins or on account of the sins of another or whatever it is sins anyway the girl says he is a pearl and a diamond and well of course he's unworthy of her it's their way of talking but on account of some sins or circumstances he is obliged to lead her to the altar and go to switzerland and therefore abandon everything and fly to save me do you understand anything of all that however however i notice from the expression of your faces he turned about with a letter in his hand looking with an innocent smile into the faces of the company that as usual i seem to have put my foot in it through my stupid way of being open or as nikolai vsyevolodovitch says being in a hurry i thought of course that we were all friends here that is your friends stepan trofimovitch your friends i am really a stranger and i see and i see that you all know something and that just that something i don't know he still went on looking about him so stepan trofimovitch wrote to you that he was getting married for the sins of another committed in switzerland and that you were to fly here to save him in those very words said varvara petrovna addressing him suddenly her face was yellow and distorted and her lips were twitching well you see if there's anything i've not understood said pyotr stepanovitch as though in alarm talking more quickly than ever it's his fault of course for writing like that here's the letter you know varvara petrovna his letters are endless and incessant and you know for the last two or three months there has been letter upon letter till i must own at last i sometimes didn't read them through forgive me stepan trofimovitch for my foolish confession but you must admit please that though you addressed them to me you wrote them more for posterity so that you really can't mind come come don't be offended we're friends anyway but this letter varvara petrovna this letter i did read through these sins these sins of another are probably some little sins of our own and i don't mind betting very innocent ones though they have suddenly made us take a fancy to work up a terrible story with a glamour of the heroic about it and it's just for the sake of that glamour we've got it up you see there's something a little lame about our accounts it must be confessed in the end we've a great weakness for cards you know 
but this is unnecessary quite unnecessary i'm sorry i chatter too much but upon my word varvara petrovna he gave me a fright and i really was half prepared to save him he really made me feel ashamed did he expect me to hold a knife to his throat or what am i such a merciless creditor he writes something here of a dowry but are you really going to get married stepan trofimovitch that would be just like you to say a lot for the sake of talking ah varvara petrovna i'm sure you must be blaming me now and just for my way of talking too on the contrary on the contrary i see that you are driven out of all patience and no doubt you have had good reason varvara petrovna answered spitefully she had listened with spiteful enjoyment to all the candid outbursts of pyotr stepanovitch who was obviously playing a part what part i did not know then but it was unmistakable and overacted indeed on the contrary she went on i am only too grateful to you for speaking but for you i might not have known of it my eyes are open for the first time for twenty years nikolai vsyevolodovitch you said just now that you had been expressly informed surely stepan trofimovitch hasn't written to you in the same style i did get a very harmless and and very generous letter from him you hesitate you pick out your words that's enough stepan trofimovitch i request a great favour from you she suddenly turned to him with flashing eyes kindly leave us at once and never set foot in my house again i must beg the reader to remember her recent exaltation which had not yet passed it's true that stepan trofimovitch was terribly to blame but what was a complete surprise to me then was the wonderful dignity of his bearing under his son's accusation which he had never thought of interrupting and before varvara petrovna's denunciation how did he come by such a spirit i only found out one thing that he had certainly been deeply wounded at his first meeting with petrusha by the way he had embraced him it was a deep and genuine grief at least in his eyes and to his heart he had another grief at the same time that is the poignant consciousness of having acted contemptibly he admitted this to me afterwards with perfect openness and you know real genuine sorrow will sometimes make even a phenomenally frivolous unstable man solid and stoical for a short time at any rate what's more even fools are by genuine sorrow turned into wise men also only for a short time of course it is characteristic of sorrow and if so what might not happen with a man like stepan trofimovitch it worked a complete transformation though also only for a time of course he bowed with dignity to varvara petrovna without uttering a word there was nothing else left for him to do indeed he was on the point of going out without a word but could not refrain from approaching darya pavlovna she seemed to foresee that he would do so for she began speaking of her own accord herself in utter dismay as though in haste to anticipate him please stepan trofimovitch for god's sake don't say anything she began speaking with haste and excitement with a look of pain in her face hurriedly stretching out her hands to him be sure that i still respect you as much and think just as highly of you and think well of me too stepan trofimovitch that will mean a great deal to me a great deal stepan trofimovitch made her a very very low bow it's for you to decide darya pavlovna you know that you are perfectly free in the whole matter you have been and you are now and you always will be varvara petrovna concluded impressively bah now i understand it all cried pyotr stepanovitch slapping himself on the forehead but but what a position i am put in by all this darya pavlovna please forgive me what do you call your treatment of me eh he said addressing his father pierre you might speak to me differently mightn't you my boy stepan trofimovitch observed quite quietly don't cry out please said pierre with a wave of his hand believe me it's all your sick old nerves and crying out will do no good at all you'd better tell me instead why didn't you warn me since you might have supposed i should speak out at the first chance stepan trofimovitch looked searchingly at him pierre you who know so much of what goes on here can you really have known nothing of this business and have heard nothing about it what what a set so it's not enough to be a child in your old age you must be a spiteful child too varvara petrovna did you hear what he said 
there was a general outcry but then suddenly an incident took place which no one could have anticipated end of chapter five section seven recording by expatriate in bangor maine part one chapter five section eight of the possessed by fyodor dostoevsky translated by constance garnett this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter five the subtle serpent section eight first of all i must mention that for the last two or three minutes lizaveta nikolaevna had seemed to be possessed by a new impulse she was whispering something hurriedly to her mother and to mavriky nikolaevitch who bent down to listen her face was agitated but at the same time it had a look of resolution at last she got up from her seat in evident haste to go away and hurried her mother whom mavriky nikolaevitch began helping up from her low chair but it seemed they were not destined to get away without seeing everything to the end shatov who had been forgotten by every one in his corner not far from lizaveta nikolaevna and who did not seem to know himself why he went on sitting there got up from his chair and walked without haste with resolute steps right across the room to nikolai vsyevolodovitch looking him straight in the face the latter noticed him approaching at some distance and faintly smiled but when shatov was close to him he left off smiling when shatov stood still facing him with his eyes fixed on him and without uttering a word every one suddenly noticed it and there was a general hush pyotr stepanovitch was the last to cease speaking liza and her mother were standing in the middle of the room so passed five seconds the look of haughty astonishment was followed by one of anger on nikolai vsyevolodovitch's face he scowled and suddenly shatov swung his long heavy arm and with all his might struck him a blow in the face nikolai vsyevolodovitch staggered violently shatov struck the blow in a peculiar way not at all after the conventional fashion if one may use such an expression it was not a slap with the palm of his hand but a blow with the whole fist and it was a big heavy bony fist covered with red hairs and freckles if the blow had struck the nose it would have broken it but it hit him on the cheek and struck the left corner of the lip and the upper teeth from which blood streamed at once i believe there was a sudden scream perhaps varvara petrovna screamed that i don't remember because there was a dead hush again the whole scene did not last more than ten seconds however yet a very great deal happened in those seconds i must remind the reader again that nikolai vsyevolodovitch's was one of those natures that know nothing of fear at a duel he could face the pistol of his opponent with indifference and could take aim and kill with brutal coolness if any one had slapped him in the face i should have expected him not to challenge his assailant to a duel but to murder him on the spot he was just one of those characters and would have killed the man knowing very well what he was doing and without losing his self-control i fancy indeed that he never was liable to those fits of blind rage which deprive a man of all power of reflection even when overcome with intense anger as he sometimes was he was always able to retain complete self-control and therefore to realize that he would certainly be sent to penal servitude for murdering a man not in a duel nevertheless he'd have killed any one who insulted him and without the faintest hesitation i have been studying nikolai vsyevolodovitch of late and through special circumstances i know a great many facts about him now at the time i write i should compare him perhaps with some gentlemen of the past of whom legendary traditions are still perceived among us we are told for instance about the decembrist l that he was always seeking for danger that he revelled in the sensation and that it had become a craving of his nature that in his youth he had rushed into duels for nothing that in siberia he used to go to kill bears with nothing but a knife that in siberian forests he liked to meet with runaway convicts who are i may observe in passing more formidable than bears there is no doubt that these legendary gentlemen were capable of a feeling of fear and even to an extreme degree perhaps or they would have been a great deal quieter and a sense of danger would never have become a physical craving with them 
but the conquest of fear was what fascinated them the continual ecstasy of vanquishing and the consciousness that no one could vanquish them was what attracted them the same l struggled with hunger for some time before he was sent into exile and toiled to earn his daily bread simply because he did not care to comply with the requests of his rich father which he considered unjust so his conception of struggle was many-sided and he did not prize stoicism and strength of character only in duels and bear fights but many years have passed since those times and the nervous exhausted complex character of the men of to-day is incompatible with the craving for those direct and unmixed sensations which were so sought after by some restlessly active gentlemen of the good old days nikolai vsyevolodovitch would perhaps have looked down on l and have called him a boastful cock-a-hoop coward it's true he wouldn't have expressed himself aloud stavrogin would have shot his opponent in a duel and would have faced a bear if necessary and would have defended himself from a brigand in the forest as successfully and as fearlessly as l but it would be without the slightest thrill of enjoyment languidly listlessly even with ennui and entirely from unpleasant necessity in anger of course there has been a progress compared with l even compared with lermontov there was perhaps more malignant anger in nikolai vsyevolodovitch than in both put together but it was a calm cold if one may so say reasonable anger and therefore the most revolting and most terrible possible i repeat again i considered him then and i still consider him now that everything is over a man who if he received a slap in the face or any equivalent insult would be certain to kill his assailant at once on the spot without challenging him yet in the present case what happened was something different and amazing he had scarcely regained his balance after being almost knocked over in this humiliating way and the horrible as it were sodden thud of the blow in the face had scarcely died away in the room when he seized shatov by the shoulders with both hands but at once almost at the same instant pulled both hands away and clasped them behind his back he did not speak but looked at shatov and turned as white as his shirt but strange to say the light in his eyes seemed to die out ten seconds later his eyes looked cold and i'm sure i'm not lying calm only he was terribly pale of course i don't know what was passing within the man i saw only his exterior it seems to me that if a man should snatch up a bar of red-hot iron and hold it tight in his hand to test his fortitude and after struggling for ten seconds with insufferable pain end by overcoming it such a man would i fancy go through something like what nikolai vsyevolodovitch was enduring during those ten seconds shatov was the first to drop his eyes and evidently because he was unable to go on facing him then he turned slowly and walked out of the room but with a very different step he withdrew quietly with peculiar awkwardness with his shoulders hunched his head hanging as though he were inwardly pondering something i believe he was whispering something he made his way to the door carefully without stumbling against anything or knocking anything over he opened the door a very little way and squeezed through almost sideways as he went out his shock of hair standing on end at the back of his head was particularly noticeable then first of all one fearful scream was heard i saw lizaveta nikolaevna seize her mother by the shoulder and mavriki nikolaevitch by the arm and make two or three violent efforts to draw them out of the room but she suddenly uttered a shriek and fell full length on the floor fainting i can hear the thud of her head on the carpet to this day End of part one of the possessed recording by expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Part two, chapter one, sections one and two of the possessed by Fyodor Dostoevsky, translated by Constance Garnett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Chapter one, night section one eight days had passed now that it is all over and i am writing a record of it we know all about it but at the time we knew nothing and it was natural that many things should seem strange to us 
stepan trofimovitch and i anyway shut ourselves up for the first part of the time and looked on with dismay from a distance i did indeed go about here and there and as before brought him various items of news without which he could not exist i need hardly say that there were rumours of the most varied kind in regard to the blow that stavrogin had received lizaveta nikolaevna's fainting fit and all that happened on that sunday but what we wondered was through whom the story had got about so quickly and so accurately not one of the persons present had any need to give away the secret of what had happened or interest to serve by doing so the servants had not been present lebyadkin was the only one who might have chattered not so much from spite for he had gone out in great alarm and fear of an enemy destroys spite against him but simply from incontinence of speech but lebyadkin and his sister had disappeared next day and nothing could be heard of them there was no trace of them at filipov's house they had moved no one knew where and seemed to have vanished shatov of whom i wanted to inquire about marya timofyevna would not open his door and i believe sat locked up in his room for the whole of those eight days even discontinuing his work in the town he would not see me i went to see him on tuesday and knocked at his door i got no answer but being convinced by unmistakable evidence that he was at home i knocked a second time then jumping up apparently from his bed he strode to the door and shouted at the top of his voice shatov is not at home with that i went away stepan trofimovitch and i not without dismay at the boldness of the supposition though we tried to encourage one another reached at last a conclusion we made up our mind that the only person who could be responsible for spreading these rumours was pyotr stepanovitch though he himself not long after assured his father that he had found the story on every one's lips especially at the club and that the governor and his wife were familiar with every detail of it what is even more remarkable is that the next day monday evening i met liputin and he knew every word that had been passed so that he must have heard it first hand many of the ladies and some of the leading ones were very inquisitive about the mysterious cripple as they called marya timofyevna there were some indeed who were anxious to see her and make her acquaintance so the intervention of the persons who had been in such haste to conceal the lebyadkins was timely but lizaveta nikolaevna's fainting certainly took the foremost place in the story and all society was interested if only because it directly concerned yulia mihailovna as the kinswoman and patroness of the young lady and what was there they didn't say what increased the gossip was the mysterious position of affairs both houses were obstinately closed lizaveta nikolaevna so they said was in bed with brain fever the same thing was asserted of nikolai vsyevolodovitch with the revolting addition of a tooth knocked out and a swollen face it was even whispered in corners that there would soon be murder among us that stavrogin was not the man to put up with such an insult and that he would kill shatov but with the secrecy of a corsican vendetta people liked this idea but the majority of our young people listened with contempt and with an air of the most nonchalant indifference which was of course assumed the old hostility to nikolai vsyevolodovitch in the town was in general strikingly manifest even sober-minded people were eager to throw blame on him though they could not have said for what it was whispered that he had ruined lizaveta nikolaevna's reputation and that there had been an intrigue between them in switzerland cautious people of course restrained themselves but all listened with relish there were other things said though not in public but in private on rare occasions and almost in secret extremely strange things to which i only refer to warn my readers of them with a view to the later events of my story some people with knitted brows said god knows on what foundation that nikolai vsyevolodovitch had some special business in our province that he had through count k been brought into touch with exalted circles in petersburg that he was even perhaps in government service and might almost be said to have been furnished with some sort of commission from some one when very sober-minded and sensible people smiled at this rumour observing very reasonably that a man always mixed up with scandals and who was beginning his career among us with a swollen face did not look like a government official 
they were told in a whisper that he was employed not in the official but so to say the confidential service and that in such cases it was essential to be as little like an official as possible this remark produced a sensation we knew that the zemstvo of our province was the object of marked attention in the capital i repeat these were only flitting rumours that disappeared for a time when nikolai vsyevolodovitch first came among us but i may observe that many of the rumours were partly due to a few brief but malicious words vaguely and disconnectedly dropped at the club by a gentleman who had lately returned from petersburg this was a retired captain in the guards artemy pavlovitch gaganov he was a very large landowner in our province and district a man used to the society of petersburg and a son of the late pavel pavlovitch gaganov the venerable old man with whom nikolai vsyevolodovitch had over four years before had the extraordinarily coarse and sudden encounter which i have described already in the beginning of my story it immediately became known to every one that yulia mikhailovna had made a special call on varvara petrovna and had been informed at the entrance her honour was too unwell to see visitors it was known too that yulia mikhailovna sent a message two days later to inquire after varvara petrovna's health at last she began defending varvara petrovna everywhere of course only in the loftiest sense that is in the vaguest possible way she listened coldly and sternly to the hurried remarks made at first about the scene on sunday so that during the later days they were not renewed in her presence so that the belief gained ground everywhere that yulia mihailovna knew not only the whole of the mysterious story but all its secret significance to the smallest detail and not as an outsider but as one taking part in it i may observe by the way that she was already gradually beginning to gain that exalted influence among us for which she was so eager and which she was certainly struggling to win and was already beginning to see herself surrounded by a circle a section of society recognized her practical sense and tact but of that later her patronage partly explained pyotr stepanovitch's rapid success in our society a success with which stepan trofimovitch was particularly impressed at the time we possibly exaggerated it to begin with pyotr stepanovitch seemed to make acquaintance almost instantly with the whole town within the first four days of his arrival he only arrived on sunday and on tuesday i saw him in a carriage with artemy pavlovitch gaganov a man who was proud irritable and supercilious in spite of his good breeding and who was not easy to get on with at the governor's too pyotr stepanovitch met with a warm welcome so much so that he was at once on an intimate footing like a young friend treated so to say affectionately he dined with yulia mihailovna almost every day he had made her acquaintance in switzerland but there was certainly something curious about the rapidity of his success in the governor's house in any case he was reputed whether truly or not to have been at one time a revolutionist abroad he had had something to do with some publications and some congresses abroad which one can prove from the newspapers to quote the malicious remark of alyosha telyatnikov who had also been once a young friend affectionately treated in the house of the late governor but was now alas a clerk on the retired list but the fact was unmistakable the former revolutionist far from being hindered from returning to his beloved fatherland seemed almost to have been encouraged to do so so perhaps there was nothing in it liputin whispered to me once that there were rumours that pyotr stepanovitch had once professed himself penitent and on his return had been pardoned on mentioning certain names and so perhaps had succeeded in expiating his offence by promising to be of use to the government in the future i repeated these malignant phrases to stepan trofimovitch and although the latter was in such a state that he was hardly capable of reflection he pondered profoundly it turned out later that pyotr stepanovitch had come to us with a very influential letter of recommendation that he had at any rate brought one to the governor's wife from a very important old lady in petersburg whose husband was one of the most distinguished old dignitaries in the capital this old lady who was yulia mihailovna's godmother mentioned in her letter that count k knew pyotr stepanovitch very well through nikolai vsyevolodovitch made much of him 
and thought him a very excellent young man in spite of his former errors yulia mihailovna set the greatest value on her relations with the higher spheres which were few and maintained with difficulty and was no doubt pleased to get the old lady's letter but still there was something peculiar about it she even forced her husband upon a familiar footing with pyotr stepanovitch so much so that mr von lemke complained of it but of that too later i may mention too that the great author was also favourably disposed to pyotr stepanovitch and at once invited him to go and see him such alacrity on the part of a man so puffed up with conceit stung stepan trofimovitch more painfully than anything but i put a different interpretation on it in inviting a nihilist to see him mr karmazinov no doubt had in view his relations with the progressives of the younger generation in both capitals the great author trembled nervously before the revolutionary youth of russia and imagining in his ignorance that the future lay in their hands fawned upon them in a despicable way chiefly because they paid no attention to him whatever section two pyotr stepanovitch ran round to see his father twice but unfortunately i was absent on both occasions he visited him for the first time only on wednesday that is not till the fourth day after their first meeting and then only on business their difficulties over the property were settled by the way without fuss or publicity varvara petrovna took it all on herself and paid all that was owing taking over the land of course and only informed stepan trofimovitch that it was all settled and her butler alexey yegorytch was by her authorization bringing him something to sign this stepan trofimovitch did in silence with extreme dignity apropos of his dignity i may mention that i hardly recognized my old friend during those days he behaved as he had never done before became amazingly taciturn and had not even written one letter to varvara petrovna since sunday which seemed to me almost a miracle what's more he had become quite calm he had fastened upon a final and decisive idea which gave him tranquillity that was evident he had hit upon this idea and sat still expecting something at first however he was ill especially on monday he had an attack of his summer cholera he could not remain all that time without news either but as soon as i departed from the statement of facts and began discussing the case in itself and formulated any theory he at once gesticulated to me to stop but both his interviews with his son had a distressing effect on him though they did not shake his determination after each interview he spent the whole day lying on the sofa with a handkerchief soaked in vinegar on his head but he continued to remain calm in the deepest sense sometimes however he did not hinder my speaking sometimes too it seemed to me that the mysterious determination he had taken seemed to be failing him and he appeared to be struggling with a new seductive stream of ideas that was only at moments but i made a note of it i suspected that he was longing to assert himself again to come forth from his seclusion to show fight to struggle to the last cher i could crush them broke from him on thursday evening after his second interview with pyotr stepanovitch when he lay stretched on the sofa with his head wrapped in a towel till that moment he had not uttered one word all day fi fi cher and so on i agree all those expressions are nonsense kitchen talk and so be it i see it for myself i never gave him food or drink i sent him a tiny baby from berlin to x province by post and all that i admit it you gave me neither food nor drink and sent me by post he says and what's more you've robbed me here but you unhappy boy i cried to him my heart has been aching for you all my life though i did send you by post Iri. but i admit it i admit it granted it was by post he concluded almost in delirium passant he began again five minutes later i don't understand turgenev that bazarov of his is a fictitious figure it does not exist anywhere the fellows themselves were the first to disown him as unlike any one that bazarov is a sort of indistinct mixture of nozdryov and byron c'est le mot look at them attentively they caper about and squeal with joy like puppies in the sun they are happy they are victorious what is there of byron in them and with that such ordinariness what a low-bred irritable vanity 
what an abject craving to faire du bru autour de son nom without noticing that son nom oh it's a caricature surely i cried to him you don't want to offer yourself just as you are as a substitute for christ iri iri beaucoup iri trop he has a strange smile his mother had not a smile like that iri toujours silence followed again they are cunning they were acting in collusion on sunday he blurted out suddenly oh not a doubt of it i cried pricking up my ears it was a got-up thing and it was too transparent and so badly acted i don't mean that do you know that it was all too transparent on purpose that those who had to might understand it do you understand that i don't understand ton mu passons i am very irritable to-day but why have you been arguing with him stepan trofimovitch i asked him reproachfully je voulais convertir you'll laugh of course cette pauvre auntie elle entendre de belles choses oh my dear boy would you believe it i felt like a patriot i always recognized that i was a russian however a genuine russian must be like you and me il y a là dedans quelque chose d'aveugle et de louche not a doubt of it i assented my dear the real truth always sounds improbable do you know that to make truth sound probable you must always mix in some falsehood with it men have always done so perhaps there's something in it that passes our understanding what do you think is there something we don't understand in that triumphant squeal i should like to think there was i should like to think so i did not speak he too was silent for a long time they say that french cleverness he babbled suddenly as though in a fever that's false it always has been why libel french cleverness it's simply russian indolence our degrading impotence to produce ideas our revolting parasitism in the rank of nations ils sont tous simplement de paresseux and not french cleverness oh the russians ought to be extirpated for the good of humanity like noxious parasites we've been striving for something utterly utterly different i can make nothing of it i have given up understanding do you understand i cried to him that if you had the guillotine in the foreground of your programme and are so enthusiastic about it too it's simply because nothing's easier than cutting off heads and nothing's harder than to have an idea vous êtes de parisou votre drapeau est un guenil un impuissance it's those carts or what was it the rumble of the carts carrying bread to humanity being more important than the sistine madonna or what's the saying une bêtise dans ce genre don't you understand don't you understand i said to him that unhappiness is just as necessary to man as happiness Iri. all you do is to make a bon mot he said with your limbs snug on a velvet sofa he used a coarser expression and this habit of addressing a father so familiarly is very nice when father and son are good terms but what do you think of it when they are abusing one another we were silent again for a minute cher he concluded at last getting up quickly do you know this is bound to end in something of course said i vous ne comprenez pas passons but usually in our world things come to nothing but this will end in something it's bound to it's bound to he got up and walked across the room in violent emotion and coming back to the sofa sank on to it exhausted on friday morning pyotr stepanovitch went off somewhere in the neighbourhood and remained away till monday i heard of his departure from liputin and in the course of conversation i learned that the lebyadkins brother and sister had moved to the riverside quarter i moved them he added and dropping the lebyadkins he suddenly announced to me that lizaveta nikolaevna was going to marry mavriki nikolaevitch that although it had not been announced the engagement was a settled thing next day i met lizaveta nikolaevna out riding with mavriki nikolaevitch she was out for the first time after her illness she beamed at me from the distance laughed and nodded in a very friendly way i told all this to stepan trofimovitch he paid no attention except to the news about the lebyadkins and now having described our enigmatic position throughout those eight days during which we knew nothing i will pass on to the description of the succeeding incidents of my chronicle writing so to say with full knowledge and describing things as they became known afterwards and are clearly seen to-day 
i will begin with the eighth day after that sunday that is the monday evening for in reality a new scandal began with that evening end of chapter one section two recording by expatriate in bangor maine part two chapter one section three of the possessed by fyodor dostoevsky translated by constance garnett this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter one night section three it was seven o'clock in the evening nikolai vsyevolodovitch was sitting alone in his study the room he had been fond of in old days it was lofty carpeted with rugs and contained somewhat heavy old-fashioned furniture he was sitting on the sofa in the corner dressed as though to go out though he did not seem to be intending to do so on the table before him stood a lamp with a shade the sides and corners of the big room were left in shadow his eyes looked dreamy and concentrated not altogether tranquil his face looked tired and had grown a little thinner he really was ill with a swollen face but the story of a tooth having been knocked out was an exaggeration one had been loosened but it had grown into its place again he had had a cut on the inner side of the upper lip but that too had healed the swelling on his face had lasted all the week simply because the invalid would not have a doctor and instead of having the swelling lanced had waited for it to go down he would not hear of a doctor and would scarcely allow even his mother to come near him and then only for a moment once a day and only at dusk after it was dark and before lights had been brought in he did not receive pyotr stepanovitch either though the latter ran round to varvara petrovna's two or three times a day so long as he remained in the town and now at last returning on the monday morning after his three days absence pyotr stepanovitch made a circuit of the town and after dining at yulia mikhailovna's came at last in the evening to varvara petrovna who was impatiently expecting him the interdict had been removed nikolai vsyevolodovitch was at home varvara petrovna herself led the visitor to the door of the study she had long looked forward to their meeting and pyotr stepanovitch had promised to run to her and repeat what passed she knocked timidly at nikolai vsyevolodovitch's door and getting no answer ventured to open the door a couple of inches nicholas may i bring pyotr stepanovitch in to see you she asked in a soft and restrained voice trying to make out her son's face behind the lamp you can you can of course you can pyotr stepanovitch himself cried out loudly and gaily he opened the door with his hand and went in nikolai vsyevolodovitch had not heard the knock at the door and only caught his mother's timid question and had not had time to answer it before him at that moment there lay a letter he had just read over which he was pondering deeply he started hearing pyotr stepanovitch's sudden outburst and hurriedly put the letter under a paperweight but did not quite succeed a corner of the letter and almost the whole envelope showed i called out on purpose that you might be prepared pyotr stepanovitch said hurriedly with surprising naivete running up to the table and instantly staring at the corner of the letter which peeped out from beneath the paperweight and no doubt you had time to see how i hid the letter i had just received under the paperweight said nikolai vsyevolodovitch calmly without moving from his place a letter bless you and your letters what are they to do with me cried the visitor but what does matter he whispered again turning to the door which was by now closed and nodding his head in that direction she never listens nikolai vsyevolodovitch observed coldly what if she did over here cried pyotr stepanovitch raising his voice cheerfully and settling down in an armchair i've nothing against that only i've come here now to speak to you alone well at last i've succeeded in getting at you first of all how are you i see you're getting on splendidly to-morrow you'll show yourself again eh perhaps set their minds at rest set mine at rest at last he gesticulated violently with a jocose and amiable air if only you knew what nonsense i've had to talk to them you know though he laughed i don't know everything i only heard from my mother that you've been very active 
well i've said nothing definite pyotr stepanovitch flared up at once as though defending himself from an awful attack i simply trotted out shatov's wife you know that is the rumours of your liaison in paris which accounted of course for what happened on sunday you're not angry i'm sure you've done your best oh that's just what i was afraid of though what does that mean done your best that's a reproach isn't it you always go straight for things though what i was most afraid of as i came here was that you wouldn't go straight for the point i don't want to go straight for anything said nikolai vsyevolodovitch with some irritation but he laughed at once i didn't mean that i didn't mean that don't make a mistake cried pyotr stepanovitch waving his hands rattling his words out like peas and at once relieved at his companion's irritability i'm not going to worry you with our business especially in your present position i've only come about sunday's affair and only to arrange the most necessary steps because you see it's impossible i've come with the frankest explanations which i stand in more need of than you so much for your vanity but at the same time it's true i've come to be open with you from this time forward then you have not been open with me before you know that yourself i've been cunning with you many times you smile i'm very glad of that smile as a prelude to our explanation i provoked that smile on purpose by using the word cunning so that you might get cross directly at my daring to think i could be cunning so that i might have a chance of explaining myself at once you see you see how open i have become now well do you care to listen in the expression of nikolai vsyevolodovitch's face which was contemptuously composed and even ironical in spite of his visitor's obvious desire to irritate him by the insolence of his premeditated and intentionally coarse naivetes there was at last a look of rather uneasy curiosity listen said pyotr stepanovitch wriggling more than ever when i set off to come here i mean here in the large sense to this town ten days ago i made up my mind of course to assume a character it would have been best to have done without anything to have kept one's own character wouldn't it there is no better dodge than one's own character because no one believes in it i meant i must own to assume the part of a fool because it is easier to be a fool than to act one's own character but as a fool is after all something extreme and anything extreme excites curiosity i ended by sticking to my own character and what is my own character the golden mean neither wise nor foolish rather stupid and dropped from the moon as sensible people say here isn't that it perhaps it is said nikolai vsyevolodovitch with a faint smile ah you agree i'm very glad i knew beforehand that it was your own opinion you needn't trouble i'm not annoyed and i didn't describe myself in that way to get a flattering contradiction from you no you're not stupid you're clever ah you're smiling again i blundered once more you would not have said you're clever granted i'll let it pass anyway passons as papa says and in parenthesis don't be vexed with my verbosity by the way i always say a lot that is use a great many words and talk very fast and i never speak well and why do i use so many words and why do i never speak well because i don't know how to speak people who can speak well speak briefly so that i am stupid am i not but as this gift of stupidity is natural to me why shouldn't i make skilful use of it and i do make use of it it's true that as i came here i did think at first of being silent but you know silence is a great talent and therefore incongruous for me and secondly silence would be risky anyway so i made up my mind finally that it would be best to talk but to talk stupidly that is to talk and talk and talk to be in a tremendous hurry to explain things and in the end to get muddled in my own explanations so that my listener would walk away without hearing the end with a shrug or better still with a curse you succeed straight off in persuading them of your simplicity in boring them and in being incomprehensible three advantages all at once do you suppose anybody will suspect you of mysterious designs after that why every one of them would take it as a personal affront if any one were to say i had secret designs and i sometimes amuse them too and that's priceless why they're ready to forgive me everything now just because the clever fellow who used to publish manifestos out there turns out to be stupider than themselves that's so isn't it 
from your smile i see you approve nikolai vsyevolodovitch was not smiling at all however on the contrary he was listening with a frown and some impatience eh what i believe you said no matter pyotr stepanovitch rattled on nikolai vsyevolodovitch had said nothing at all of course of course i assure you i am not here to compromise you by my company by claiming you as my comrade but do you know you're horribly captious to-day i ran into you with a light and open heart and you seem to be laying up every word i say against me i assure you i'm not going to begin about anything shocking to-day i give you my word and i agree beforehand to all your conditions nikolai vsyevolodovitch was obstinately silent eh what did you say something i see i see that i've made a blunder again it seems you've not suggested conditions and you're not going to i believe you i believe you well you can set your mind at rest i know of course that it's not worth while for me to suggest them is it i'll answer for you beforehand and just from stupidity of course stupidity again you're laughing eh what nothing nikolai vsyevolodovitch laughed at last i just remembered that i really did call you stupid but you weren't there then so they must have repeated it i would ask you to make haste and come to the point why but i am at the point i am talking about sunday babbled pyotr stepanovitch why what was i on sunday what would you call it just fussy mediocre stupidity and in the stupidest way i took possession of the conversation by force but they forgave me everything first because i dropped from the moon that seems to be settled here now by every one and secondly because i told them a pretty little story and got you all out of a scrape didn't they didn't they that is you told your story so as to leave them in doubt and suggest some compact and collusion between us when there was no collusion and i'd not asked you to do anything just so just so pyotr stepanovitch caught him up apparently delighted that's just what i did do for i wanted you to see that i implied it i exerted myself chiefly for your sake for i caught you and wanted to compromise you above all i wanted to find out how far you're afraid it would be interesting to know why you are so open now don't be angry don't be angry don't glare at me you're not though you wonder why i am so open why just because it's all changed now of course it's over buried under the sand i've suddenly changed my ideas about you the old way is closed now i shall never compromise you in the old way it will be in a new way now you've changed your tactics there are no tactics now it's for you to decide in everything that is if you want to say yes and if you want to say no there you have my new tactics and i won't say a word about our cause till you bid me yourself you laugh laugh away i'm laughing myself but i'm in earnest now in earnest in earnest though a man who is in such a hurry is stupid isn't he never mind i may be stupid but i'm in earnest in earnest he really was speaking in earnest in quite a different tone and with a peculiar excitement so that nikolai vsyevolodovitch looked at him with curiosity you say you've changed your ideas about me he asked i changed my ideas about you at the moment when you drew your hands back after shatov's attack and that's enough that's enough no questions please i'll say nothing more now he jumped up waving his hands as though waving off questions but as there were no questions and he had no reason to go away he sank into an armchair again somewhat reassured by the way in parenthesis he rattled on at once some people here are babbling that you'll kill him and taking bets about it so that lemke positively thought about setting the police on but yulia mikhailovna forbade it but enough about that quite enough i only spoke of it to let you know by the way i moved the lebyadkins the same day you know did you get my note with their address i received it at the time i didn't do that by way of stupidity i did it genuinely to serve you if it was stupid anyway it was done in good faith oh all right perhaps it was necessary said nikolai vsyevolodovitch dreamily only don't write any more letters to me i beg you impossible to avoid it it was only one so liputin knows impossible to help it but liputin you know yourself dare not by the way you ought to meet our fellows that is the fellows not our fellows or you'll be finding fault again don't disturb yourself not just now but sometime 
just now it's raining i'll let them know they'll meet together and we'll go in the evening they're waiting with their mouths open like young crows in a nest to see what present we've brought them they're a hot-headed lot they've brought out leaflets they're on the point of quarrelling virginsky is a universal humanity man liputin is a fourierist with a marked inclination for police work a man i assure you who is precious from one point of view though he requires strict supervision in all others and last of all that fellow with the long ears he'll read an account of his own system and do you know they're offended at my treating them casually and throwing cold water over them but we certainly must meet you've made me out some sort of chief nikolai vsyevolodovitch dropped as carelessly as possible pyotr stepanovitch looked quickly at him by the way he interposed in haste to change the subject as though he had not heard i've been here two or three times you know to see her excellency varvara petrovna and i have been obliged to say a great deal too so i imagine no don't imagine i've simply told her that you won't kill him well and other sweet things and only fancy the very next day she knew i'd moved marya timofyevna beyond the river was it you told her i never dreamed of it i knew it wasn't you who else could it be it's interesting liputin of course no not liputin muttered pyotr stepanovitch frowning i'll find out who it's more like shatov that's nonsense though let's leave that though it's awfully important by the way i kept expecting that your mother would suddenly burst out with a great question ah yes she was horribly glum at first but suddenly when i came to-day she was beaming all over what does that mean it's because i promised her to-day that within five days i'll be engaged to lizaveta nikolaevna nikolai vsyevolodovitch said with surprising openness oh yes of course faltered pyotr stepanovitch seeming disconcerted there are rumours of her engagement you know it's true too but you're right she'd run from under the wedding crown you've only to call to her you're not angry at my saying so no i'm not angry i notice it's awfully hard to make you angry to-day and i begin to be afraid of you i'm awfully curious to know how you'll appear to-morrow i expect you've got a lot of things ready you're not angry at my saying so nikolai vsyevolodovitch made no answer at all which completed pyotr stepanovitch's irritation by the way did you say that in earnest to your mother about lizaveta nikolaevna he asked nikolai vsyevolodovitch looked coldly at him oh i understand it was only to soothe her of course and if it were in earnest nikolai vsyevolodovitch asked firmly oh god bless you then as they say in such cases it won't hinder the cause you see i don't say our you don't like the word our and i well i i i am at your service as you know you think so i think nothing nothing pyotr stepanovitch hurriedly declared laughing because i know you consider what you're about beforehand for yourself and everything with you has been thought out i only mean that i am seriously at your service always and everywhere and in every sort of circumstance every sort really do you understand that nikolai vsyevolodovitch yawned i bored you pyotr stepanovitch cried jumping up suddenly and snatching his perfectly new round hat as though he were going away he remained and went on talking however though he stood up sometimes pacing about the room and tapping himself on the knee with his hat at exciting parts of the conversation i meant to amuse you with stories of the lemkes too he cried gaily afterwards perhaps not now but how is yulia mikhailovna what conventional manners all of you have her health is no more to you than the health of the grey cat yet you ask after it i approve of that she's quite well and her respect for you amounts to a superstition her immense anticipations of you amount to a superstition she does not say a word about what happened on sunday and is convinced that you will overcome everything yourself by merely making your appearance upon my word she fancies you can do anything you're an enigmatic and romantic figure now more than ever you were extremely advantageous position it is incredible how eager every one is to see you they were pretty hot when i went away but now it is more so than ever thanks again for your letter they are all afraid of count k do you know they look upon you as a spy i keep that up you're not angry 
it does not matter it does not matter it's essential in the long run they have their ways of doing things here i encourage it of course yulia mikhailovna in the first place gaganov too you laugh but you know i have my policy i babble away and suddenly i say something clever just as they are on the lookout for it they crowd round me and i humbug away again they've all given me up in despair by now he's got brains but he's dropped from the moon lemke invites me to enter the service so that i may be reformed you know i treat him mockingly that is i compromise him and he simply stares yulia mikhailovna encourages it oh by the way gaganov is in an awful rage with you he said the nastiest things about you yesterday at duhovo i told him the whole truth on the spot that is of course not the whole truth i spent the whole day at duhovo it's a splendid estate a fine house then is he at duhovo now nikolai vsyevolodovitch broke in suddenly making a sudden start forward and almost leaping up from his seat no he drove me here this morning we returned together said pyotr stepanovitch appearing not to notice stavrogin's momentary excitement what's this i dropped a book he bent down to pick up the keepsake he had knocked down the women of balzac with illustrations he opened it suddenly i haven't read it lemke writes novels too yes queried nikolai vsyevolodovitch as though beginning to be interested in russian on the sly of course yulia mikhailovna knows and allows it he's henpecked but with good manners it's their system such strict form such self-restraint something of the sort would be the thing for us you approve of government methods i should rather think so it's the one thing that's natural and practicable in russia i won't i won't he cried out suddenly i'm not referring to that not a word on delicate subjects good-bye though you look rather green i'm feverish i can well believe it you should go to bed by the way there are skoptsi here in the neighbourhood they're curious people of that later though ah here's another anecdote there's an infantry regiment here in the district i was drinking last friday evening with the officers we three friends among them vous comprenez they were discussing atheism and i need hardly say they made short work of god they were squealing with delight by the way shatov declares that if there's to be a rising in russia we must begin with atheism maybe it's true one grizzled old stager of a captain sat mum not saying a word all at once he stands up in the middle of the room and says aloud as though speaking to himself if there's no god how can i be a captain then he took up his cap and went out flinging up his hands he expressed a rather sensible idea said nikolai vsyevolodovitch yawning for the third time yes i didn't understand it i meant to ask you about it well what else have i to tell you the spigulin factory's interesting as you know there are five hundred workmen in it it's a hotbed of cholera it's not been cleaned for fifteen years and the factory hands are swindled the owners are millionaires i assure you that some among the hands have an idea of the international what you smile you'll see only give me ever so little time i've asked you to fix the time already and now i ask you again and then but i beg your pardon i won't i won't speak of that don't frown there he turned back suddenly i quite forgot the chief thing i was told just now that our box had come from petersburg you mean nikolai vsyevolodovitch looked at him not understanding your box your things coats trousers and linen have come is it true yes they said something about it this morning ah then can't i open it at once ask alexey well to-morrow then will to-morrow do you see my new jacket dress coat and three pairs of trousers are with your things from sharmer's by your recommendation do you remember i hear you're going in for being a gentleman here said nikolai vsyevolodovitch with a smile is it true you're going to take lessons at the riding school pyotr stepanovitch smiled a wry smile i say he said suddenly with excessive haste in a voice that quivered and faltered i say nikolai vsyevolodovitch let's drop personalities once for all of course you can despise me as much as you like if it amuses you but we'd better dispense with personalities for a time hadn't we all right nikolai vsyevolodovitch assented pyotr stepanovitch grinned tapped his knee with his hat shifted from one leg to the other and recovered his former expression 
some people here positively look upon me as your rival with lizaveta nikolaevna so i must think of my appearance mustn't i he laughed who was it told you that though hm it's just eight o'clock well i must be off i promised to look in on varvara petrovna but i shall make my escape and you go to bed and you'll be stronger to-morrow it's raining and dark but i've a cab it's not over safe in the streets here at night ah by the way there's a runaway convict from siberia fedka wandering about the town in the neighbourhood only fancy he used to be a serf of mine and my papa sent him for a soldier fifteen years ago and took the money for him he's a very remarkable person you have been talking to him nikolai vsyevolodovitch scanned him i have he lets me know where he is he's ready for anything anything for money of course but he has convictions too of a sort of course oh yes by the way again if you meant anything of that plan you remember about lizaveta nikolaevna i tell you once again i too am a fellow ready for anything of any kind you like and absolutely at your service hello are you reaching for your stick oh, oh no only fancy i thought you were looking for your stick nikolai vsyevolodovitch was looking for nothing and said nothing but he had risen to his feet very suddenly with a strange look in his face if you want any help about mr gaganov either pyotr stepanovitch blurted out suddenly this time looking straight at the paperweight of course i can arrange it all and i'm certain you won't be able to manage without me he went out suddenly without waiting for an answer but thrust his head in at the door once more i mentioned that he gabbled hurriedly because shatov had no right either you know to risk his life last sunday when he attacked you had he i should be glad if you would make a note of that he disappeared again without waiting for an answer end of chapter one section three recording by expatriate in bangor maine part two chapter one section four and five of the possessed by fyodor dostoevsky translated by constance garnett this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter one night section four perhaps he imagined as he made his exit that as soon as he was left alone nikolai vsyevolodovitch would begin beating on the wall with his fists and no doubt he would have been glad to see this if that had been possible but if so he was greatly mistaken nikolai vsyevolodovitch was still calm he remained standing for two minutes in the same position by the table apparently plunged in thought but soon a cold and listless smile came on to his lips he slowly sat down again in the same place in the corner of the sofa and shut his eyes as though from weariness the corner of the letter was still peeping from under the paperweight but he didn't even move to cover it he soon sank into complete forgetfulness when pyotr stepanovitch went out without coming to see her as he had promised varvara petrovna who had been worn out by anxiety during these days could not control herself and ventured to visit her son herself though it was not her regular time she was still haunted by the idea that he would tell her something conclusive she knocked at the door gently as before and again receiving no answer she opened the door seeing that nikolai vsyevolodovitch was sitting strangely motionless she cautiously advanced to the sofa with a throbbing heart she seemed struck by the fact that he could fall asleep so quickly and that he could sleep sitting like that so erect and motionless so that his breathing even was scarcely perceptible his face was pale and forbidding but it looked as it were numb and rigid his brows were somewhat contracted and frowning he positively had the look of a lifeless wax figure she stood over him for about three minutes almost holding her breath and suddenly she was seized with terror she withdrew on tiptoe stopped at the door hurriedly made the sign of the cross over him and retreated unobserved with a new oppression and a new anguish at her heart he slept a long while more than an hour and still in the same rigid pose not a muscle of his face twitched there was not the faintest movement in his whole body and his brows were still contracted in the same forbidding frown if varvara petrovna had remained another three minutes she could not have endured the stifling sensation that this motionless lethargy roused in her and would have waked him 
but he suddenly opened his eyes and sat for ten minutes as immovable as before staring persistently and curiously as though at some object in the corner which had struck him although there was nothing new or striking in the room suddenly there rang out the low deep note of the clock on the wall with some uneasiness he turned to look at it but almost at the same moment the other door opened and the butler alexey yegorytch came in he had in one hand a great coat a scarf and a hat and in the other a silver tray with a note on it half past nine he announced softly and laying the other things on a chair he held out the tray with the note a scrap of paper unsealed and scribbled in pencil glancing through it nikolai vsyevolodovitch took a pencil from the table added a few words and put the note back on the tray take it back as soon as i have gone out and now dress me he said getting up from the sofa noticing that he had on a light velvet jacket he thought a minute and told the man to bring him a cloth coat which he wore on more ceremonious occasions at last when he was dressed and had put on his hat he locked the door by which his mother had come into the room took the letter from under the paperweight and without saying a word went out into the corridor followed by alexey yegorytch from the corridor they went down the narrow stone steps of the back stairs to a passage which opened straight into the garden in the corner stood a lantern and a big umbrella owing to the excessive rain the mud in the streets is beyond anything alexey yegorytch announced making a final effort to deter his master from the expedition but opening his umbrella the latter went without a word into the damp and sodden garden which was dark as a cellar the wind was roaring and tossing the bare treetops the little sandy paths were wet and slippery alexey yegorytch walked along as he was bareheaded in his swallow-tail coat lighting up the path for about three steps before them with the lantern won't it be noticed nikolai vsyevolodovitch asked suddenly not from the windows besides i have seen to all that already the old servant answered in quiet and measured tones has my mother retired her excellency locked herself in at nine o'clock as she has done the last few days and there is no possibility of her knowing anything at what hour am i to expect your honour at one or half past not later than two yes sir crossing the garden by the winding paths that they both knew by heart they reached the stone wall and there in the farthest corner found a little door which led out into a narrow and deserted lane and was always kept locked it appeared that alexey yegorytch had the key in his hand won't the door creak nikolai vsyevolodovitch inquired again but alexey yegorytch informed him that it had been oiled yesterday as well as to-day he was by now wet through unlocking the door he gave the key to nikolai vsyevolodovitch if it should be your pleasure to be taking a distant walk i would warn your honour that i am not confident of the folk here especially in the back lanes and especially beyond the river he could not resist warning him again he was an old servant who had been like a nurse to nikolai vsyevolodovitch and at one time used to dandle him in his arms he was a grave and severe man who was fond of listening to religious discourse and reading books of devotion don't be uneasy alexey yegorytch may god's blessing rest on you sir but only in your righteous undertakings what said nikolai vsyevolodovitch stopping short in the lane alexey yegorytch resolutely repeated his words he had never before ventured to express himself in such language in his master's presence nikolai vsyevolodovitch locked the door put the key in his pocket and crossed the lane sinking five or six inches into the mud at every step he came out at last into a long deserted street he knew the town like the five fingers of his hand but bogoyavlensky street was a long way off it was past ten when he stopped at last before the locked gates of the dark old house that belonged to filipov the ground floor had stood empty since the lebyadkins had left it and the windows were boarded up but there was a light burning in shatov's room on the second floor as there was no bell he began banging on the gate with his hand a window was opened and shatov peeped out into the street it was terribly dark and difficult to make out anything shatov was peering out for some time about a minute is that you he asked suddenly yes replied the uninvited guest 
shatov slammed the window went downstairs and opened the gate nikolai vsyevolodovitch stepped over the high sill and without a word passed by him straight into kirillov's lodge section five there everything was unlocked and all the doors stood open the passage and the first two rooms were dark but there was a light shining in the last in which kirillov lived and drank tea and laughter and strange cries came from it nikolai vsyevolodovitch went towards the light but stood still in the doorway without going in there was tea on the table in the middle of the room stood the old woman who was a relation of the landlord she was bareheaded and was dressed in a petticoat and a hareskin jacket and her stockingless feet were thrust into slippers in her arms she had an eighteen months old baby with nothing on but its little shirt with bare legs flushed cheeks and ruffled white hair it had only just been taken out of the cradle it seemed to have just been crying there were still tears in its eyes but at that instant it was stretching out its little arms clapping its hands and laughing with a sob as little children do kirillov was bouncing a big red india-rubber ball on the floor before it the ball bounced up to the ceiling and back to the floor the baby shrieked baw baw kirillov caught the ball and gave it to it the baby threw it itself with its awkward little hands and kirillov ran to pick it up again at last the ball rolled under the cupboard baw baw cried the child kirillov lay down on the floor trying to reach the ball with his hand under the cupboard nikolai vsyevolodovitch went into the room the baby caught sight of him nestled against the old woman and went off into a prolonged infantile wail the woman immediately carried it out of the room stavrogin said kirillov beginning to get up from the floor with the ball in his hand and showing no surprise at the unexpected visit will you have tea he rose to his feet i should be very glad of it if it's hot said nikolai vsyevolodovitch i'm wet through it's hot nearly boiling in fact kirillov declared delighted sit down you're muddy but that's nothing i'll mop up the floor later nikolai vsyevolodovitch sat down and emptied the cup he handed him almost at a gulp some more asked kirillov no thank you kirillov who had not sat down till then seated himself facing him and inquired why have you come on business here read this letter from gaganov do you remember i talked to you about him in petersburg kirillov took the letter read it laid it on the table and looked at him expectantly as you know i met this gaganov for the first time in my life a month ago in petersburg nikolai vsyevolodovitch began to explain we came across each other two or three times in company with other people without making my acquaintance and without addressing me he managed to be very insolent to me i told you so at the time but now for something you don't know as he was leaving petersburg before i did he sent me a letter not like this one yet impertinent in the highest degree and what was queer about it was that it contained no sort of explanation of why it was written i answered him at once also by letter and said quite frankly that he was probably angry with me on account of the incident with his father four years ago in the club here and that i for my part was prepared to make him every possible apology seeing that my action was unintentional and was the result of illness i begged him to consider and accept my apologies he went away without answering and now here i find him in a regular fury several things he has said about me in public have been repeated to me absolutely abusive and making astounding charges against me finally to-day i get this letter a letter such as no one has ever had before i should think containing such expressions as the punch you got in your ugly face i came in the hope that you would not refuse to be my second you said no one has ever had such a letter observed kirillov they may be sent in a rage such letters have been written more than once pushkin wrote to hekern all right i'll come tell me how nikolai vsyevolodovitch explained that he wanted it to be to-morrow and that he must begin by renewing his offers of apology and even with the promise of another letter of apology but on condition that gaganov on his side should promise to send no more letters the letter he had received he would regard as unwritten too much concession he won't agree said kirillov i've come first of all to find out whether you would consent to be the bearer of such terms i'll take them it's your affair but he won't agree 
i know he won't agree he wants to fight say how you'll fight the point is that i want the thing settled to-morrow by nine o'clock in the morning you must be at his house he'll listen and won't agree but will put you in communication with his second let us say about eleven you will arrange things with him and let us all be on the spot by one or two o'clock please try to arrange that the weapons of course will be pistols and i particularly beg you to arrange to fix the barriers at ten paces apart then you put each of us ten paces from the barrier and at a given signal we approach each must go right up to his barrier but you may fire before on the way i believe that's all ten paces between the barriers is very near observed kirillov well twelve then but not more you understand that he wants to fight in earnest do you know how to load a pistol i do i've got pistols i'll give my word that you've never fired them his second will give his word about his there'll be two pairs of pistols and we'll toss up his or ours excellent would you like to look at the pistols very well kirillov squatted on his heels before the trunk in the corner which he had never yet unpacked though things had been pulled out of it as required he pulled out from the bottom a palm-wood box lined with red velvet and from it took out a pair of smart and very expensive pistols i've got everything powder bullets cartridges i've a revolver besides wait he stooped down to the trunk again and took out a six-chambered american revolver you've got weapons enough and very good ones very extremely kirillov who was poor almost destitute though he never noticed his poverty was evidently proud of showing precious weapons which he had certainly obtained with great sacrifice you still have the same intentions stavrogin asked after a moment's silence and with a certain wariness yes answered kirillov shortly guessing at once from his voice what he was asking about and he began taking the weapons from the table when nikolai vsyevolodovitch inquired still more cautiously after a pause in the meantime kirillov had put both the boxes back in his trunk and sat down in his place again that doesn't depend on me as you know when they tell me he muttered as though disliking the question but at the same time with evident readiness to answer any other question he kept his black lustreless eyes fixed continually on stavrogin with a calm but warm and kindly expression in them i understand shooting oneself of course nikolai vsyevolodovitch began suddenly frowning a little after a dreamy silence that lasted three minutes i sometimes have thought of it myself and then there always came a new idea if one did something wicked or worse still something shameful that is disgraceful only very shameful and ridiculous such as people would remember for a thousand years and hold in scorn for a thousand years and suddenly the thought comes one blow in the temple and there would be nothing more one wouldn't care then for men and they would hold one in scorn for a thousand years would one you call that a new idea said kirillov after a moment's thought i didn't call it so but when i thought it i felt it as a new idea you felt the idea observed kirillov that's good there are lots of ideas that are always there and yet suddenly become new that's true i see a great deal now as though it were for the first time suppose you had lived in the moon stavrogin interrupted not listening but pursuing his own thought and suppose there you had done all these nasty and ridiculous things you know from here for certain that they will laugh at you and hold you in scorn for a thousand years as long as the moon lasts but now you are here and looking at the moon from here you don't care here for anything you've done there and that the people there will hold you in scorn for a thousand years do you i don't know answered kirillov i've not been in the moon he added without any irony simply to state the fact whose baby was that just now the old woman's mother-in-law was here no daughter-in-law it's all the same three days she's lying ill with the baby it cries a lot at night it's the stomach the mother sleeps but the old woman picks it up i play ball with it the ball's from hamburg i bought it in hamburg to throw it and catch it it strengthens the spine it's a girl are you fond of children i am answered kirillov though rather indifferently then you're fond of life yes i'm fond of life what of it though you've made up your mind to shoot yourself what of it why connect it life's one thing and that's another life exists but death doesn't at all 
you've begun to believe in a future eternal life no not in a future eternal life but in eternal life here there are moments you reach moments and time suddenly stands still and it will become eternal you hope to reach such a moment yes that'll scarcely be possible in our time nikolai vsyevolodovitch responded slowly and as it were dreamily the two spoke without the slightest irony in the apocalypse the angel swears that there will be no more time i know that's very true distinct and exact when all mankind attains happiness then there will be no more time for there'll be no need of it a very true thought where will they put it nowhere time's not an object but an idea it will be extinguished in the mind the old commonplaces of philosophy the same from the beginning of time stavrogin muttered with a kind of disdainful compassion always the same always the same from the beginning of time and never any other kirillov said with sparkling eyes as though there were almost a triumph in that idea you seem to be very happy kirillov yes very happy he answered as though making the most ordinary reply but you were distressed so lately angry with liputin hm i'm not scolding now i didn't know then that i was happy have you seen a leaf a leaf from a tree yes i saw a yellow one lately a little green it was decayed at the edges it was blown by the wind when i was ten years old i used to shut my eyes in the winter on purpose and fancy a green leaf bright with veins on it and the sun shining i used to open my eyes and not believe them because it was very nice and i used to shut them again what's that an allegory no why i'm not speaking of an allegory but of a leaf only a leaf the leaf is good everything's good everything everything man is unhappy because he doesn't know he's happy it's only that that's all that's all if anyone finds out he'll become happy at once that minute that mother-in-law will die but the baby will remain it's all good i discovered it all of a sudden and if anyone dies of hunger and if anyone insults and outrages the little girl is that good yes and if anyone blows his brains out for the baby that's good too and if anyone doesn't that's good too it's all good all it's good for all those who know that it's all good if they knew that it was good for them it would be good for them but as long as they don't know it's good for them it will be bad for them that's the whole idea the whole of it when did you find out you were so happy last week on tuesday no wednesday for it was wednesday by that time in the night by what reasoning i don't remember i was walking about the room never mind i stopped my clock it was thirty-seven minutes past two as an emblem of the fact that there will be no more time kirillov was silent they're bad because they don't know they're good when they find out they won't outrage a little girl they'll find out that they're good and they'll all become good every one of them here you found it out so have you become good then i am good that i agree with though stavrogin muttered frowning he who teaches that all are good will end the world he who taught it was crucified he will come and his name will be the man-god the god-man the man-god that's the difference surely it wasn't you lighted the lamp under the icon yes it was i lighted it did you do it believing the old woman likes to have the lamp and she hadn't time to do it to-day muttered kirillov you don't say prayers yourself i pray to everything you see the spider crawling on the wall i look at it and thank it for crawling his eyes glowed again he kept looking straight at stavrogin with firm and unflinching expression stavrogin frowned and watched him disdainfully but there was no mockery in his eyes i'll bet that when i come next time you'll be believing in god too he said getting up and taking his hat why said kirillov getting up too if you were to find out that you believe in god then you'd believe in him but since you don't know that you believe in him then you don't believe in him laughed nikolai vsyevolodovitch that's not right kirillov pondered you've distorted the idea it's a flippant joke remember what you have meant in my life stavrogin good-bye kirillov come at night when will you why haven't you forgotten about tomorrow? ah i'd forgotten don't be uneasy i won't oversleep at nine o'clock i know how to wake up when i want to 
i go to bed saying seven o'clock and i wake up at seven o'clock ten o'clock and i wake up at ten o'clock you have remarkable powers said nikolai vsyevolodovitch looking at his pale face i'll come and open the gate don't trouble shatov will open it for me ah shatov very well good-bye end of chapter one section five recording by expatriate in bangor maine part two chapter one section six of the possessed by fyodor dostoevsky translated by constance garnett this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter two night section six the door of the empty house in which shatov was lodging was not closed but making his way into the passage stavrogin found himself in utter darkness and began feeling with his hand for the stairs to the upper story suddenly a door opened upstairs and a light appeared shatov did not come out himself but simply opened his door when nikolai vsyevolodovitch was standing in the doorway of the room he saw shatov standing at the table in the corner waiting expectantly will you receive me on business he queried from the doorway come in and sit down answered shatov shut the door stay i'll shut it he locked the door returned to the table and sat down facing nikolai vsyevolodovitch he had grown thinner during that week and now he seemed in a fever you've been worrying me to death he said looking down in a soft half whisper why didn't you come you were so sure i should come then yes stay i have been delirious perhaps i'm delirious now stay a moment he got up and seized something that was lying on the uppermost of his three bookshelves it was a revolver one night in delirium i fancied that you were coming to kill me and early next morning i spent my last farthing on buying a revolver from that good-for-nothing fellow lyamshin i did not mean to let you do it then i came to myself again i've neither powder nor shot it has been lying there on the shelf till now wait a minute he got up and was opening the casement don't throw it away why should you nikolai vsyevolodovitch checked him it's worth something besides to-morrow people will begin saying that there are revolvers lying about under shatov's window put it back that's right sit down tell me why do you seem to be penitent for having thought i should come to kill you i have not come now to be reconciled but to talk of something necessary enlighten me to begin with you didn't give me that blow because of my connection with your wife you know i didn't yourself said shatov looking down again and not because you believed the stupid gossip about darya pavlovna no no of course not it's nonsense my sister told me from the very first shatov said harshly and impatiently and even with a slight stamp of his foot then i guessed right and you too guessed right nikolai vsyevolodovitch went on in a tranquil voice you are right marya timofyevna lebyadkin is my lawful wife married to me four and a half years ago in petersburg i suppose the blow was on her account shatov utterly astounded listened in silence i guessed but did not believe it he muttered at last looking strangely at stavrogin and you struck me shatov flushed and muttered almost incoherently because of your fall your lie i didn't go up to you to punish you i didn't know when i went up to you that i should strike you i did it because you meant so much to me in my life i i understand i understand spare your words i am sorry you are feverish i've come about a most urgent matter i have been expecting you too long shatov seemed to be quivering all over and he got up from his seat say what you have to say i'll speak too later he sat down what i have come about is nothing of that kind began nikolai vsyevolodovitch scrutinizing him with curiosity owing to certain circumstances i was forced this very day to choose such an hour to come and tell you that they may murder you shatov looked wildly at him i know that i may be in some danger he said in measured tones but how can you have come to know of it because i belong to them as you do and am a member of their society just as you are you you are a member of the society i see from your eyes that you are prepared for anything from me rather than that said nikolai vsyevolodovitch with a faint smile but excuse me you knew then that there would be an attempt on your life nothing of the sort 
and i don't think so now in spite of your words though though there's no being sure of anything with these fools he cried suddenly in a fury striking the table with his fist i'm not afraid of them i've broken with them that fellow's run here four times to tell me it was possible but he looked at stavrogin what do you know about it exactly don't be uneasy i am not deceiving you nikolai vsyevolodovitch went on rather coldly with the air of a man who is only fulfilling a duty you question me as to what i know i know that you entered that society abroad two years ago at the time of the old organization just before you went to america and i believe just after our last conversation about which you wrote so much to me in your letter from america by the way i must apologize for not having answered you by letter but confine myself to to sending the money wait a bit shatov interrupted hurriedly pulling out a drawer in the table and taking from under some papers a rainbow-coloured note here take it the hundred roubles you sent me but for you i should have perished out there i should have been a long time paying it back if it had not been for your mother she made me a present of that note nine months ago because i was so badly off after my illness but go on please he was breathless in america you changed your views and when you came back you wanted to resign they gave you no answer but charged you to take over a printing press here in russia from someone and to keep it till you handed it over to someone who would come from them for it i don't know the details exactly but i fancy that's the position in outline you undertook it in the hope or on the condition that it would be the last task they would require of you and that then they would release you altogether whether that is so or not i learnt it not from them but quite by chance but now for what i fancy you don't know these gentry have no intention of parting with you that's absurd cried shatov i've told them honestly that i've cut myself off from them in everything that is my right the right to freedom of conscience and of thought i won't put up with it there's no power which could i say don't shout nikolai vsyevolodovitch said earnestly checking him that verkovensky is such a fellow that he may be listening to us now in your passage perhaps with his own ears or someone else's even that drunkard lebyadkin was probably bound to keep an eye on you and you on him too i dare say you'd better tell me has verkovensky accepted your arguments now or not he has he has said that it can be done and that i have the right well then he's deceiving you i know that even kirillov who scarcely belongs to them at all has given them information about you and they have lots of agents even people who don't know that they're serving the society they've always kept a watch on you one of the things pyotr verkovensky came here for was to settle your business once for all and he is fully authorized to do so that is at the first good opportunity to get rid of you as a man who knows too much and might give them away i repeat that this is certain and allow me to add that they are for some reason convinced that you are a spy and that if you haven't informed against them yet you will is that true shatov made a wry face at hearing such a question asked in such a matter-of-fact tone if i were a spy whom could i inform he said angrily not giving a direct answer no leave me alone let me go to the devil he cried suddenly catching again at his original idea which agitated him violently apparently it affected him more deeply than the news of his own danger you you stavrogin how could you mix yourself up with such shameful stupid second-hand absurdity you are a member of the society what an exploit for stavrogin he cried suddenly in despair he clasped his hands as though nothing could be a bitterer and more inconsolable grief to him than such a discovery excuse me said nikolai vsyevolodovitch extremely surprised but you seem to look upon me as a sort of son and on yourself as an insect in comparison i noticed that even from your letter in america you you know oh let us drop me altogether shatov broke off suddenly and if you can explain anything about yourself explain it answer my question he repeated feverishly with pleasure you ask how i could get into such a den after what i have told you i am bound to be frank with you to some extent on the subject you see strictly speaking i don't belong to the society at all and i never have belonged to it and i've much more right than you to leave them because i never joined them in fact from the very beginning i told them that i was not one of them and that if i have happened to help them it has simply been by accident as a man of leisure 
i took some part in reorganizing the society on the new plan but that was all but now they've changed their views and have made up their minds that it would be dangerous to let me go and i believe i'm sentenced to death too oh they do nothing but sentenced to death and all by means of sealed documents signed by three men and a half and you think they've any power you're partly right there and partly not stavrogin answered with the same indifference almost listlessness there's no doubt that there's a great deal that's fanciful about it as there always is in such cases a handful magnifies its size and significance to my thinking if you will have it the only one is pyotr verkovensky and it's simply good nature on his part to consider himself only an agent of the society but the fundamental idea is no stupider than others of the sort they are connected with the internationale they have succeeded in establishing agents in russia they have even hit on a rather original method though it is only theoretical of course as for their intentions here the movements of our russian organization are something so obscure and almost always unexpected that really they might try anything among us note that verkovensky is an obstinate man he's a bug an ignoramus a buffoon who understands nothing in russia cried shatov spitefully you know him very little it's quite true that none of them understand much about russia but not much less than you and i do besides verkovensky is an enthusiast verkovensky an enthusiast oh yes there is a point when he ceases to be a buffoon and becomes a madman i beg you to remember your own expression do you know how powerful a single man may be please don't laugh about it he's quite capable of pulling a trigger they are convinced that i am a spy too as they don't know how to do things themselves they're awfully fond of accusing people of being spies but you're not afraid are you no i'm not very much afraid but your case is quite different i warned you that you might anyway keep it in mind to my thinking there's no reason to be offended in being threatened with danger by fools their brains don't affect the question they've raised their hand against better men than you or me it's a quarter past eleven though he looked at his watch and got up from his chair i wanted to ask you one quite irrelevant question for god's sake cried shatov rising impulsively from his seat i beg your pardon nikolai vsyevolodovitch looked at him inquiringly ask it ask your question for god's sake shatov repeated in indescribable excitement but on condition that i ask you a question too i beseech you to allow me i can't ask your question stavrogin waited a moment and then began i've heard that you have some influence on marya timofyevna and that she was fond of seeing you and hearing you talk is that so yes she used to listen said shatov confused within a day or two i intend to make a public announcement of our marriage here in the town is that possible shatov whispered almost with horror i don't quite understand you there's no sort of difficulty about it witnesses to the marriage are here everything took place in petersburg perfectly legally and smoothly and if it has not been made known till now it is simply because the witnesses kirillov pyotr verkovensky and lebyadkin whom i now have the pleasure of claiming as a brother-in-law promised to hold their tongues i don't mean that you speak so calmly but good listen you weren't forced into that marriage were you no no one forced me into it nikolai vsyevolodovitch smiled at shatov's importunate haste and what's that talk she keeps up about her baby shatov interposed disconnectedly with feverish haste she talks about her baby bah i didn't know it's the first time i've heard of it she never had a baby and couldn't have had marya timofyevna is a virgin ah that's just what i thought listen what's the matter with you shatov shatov hid his face in his hands turned away but suddenly clutched stavrogin by the shoulders do you know why do you know why anyway he shouted why you did all this and why you are resolved on such a punishment now your question is clever and malignant but i mean to surprise you too i fancy i do know why i got married then and why i am resolved on such a punishment now as you express it let's leave that of that later put it off let's talk of the chief thing the chief thing i've been waiting two years for you yes i've waited too long for you i've been thinking of you incessantly you are the only man who could move i wrote to you about it from america 
i remember your long letter very well too long to be read no doubt six sheets of note-paper don't speak don't speak tell me can you spare me another ten minutes but now this minute i have waited for you too long certainly half an hour if you like but not more if that will suit you and on condition too shatov put in wrathfully that you take a different tone do you hear i demand when i ought to entreat do you understand what it means to demand when one ought to entreat i understand that in that way you lift yourself above all ordinary considerations for the sake of loftier aims said nikolai vsyevolodovitch with a faint smile i see with regret too that you're feverish i beg you to treat me with respect i insist on it shouted shatov not my personality i don't care a hang for that but something else just for this once while i am talking we are two beings and have come together in infinity for the last time in the world drop your tone and speak like a human being speak if only for once in your life with the voice of a man i say it not for my sake but for yours do you understand that you ought to forgive me that blow in the face if only because i gave you the opportunity of realizing your immense power again you smile your disdainful worldly smile oh when will you understand me have done with being a snob understand that i insist on that i insist on it else i won't speak i'm not going to for anything his excitement was approaching frenzy nikolai vsyevolodovitch frowned and seemed to become more on his guard since i have remained another half hour with you when time is so precious he pronounced earnestly and impressively you may rest assured that i mean to listen to you at least with interest and i am convinced that i shall hear from you much that is new he sat down on a chair sit down cried shatov and he sat down himself please remember stavrogin interposed once more that i was about to ask a real favour of you concerning marya timofyevna of great importance for her anyway what shatov frowned suddenly with the air of a man who has just been interrupted at the most important moment and who gazes at you unable to grasp the question and you did not let me finish nikolai vsyevolodovitch went on with a smile oh nonsense afterwards shatov waved his hand disdainfully grasping at last what he wanted and passed at once to his principal theme end of chapter one section six recording by expatriate in bangor maine part two chapter one section seven of the possessed by fyodor dostoevsky translated by constance garnett this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter one night section seven do you know he began with flashing eyes almost menacingly bending right forward in his chair raising the forefinger of his right hand above him obviously unaware that he was doing so do you know who are the only god-bearing people on earth destined to regenerate and save the world in the name of a new god and to whom are given the keys of life and of the new world do you know which is that people and what is its name from your manner i am forced to conclude and i think i may as well do so at once that it is the russian people and you can laugh oh what a race shatov burst out calm yourself i beg of you on the contrary i was expecting something of the sort from you you expected something of the sort and don't you know those words yourself i know them very well i see only too well what you're driving at all your phrases even the expression god-bearing people is only a sequel to our talk two years ago abroad not long before you went to america at least as far as i can recall it now it's your phrase altogether not mine your own not simply the sequel of our conversation our conversation it was not at all it was a teacher uttering weighty words and a pupil who was raised from the dead i was that pupil and you were the teacher but if you remember it was just after my words you joined their society and only afterwards went away to america yes and i wrote to you from america about that i wrote to you about everything yes i could not at once tear my bleeding heart from what i had grown into from childhood on which had been lavished all the raptures of my hopes and all the tears of my hatred it is difficult to change gods i did not believe you then because i did not want to believe i plunged for the last time into that sewer 
but the seed remained and grew up seriously tell me seriously didn't you read all my letter from america perhaps you didn't read it at all i read three pages of it the two first and the last and i glanced through the middle as well but i was always meaning ah never mind drop it damn it cried shatov waving his hand if you've renounced those words about the people now how could you have uttered them then that's what crushes me now i wasn't joking with you then in persuading you i was perhaps more concerned with myself than with you stavrogin pronounced enigmatically you weren't joking in america i was lying for three months on straw beside a hapless creature and i learnt from him that at the very time when you were sowing the seed of god and the fatherland in my heart at that very time perhaps during those very days you were infecting the heart of that hapless creature that maniac kirillov with poison you confirmed false malignant ideas in him and brought him to the verge of insanity go look at him now he is your creation you've seen him though in the first place i must observe that kirillov himself told me that he is happy and that he's good your supposition that all this was going on at the same time is almost correct but what of it i repeat i was not deceiving either of you are you an atheist an atheist now yes and then just as i was then i wasn't asking you to treat me with respect when i began the conversation with your intellect you might have understood that shatov muttered indignantly i didn't get up at your first word i didn't close the conversation i didn't go away from you but have been sitting here ever since submissively answering your questions and cries so it seems i have not been lacking in respect to you yet shatov interrupted waving his hand do you remember your expression that an atheist can't be a russian that an atheist at once ceases to be a russian do you remember saying that did i nikolai vsyevolodovitch questioned him back you ask you've forgotten and yet that was one of the truest statements of the leading peculiarity of the russian soul which you divined you can't have forgotten it i will remind you of something else you said then that a man who was not orthodox could not be russian i imagine that's a slavophile idea the slavophiles of to-day disown it nowadays people have grown cleverer but you went further you believed that roman catholicism was not christianity you asserted that rome proclaimed christ subject to the third temptation of the devil announcing to all the world that christ without an earthly kingdom cannot hold his ground upon earth catholicism by so doing proclaimed antichrist and ruined the whole western world you pointed out that if france is in agonies now it's simply the fault of catholicism for she has rejected the iniquitous god of rome and has not found a new one that's what you could say then i remember our conversations if i believed no doubt i should repeat it even now i wasn't lying when i spoke as though i had faith nikolai vsyevolodovitch pronounced very earnestly but i must tell you this repetition of my ideas in the past makes a very disagreeable impression on me can't you leave off if you believe it repeated shatov paying not the slightest attention to this request but didn't you tell me that if it were mathematically proved to you that the truth excludes christ you'd prefer to stick to christ rather than to the truth did you say that did you but allow me too at last to ask a question said nikolai vsyevolodovitch raising his voice what is the object of this irritable and malicious cross-examination this examination will be over for all eternity and you will never hear it mentioned again you keep insisting that we are outside the limits of time and space hold your tongue shatov cried suddenly i am stupid and awkward but let my name perish in ignominy let me repeat your leading idea oh only a dozen lines only the conclusion repeat it if it's only the conclusion stavrogin made a movement to look at his watch but restrained himself and did not look shatov bent forward in his chair again and again held up his finger for a moment not a single nation he went on as though reading it line by line still gazing menacingly at stavrogin not a single nation has ever been founded on principles of science or reason there has never been an example of it except for a brief moment through folly socialism is from its very nature bound to be atheism 
seeing that it has from the very first proclaimed that it is an atheistic organization of society and that it intends to establish itself exclusively on the elements of science and reason science and reason have from the beginning of time played a secondary and subordinate part in the life of nations so it will be till the end of time nations are built up and moved by another force which sways and dominates them the origin of which is unknown and inexplicable that force is a force of an insatiable desire to go on to the end though at the same time it denies that end it is the force of the persistent assertion of one's own existence and a denial of death it's the spirit of life as the scriptures call it the river of living water the drying up of which is threatened in the apocalypse it's the aesthetic principle as the philosophers call it the ethical principle with which they identify it the seeking for god as i call it more simply the object of every national movement in every people and at every period of its existence is only the seeking for its god who must be its own god and the faith in him as the only true one god is the synthetic personality of the whole people taken from its beginning to its end it has never happened that all or even many peoples have had one common god but each has always had its own it's a sign of the decay of nations when they begin to have gods in common when gods begin to be common to several nations the gods are dying and the faith in them together with the nations themselves the stronger a people the more individual their god there never has been a nation without a religion that is without an idea of good and evil every people has its own conception of good and evil and its own good and evil when the same conceptions of good and evil become prevalent in several nations then these nations are dying and then the very distinction between good and evil is beginning to disappear reason has never had the power to define good and evil or even to distinguish between good and evil even approximately on the contrary it has always mixed them up in a disgraceful and pitiful way science is even given the solution by the fist this is particularly characteristic of the half-truths of science the most terrible scourge of humanity unknown till this century and worse than plague famine or war a half-truth is a despot such as has never been in the world before a despot that has its priests and its slaves a despot to whom all do homage with love and superstition hitherto inconceivable before which science itself trembles and cringes in a shameful way these are your own words stavrogin all except that about the half-truth that's my own because i am myself a case of half-knowledge and that's why i hate it particularly i haven't altered anything of your ideas or even of your words not a syllable i don't agree that you've not altered anything stavrogin observed cautiously you accepted them with ardour and in your ardour have transformed them unconsciously the very fact that you reduce god to a simple attribute of nationality he suddenly began watching shatov with intense and peculiar attention not so much his words as himself i reduce god to the attribute of nationality cried shatov on the contrary i raise the people to god and has it ever been otherwise the people is the body of god every people is only a people so long as it has its own god and excludes all other gods on earth irreconcilably so long as it believes that by its god it will conquer and drive out of the world all other gods such from the beginning of time has been the belief of all great nations all anyway who have been specially remarkable all who have been leaders of humanity there is no going against facts the jews lived only to await the coming of the true god and left the world the true god the greeks deified nature and bequeathed the world their religion that is philosophy and art rome deified the people in the state and bequeathed the idea of the state to the nations france throughout her long history was only the incarnation and development of the roman god and if they have at last flung their roman god into the abyss and plunged into atheism which for the time being they call socialism it is solely because socialism is anyway healthier than roman catholicism if a great people does not believe that the truth is only to be found in itself alone in itself alone and in it exclusively 
if it does not believe that it alone is fit and destined to raise up and save all the rest by its truth it would at once sink into being ethnographical material and not a great people a really great people can never accept a secondary part in the history of humanity nor even one of the first but will have the first part a nation which loses this belief ceases to be a nation but there is only one truth and therefore only a single one out of the nations can have the true god even though other nations may have great gods of their own only one nation is god-bearing that's the russian people and, and and can you think me such a fool stavrogin he yelled frantically all at once that i can't distinguish whether my words at this moment are the rotten old commonplaces that have been ground out in all the slavophil mills in moscow or a perfectly new saying the last word the sole word of renewal and resurrection and and what do i care for your laughter at this minute what do i care that you utterly utterly fail to understand me not a word not a sound oh how i despise your haughty laughter and your look at this minute he jumped up from his seat there was positively foam on his lips on the contrary shatov on the contrary stavrogin began with extraordinary earnestness and self-control still keeping his seat on the contrary your fervent words have revived many extremely powerful recollections in me in your words i recognize my own mood two years ago and now i will not tell you as i did just now that you have exaggerated my ideas i believe indeed that they were even more exceptional even more independent and i assure you for the third time that i should be very glad to confirm all that you've said just now every syllable of it but but you want a hair what your own nasty expression shatov laughed spitefully sitting down again to cook your hair you must first catch it to believe in god you must first have a god you used to say that in petersburg i'm told like nozdryov who tried to catch a hare by his hind legs no what he did was to boast he'd caught him by the way allow me to trouble you with a question though for indeed i think i have the right to one now tell me have you caught your hare don't dare to ask me in such words ask differently quite differently shatov suddenly began trembling all over certainly i'll ask differently nikolai vsyevolodovitch looked coldly at him i only wanted to know do you believe in god yourself i believe in russia i believe in her orthodoxy i believe in the body of christ i believe that the new advent will take place in russia i believe shatov muttered frantically and in god in god i i i will believe in god not one muscle moved in stavrogin's face shatov looked passionately and defiantly at him as though he would have scorched him with his eyes i haven't told you that i don't believe he cried at last i will only have you know that i am a luckless tedious book and nothing more so far so far but confound me we're discussing you not me i'm a man of no talent and can only give my blood nothing more like every man without talent never mind my blood either i'm talking about you i've been waiting here two years for you here i've been dancing about in my nakedness before you for the last half hour you only you can raise that flag he broke off and sat as though in despair with his elbows on the table and his head in his hands i merely mention it as something queer stavrogin interrupted suddenly every one for some inexplicable reason keeps foisting a flag upon me pyotr verkovensky too is convinced that i might raise his flag that's how his words were repeated to me anyway he has taken it into his head that i'm capable of playing the part of stenka razin for them from my extraordinary aptitude for crime his saying too what cried shatov from your extraordinary aptitude for crime just so hm and is it true he asked with an angry smile is it true that when you were in petersburg you belonged to a secret society for practising beastly sensuality is it true that you could give lessons to the marquis de sade is it true that you decoyed and corrupted children speak don't dare to lie he cried beside himself nikolai stavrogin cannot lie to shatov who struck him in the face tell me everything and if it's true i'll kill you here on the spot i did talk like that but it was not i who outraged children stavrogin brought out after a silence that lasted too long he turned pale and his eyes gleamed but you talked like that 
shatov went on imperiously keeping his flashing eyes fastened upon him is it true that you declared that you saw no distinction in beauty between some brutal obscene action and any great exploit even the sacrifice of life for the good of humanity is it true that you have found identical beauty equal enjoyment in both extremes it's impossible to answer like this i won't answer muttered stavrogin who might well have got up and gone away but who did not get up and go away i don't know either why evil is hateful and good is beautiful but i know why the sense of that distinction is effaced and lost in people like the stavrogins shatov persisted trembling all over do you know why you made that base and shameful marriage simply because the shame and senselessness of it reached the pitch of genius oh you are not one of those who linger on the brink you fly head foremost you married from a passion for martyrdom from a craving for remorse through moral sensuality it was a laceration of the nerves defiance of common sense was too tempting stavrogin and a wretched half-witted crippled beggar when you bit the governor's ear did you feel sensual pleasure did you you idle loafing little snob did you you're a psychologist said stavrogin turning paler and paler though you're partly mistaken as to the reasons of my marriage but who can have given you all this information he asked smiling with an effort was it kirillov but he had nothing to do with it you turn pale but what is it you want nikolai vsyevolodovitch asked raising his voice at last i've been sitting under your lash for the last half hour and you might at least let me go civilly unless you really have some reasonable object in treating me like this reasonable object of course you're in duty bound anyway to let me know your object i've been expecting you to do so all the time but you've shown me nothing so far but frenzied spite i beg you to open the gate for me he got up from the chair shatov rushed frantically after him kiss the earth water it with your tears pray for forgiveness he cried clutching him by the shoulder i didn't kill you that morning though i drew back my hands stavrogin brought out almost with anguish keeping his eyes on the ground speak out speak out you came to warn me of danger you have let me speak you mean to-morrow to announce your marriage publicly do you suppose i don't see from your face that some new menacing idea is dominating you stavrogin why am i condemned to believe in you through all eternity could i speak like this to any one else i have modesty but i am not ashamed of my nakedness because it's stavrogin i am speaking to i was not afraid of caricaturing a grand idea by handling it because stavrogin was listening to me can't i kiss your footprints when you've gone i can't tear you out of my heart nikolai stavrogin i'm sorry i can't feel affection for you shatov stavrogin replied coldly i know you can't and i know you are not lying listen i can set it all right i can catch your hair for you stavrogin did not speak you're an atheist because you're a snob a snob of the snobs you've lost the distinction between good and evil because you've lost touch with your own people a new generation is coming straight from the heart of the people and you will know nothing of it neither you nor the verkovenskys father or son nor i for i'm a snob too i the son of your serf and lackey pashka listen attain to god by work it all lies in that or disappear like rotten mildew attain to him by work god by work what sort of work peasant's work go give up all your wealth ah uh, you laugh you're afraid of some trick but stavrogin was not laughing you suppose that one may attain to god by work and by peasant's work he repeated reflecting as though he had really come across something new and serious which was worth considering by the way he passed suddenly to a new idea you reminded me just now do you know that i'm not rich at all that i've nothing to give up i'm scarcely in a position even to provide for marya timofyevna's future another thing i came to ask you if it would be possible for you to remain near marya timofyevna in the future as you are the only person who has some influence over her poor brain i say this so as to be prepared for anything all right all right you're speaking of marya timofyevna said shatov waving one hand while he held a candle in the other all right afterwards of course listen go to tikhon to whom to tikhon who used to be a bishop he lives retired now on account of illness here in the town in the bogorodsky monastery what do you mean 
nothing people go and see him you go what is it to you what is it to you it's the first time i've heard of him and i've never seen anything of that sort of people thank you i'll go this way shatov lighted him down the stairs go along he flung open the gate into the street i shan't come to you any more shatov said stavrogin quietly as he stepped through the gateway the darkness and the rain continued as before end of part two chapter one recording by expatria in bangor maine part two chapter two section one of the possessed by fyodor dostoevsky translated by constance garnett this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine part two chapter two night continued section one he walked the length of bogoyavlensky street at last the road began to go downhill his feet slipped in the mud and suddenly there lay open before him a wide misty as it were empty expanse the river the houses were replaced by hovels the street was lost in a multitude of irregular little alleys nikolai vsyevolodovitch was a long while making his way between the fences keeping close to the river bank but finding his way confidently and scarcely giving it a thought indeed he was absorbed in something quite different and looked round with surprise when suddenly waking up from a profound reverie he found himself almost in the middle of one long wet floating bridge there was not a soul to be seen so that it seemed strange to him when suddenly almost at his elbow he heard a deferentially familiar but rather pleasant voice with a suave intonation such as is affected by our over-refined tradespeople or befrizzled young shop assistants will you kindly allow me sir to share your umbrella there actually was a figure that crept under his umbrella or tried to appear to do so the tramp was walking beside him almost feeling his elbow as the soldiers say slackening his pace nikolai vsyevolodovitch bent down to look more closely as far as he could in the darkness it was a short man and seemed like an artisan who had been drinking he was shabbily and scantily dressed a cloth cap soaked by the rain and with the brim half torn off perched on his shaggy curly head he looked a thin vigorous swarthy man with dark hair his eyes were large and must have been black with a hard glitter and a yellow tinge in them like a gypsy's that could be divined even in the darkness he was about forty and was not drunk do you know me asked nikolai vsyevolodovitch mr stavrogin nikolai vsyevolodovitch you were pointed out to me at the station when the train stopped last sunday though i had heard enough of you beforehand from pyotr stepanovitch are you fedka the convict i was christened fyodor fyodorovitch my mother is living to this day in these parts she's an old woman and grows more and more bent every day she prays to god for me day and night so that she doesn't waste her old age lying on the stove you escaped from prison i've had a change of luck i gave up books and bells and church-going because i had a life sentence so that i had a very long time to finish my term what are you doing here well i do what i can my uncle too died last week in prison here he was there for false coins so i threw two dozen stones at the dogs by way of memorial that's all i've been doing so far moreover pyotr stepanovitch gives me hope of a passport and a merchant's one too to go all over russia so i'm waiting on his kindness because says he my papa lost you at cards at the english club and i says he find that inhumanity unjust you might have the kindness to give me three roubles sir for a glass to warm myself so you've been spying on me i don't like that by whose orders as to orders it's nothing of the sort it's simply that i knew of your benevolence which is known to all the world all we get as you know is an armful of hay or a prod with a fork last friday i filled myself as full of pie as martin did of soap since then i didn't eat one day and the day after i fasted and on the third i'd nothing again i've had my fill of water from the river i'm breeding fish in my belly so won't your honour give me something i've a sweetheart expecting me not far from here but i daren't show myself to her without money what did pyotr stepanovitch promise you from me 
he didn't exactly promise anything but only said that i might be of use to your honour if my luck turns out good but how exactly he didn't explain for pyotr stepanovitch wants to see if i have the patience of a cossack and feels no sort of confidence in me why pyotr stepanovitch is an astronomer and has learnt all god's planets but even he may be criticised i stand before you sir as before god because i have heard so much about you pyotr stepanovitch is one thing but you sir maybe are something else when he's said of a man he's a scoundrel he knows nothing more about him except that he's a scoundrel or if he's said he's a fool then that man has no calling with him except that of fool but i may be a fool tuesday and wednesday and on thursday wiser than he here now he knows about me that i'm awfully sick to get a passport for there's no getting on in russia without papers so he thinks that he's snared my soul i tell you sir life's a very easy business for pyotr stepanovitch for he fancies a man to be this and that and goes on as though he really was and what's more he's beastly stingy it's his notion that apart from him i daren't trouble you but i stand before you sir as before god this is the fourth night i've been waiting for your honour on this bridge to show that i can find my own way on the quiet without him i'd better bow to a boot thinks i than to a peasant's shoe and who told you that i was going to cross the bridge at night well that i alone came out by chance most through captain lebyadkin's foolishness because he can't keep anything to himself so that three roubles from your honour would pay me for the weary time i've had these three days and nights and the clothes i've had soaked i feel that too much to speak of it i'm going to the left you'll go to the right here's the end of the bridge listen fyodor i like people to understand what i say once for all i won't give you a farthing don't meet me in future on the bridge or anywhere i've no need of you and never shall have and if you don't obey i'll tie you and take you to the police march Aha! fling me something for my company anyhow i've cheered you on your way be off but do you know the way here there are all sorts of turnings i could guide you for this town is for all the world as though the devil carried it in his basket and dropped it in bits here and there i'll tie you up said nikolai vsyevolodovitch turning upon him menacingly perhaps you'll change your mind it's easy to ill-treat the helpless well i see you can rely on yourself i rely upon you sir and not very much on myself i've no need of you at all i've told you so already but i have need that's how it is i shall wait for you on the way back there's nothing for it i give you my word of honour if i meet you i'll tie you up well i'll get a belt ready for you to tie me with a lucky journey to you sir you kept the helpless snug under your umbrella for that alone i'll be grateful to you to my dying day he fell behind nikolai vsyevolodovitch walked on to his destination feeling disturbed this man who had dropped from the sky was absolutely convinced that he was indispensable to him stavrogin and was in insolent haste to tell him so he was being treated unceremoniously all round but it was possible too that the tramp had not been altogether lying and had tried to force his services upon him on his own initiative without pyotr stepanovitch's knowledge and that would be more curious still end of part two chapter two section one recording by expatriate in bangor maine part two chapter two section two of the possessed by fyodor dostoevsky translated by constance garnett this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter two night continued section two the house which nikolai vsyevolodovitch had reached stood alone in a deserted lane between fences beyond which market gardens stretched at the very end of the town it was a very solitary little wooden house which was only just built and not yet weather-boarded in one of the little windows the shutters were not yet closed and there was a candle standing on the window ledge evidently as a signal to the late guest who was expected that night thirty paces away stavrogin made out on the doorstep the figure of a tall man evidently the master of the house who had come out to stare impatiently up the road he heard his voice too impatient and as it were timid is that you you yes responded nikolai vsyevolodovitch 
but not till he had mounted the steps and was folding up his umbrella at last sir captain lebyadkin for it was he ran fussily to and fro let me take your umbrella please it's very wet i'll open it on the floor here in the corner please walk in please walk in the door was open from the passage into a room that was lighted by two candles if it had not been for your promise that you would certainly come i should have given up expecting you a quarter to one said nikolai vsyevolodovitch looking at his watch as he went into the room and in this rain and such an interesting distance i've no clock and there are nothing but market gardens round me so that you fall behind the times not that i murmur exactly for i dare not i dare not but only because i've been devoured with impatience all the week to have things settled at last how so to hear my fate nikolai vsyevolodovitch please sit down he bowed pointing to a seat by the table before the sofa nikolai vsyevolodovitch looked round the room was tiny and low-pitched the furniture consisted only of the most essential articles plain wooden chairs and a sofa also newly made without covering or cushions there were two tables of lime wood one by the sofa and the other in the corner was covered with a tablecloth laid with things over which a clean table napkin had been thrown and indeed the whole room was obviously kept extremely clean captain lebyadkin had not been drunk for eight days his face looked bloated and yellow his eyes looked uneasy inquisitive and obviously bewildered it was only too evident that he did not know what tone he should adopt and what line it would be most advantageous for him to take here he indicated his surroundings i live like zosima sobriety solitude and poverty the vow of the knights of old you imagine that the knights of old took such vows perhaps i'm mistaken alas i have no culture i've ruined all believe me nikolai vsyevolodovitch here first i have recovered from shameful propensities not a glass nor a drop i have a home and for six days past i have experienced a conscience at ease even the walls smell of rosin and remind me of nature and what have i been what was i at night without a bed i wander and my tongue put out by day to use the words of a poet of genius but you're wet through wouldn't you like some tea don't trouble the samovar has been boiling since eight o'clock but it went out at last like everything in this world the sun too they say will go out in its turn but if you like i'll get up the samovar agafya is not asleep tell me marya timofyevna she's here here lebyadkin replied at once in a whisper would you like to have a look at her he pointed to the closed door to the next room she's not asleep oh no no how could she be on the contrary she's been expecting you all the evening and as soon as she heard you were coming she began making her toilet he was just twisting his mouth into a jocose smile but he instantly checked himself how is she on the whole asked nikolai vsyevolodovitch frowning on the whole you know that yourself sir he shrugged his shoulders commiseratingly but just now just now she's telling her fortune with cards very good later on first of all i must finish with you nikolai vsyevolodovitch settled himself in a chair the captain did not venture to sit down on the sofa but at once moved up another chair for himself and bent forward to listen in a tremor of expectation what have you got there under the tablecloth asked nikolai vsyevolodovitch suddenly noticing it that said lebyadkin turning towards it also that's from your generosity by way of housewarming so to say considering also the length of the walk and your natural fatigue he sniggered ingratiatingly then he got up on tiptoe and respectfully and carefully lifted the tablecloth from the table in the corner under it was seen a slight meal ham veal sardines cheese a little green decanter and a long bottle of bordeaux everything had been laid neatly expertly and almost daintily was that your effort yes sir ever since yesterday i've done my best and all to do you honour marya timofyevna doesn't trouble herself as you know on that score and what's more it's all from your liberality your own providing as you're the master of the house and not i and i'm only so to say your agent all the same all the same nikolai vsyevolodovitch all the same in spirit i'm independent don't take away from me this last possession he finished up pathetically hm. you might sit down again grateful grateful and independent he sat down 
ah nikolai vsyevolodovitch so much has been fermenting in this heart that i have not known how to wait for your coming now you will decide my fate and that unhappy creature's and then shall i pour out all i feel to you as i used to in old days four years ago you deigned to listen to me then you read my verses they might call me your falstaff from shakespeare in those days but you meant so much in my life i have great terrors now and it's only to you i look for counsel and light pyotr stepanovitch is treating me abominably nikolai vsyevolodovitch listened with interest and looked at him attentively it was evident that though captain lebyadkin had left off drinking he was far from being in a harmonious state of mind drunkards of many years standing like lebyadkin often show traces of incoherence of mental cloudiness of something as it were damaged and crazy though they may deceive cheat and swindle almost as well as anybody if occasion arises i see that you haven't changed a bit in these four years and more captain said nikolai vsyevolodovitch somewhat more amiably it seems in fact as though the second half of a man's life is usually made up of nothing but the habits he has accumulated during the first half grand words you solve the riddle of life said the captain half cunningly half in genuine and unfeigned admiration for he was a great lover of words of all your sayings nikolai vsyevolodovitch i remember one thing above all you were in petersburg when you said it one must really be a great man to be able to make a stand even against common sense that was it yes and a fool as well a fool as well maybe but you've been scattering clever sayings all your life while they imagine liputin imagine pyotr stepanovitch saying anything like that oh how cruelly pyotr stepanovitch has treated me but how about yourself captain what can you say of your behaviour drunkenness and the multitude of my enemies but now that's all over all over and i have a new skin like a snake do you know nikolai vsyevolodovitch i'm making my will in fact i've made it already oh, that's interesting what are you leaving and to whom to my fatherland to humanity and to the students nikolai vsyevolodovitch i read in the paper the biography of an american he left all his vast fortune to factories and to the exact sciences and his skeleton to the students of the academy there and his skin to be made into a drum so that the american national hymn might be beaten upon it day and night alas we are pygmies in mind compared with the soaring thought of the states of north america russia is the play of nature but not of mind if i were to try leaving my skin for a drum for instance to the akmolinsky infantry regiment in which i had the honour of beginning my service on condition of beating the russian national hymn upon it every day in face of the regiment they'd take it for liberalism and prohibit my skin and so i confine myself to the students i want to leave my skeleton to the academy but on the condition though on the condition that a label should be stuck on the forehead for ever and ever with the words a repentant free thinker there now the captain spoke excitedly and genuinely believed of course that there was something fine in the american will but he was cunning too and very anxious to entertain nikolai vsyevolodovitch with whom he had played the part of a buffoon for a long time in the past but the latter did not even smile on the contrary he asked as it were suspiciously so you intend to publish your will in your lifetime and get rewarded for it and what if i do nikolai vsyevolodovitch what if i do said lebyadkin watching him carefully what sort of luck have i had i've given up writing poetry and at one time even you were amused by my verses nikolai vsyevolodovitch do you remember our reading them over a bottle but it's all over with my pen i've written only one poem like gogol's the last story do you remember he proclaimed to russia that it broke spontaneously from his bosom it's the same with me i've sung my last and it's over what sort of poem in case she were to break her leg what that was all the captain was waiting for he had an unbounded admiration for his own poems but through a certain cunning duplicity he was pleased too that nikolai vsyevolodovitch always made merry over his poems and sometimes laughed at them immoderately in this way he killed two birds with one stone satisfying at once his poetical aspirations and his desire to be of service but now he had a third special and very ticklish object in view 
bringing his verses on the scene the captain thought to exculpate himself on one point about which for some reason he always felt himself most apprehensive and most guilty in case of her breaking her leg that is of her riding on horseback it's a fantasy nikolai vsyevolodovitch a wild fancy but the fancy of a poet one day i was struck by meeting a lady on horseback and asked myself the vital question what would happen then that is in case of accident all her followers turn away all her suitors are gone a pretty kettle of fish only the poet remains faithful with his heart shattered in his breast nikolai vsyevolodovitch even a louse may be in love and is not forbidden by law and yet the lady was offended by the letter and the verses i'm told that even you were angry were you i wouldn't believe in anything so grievous whom could i harm simply by imagination besides i swear on my honour liputin kept saying send it send it every man however humble has a right to send a letter and so i sent it you offered yourself as a suitor i understand enemies 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 repeat the verses said nikolai vsyevolodovitch sternly ravings ravings more than anything however he drew himself up stretched out his hand and began with broken limbs my beauteous queen is twice as charming as before and deep in love as i have been to-day i love her even more come that's enough said nikolai vsyevolodovitch a wave of his hand i dream of petersburg cried lebyadkin passing quickly to another subject as though there had been no mention of verses i dream of regeneration benefactor may i reckon that you won't refuse the means for the journey i've been waiting for you all the week as my sunshine i'll do nothing of the sort i've scarcely any money left and why should i give you money nikolai vsyevolodovitch seemed suddenly angry dryly and briefly he recapitulated all the captain's misdeeds his drunkenness his lying his squandering of the money meant for marya timofyevna his having taken her from the nunnery his insolent letters threatening to publish the secret the way he had behaved about darya pavlovna and so on and so on the captain heaved gesticulated began to reply but every time nikolai vsyevolodovitch stopped him peremptorily and listen he observed at last you keep writing about family disgrace what disgrace is it to you that your sister is the lawful wife of a stavrogin but marriage in secret nikolai vsyevolodovitch a fatal secret i receive money from you and i'm suddenly asked the question what's that money for my hands are tied i cannot answer to the detriment of my sister to the detriment of the family honour the captain raised his voice he liked that subject and reckoned boldly upon it alas he did not realize what a blow was in store for him calmly and exactly as though he were speaking of the most everyday arrangement nikolai vsyevolodovitch informed him that in a few days perhaps even to-morrow or the day after he intended to make his marriage known everywhere to the police as well as to local society and so the question of family honour would be settled once for all and with it the question of subsidy the captain's eyes were ready to drop out of his head he positively could not take it in it had to be explained to him but she is crazy i shall make suitable arrangements but how about your mother well she must do as she likes but will you take your wife to your house perhaps so but that is absolutely nothing to do with you and no concern of yours no concern of mine cried the captain what about me then well certainly you won't come into my house but you know i'm a relation one does one's best to escape from such relations why should i go on giving you money then judge for yourself nikolai vsyevolodovitch nikolai vsyevolodovitch this is impossible you will think better of it perhaps you don't want to lay hands upon what will people think what will the world say how much i care for your world i married your sister when the fancy took me after a drunken dinner for a bet and now i make it public since that amuses me now he said this with a peculiar irritability so that lebyadkin began with horror to believe him but me me what about me i'm what matters most perhaps you're joking nikolai vsyevolodovitch no i'm not joking as you will nikolai vsyevolodovitch but i don't believe you then i'll take proceedings you're fearfully stupid captain maybe but this is all that's left me said the captain losing his head completely 
in old days we used to get free quarters anyway for the work she did in the corners but what will happen now if you throw me over altogether but you want to go to petersburg to try a new career by the way is it true what i hear that you mean to go and give information in the hope of obtaining a pardon by betraying all the others the captain stood gaping with wide open eyes and made no answer listen captain stavrogin began suddenly with great earnestness bending down to the table until then he had been talking as it were ambiguously so that lebyadkin who had wide experience in playing the part of buffoon was up to the last moment a trifle uncertain whether his patron were really angry or simply putting it on whether he really had the wild intention of making his marriage public or whether he were only playing now nikolai vsyevolodovitch's stern expression was so convincing that a shiver ran down the captain's back listen and tell the truth lebyadkin have you betrayed anything yet or not have you succeeded in doing anything really have you sent a letter to somebody in your foolishness no i haven't and i haven't thought of doing it said the captain looking fixedly at him that's a lie that you haven't thought of doing it that's what you're asking to go to petersburg for if you haven't written have you blabbed to anybody here speak the truth i've heard something when i was drunk to liputin liputin's a traitor i opened my heart to him whispered the poor captain well that's all very well but there's no need to be an ass if you had an idea you should have kept it to yourself sensible people hold their tongues nowadays they don't go chattering nikolai vsyevolodovitch said the captain quaking you've had nothing to do with it yourself it's not you i've yes you wouldn't have ventured to kill the goose that laid your golden eggs judge for yourself nikolai vsyevolodovitch judge for yourself and in despair with tears the captain began hurriedly relating the story of his life for the last four years it was the most stupid story of a fool drawn into matters that did not concern him and in his drunkenness and debauchery unable till the last minute to grasp their importance he said that before he left petersburg he had been drawn in at first simply through friendship like a regular student although he wasn't a student and knowing nothing about it without being guilty of anything he had scattered various papers on staircases left them by dozens at doors on bell handles had thrust them in as though they were newspapers taken them to the theatre put them in people's hats and slipped them into pockets afterwards he had taken money from them for what means had i he had distributed all sorts of rubbish through the districts of two provinces oh nikolai vsyevolodovitch he exclaimed what revolted me most was that this was utterly opposed to civic and still more to patriotic laws they suddenly printed that men were to go out with pitchforks and to remember that those who went out poor in the morning might go home rich at night only think of it it made me shudder and yet i distributed it or suddenly five or six lines addressed to the whole of russia apropos of nothing make haste and lock up the churches abolish god do away with marriage destroy the right of inheritance take up your knives that's all and god knows what it means i tell you i almost got caught with this five-line leaflet the officers in the regiment gave me a thrashing but bless them for it let me go and last year i was almost caught when i passed off french counterfeit notes for fifty roubles on korovayev but thank god korovaya fell into the pond when he was drunk and was drowned in the nick of time and they didn't succeed in tracking me here at virginsky's i proclaimed the freedom of the communistic life in june i was distributing manifestos again in x district they say they will make me do it again pyotr stepanovitch suddenly gave me to understand that i must obey he's been threatening me a long time how he treated me that sunday nikolai vsyevolodovitch i am a slave i am a worm but not a god which is where i differ from derzhavin but i've no income no income nikolai vsyevolodovitch heard it all with curiosity a great deal of that i had heard nothing of he said of course anything may have happened to you listen he said after a minute's thought if you like you can tell them you know whom that liputin was lying and that you were only pretending to give information to frighten me supposing that i too was compromised and that you might get more money out of me that way do you understand dear nikolai vsyevolodovitch is it possible that there's such a danger hanging over me i've been longing for you to come to ask you nikolai vsyevolodovitch laughed they certainly wouldn't let you go to petersburg even if i were to give you money for the journey 
but it's time for me to see Maria timofyevna and he got up from his chair nikolai vsyevolodovitch but how about Maria timofyevna why as i told you can it be true you still don't believe it will you really cast me off like an old worn-out shoe i'll see laughed nikolai vsyevolodovitch come let me go wouldn't you like me to stand on the steps for fear i might by chance overhear something for the rooms are small that says well stand on the steps take my umbrella your umbrella am i worth it said the captain over sweetly any one is worthy of an umbrella at one stroke you define the minimum of human rights but he was by now muttering mechanically he was too much crushed by what he had learned and was completely thrown out of his reckoning and yet almost as soon as he had gone out onto the steps and had put up the umbrella there his shallow and cunning brain caught again the ever-present comforting idea that he was being cheated and deceived and if so they were afraid of him and there was no need for him to be afraid if they're lying and deceiving me what's at the bottom of it was the thought that gnawed at his mind the public announcement of the marriage seemed to him absurd it's true that with such a wonder-worker anything may come to pass he lives to do harm but what if he's afraid himself since the insult of sunday and afraid as he's never been before and so he's in a hurry to declare that he'll announce it himself from fear that i should announce it eh don't blunder lebyadkin and why does he come on the sly at night if he means to make it public himself and if he's afraid it means that he's afraid now at this moment for these few days eh don't make a mistake lebyadkin he scares me with pyotr stepanovitch oh i am frightened i am frightened yes this is what's so frightening and what induced me to blab to liputin goodness knows what these devils are up to i never can make head or tail of it now they are all astir again as they were five years ago to whom could i give information indeed haven't i written to any one in my foolishness hm. so then i might write as though through foolishness isn't he giving me a hint you're going to petersburg on purpose ah the sly rogue i've scarcely dreamed of it and he guesses my dreams as though he were putting me up to going himself it's one or the other of two games he's up to either he's afraid because he's been up to some pranks himself or he's not afraid for himself but is simply egging me on to give them all away ah it's terrible lebyadkin ah you must not make a blunder he was so absorbed in thought that he forgot to listen it was not easy to hear either the door was a solid one and they were talking in a very low voice nothing reached the captain but indistinct sounds he positively spat in disgust and went out again lost in thought to whistle on the steps end of part two chapter two section two recording by expatriate in bangor maine part two chapter two section three of the possessed by fyodor dostoevsky translated by constance garnett this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine part two chapter two night continued section three marya timofyevna's room was twice as large as the one occupied by the captain and furnished in the same rough style but the table in front of the sofa was covered with a gay-coloured tablecloth and on it a lamp was burning there was a handsome carpet on the floor the bed was screened off by a green curtain which ran the length of the room and besides the sofa there stood by the table a large soft easy-chair in which marya timofyevna never sat however in the corner there was an icon as there had been in her old room and a little lamp was burning before it and on the table were all her indispensable properties the pack of cards the little looking-glass the song-book even a milk-loaf besides these there were two books with coloured pictures one extracts from a popular book of travels published for juvenile reading the other a collection of very light edifying tales for the most part about the days of chivalry intended for christmas presents or school reading she had too an album of photographs of various sorts Maria timofyevna was of course expecting the visitor as the captain had announced but when nikolai vsyevolodovitch went in she was asleep 
half reclining on the sofa propped on a woolwork cushion her visitor closed the door after him noiselessly and standing still scrutinized the sleeping figure the captain had been romancing when he told nikolai vsyevolodovitch she had been dressing herself up she was wearing the same dark dress as on sunday at varvara petrovna's her hair was done up in the same little close knot at the back of her head her long thin neck was exposed in the same way the black shawl varvara petrovna had given her lay carefully folded on the sofa she was coarsely rouged and powdered as before nikolai vsyevolodovitch did not stand there more than a minute she suddenly waked up as though she were conscious of his eyes fixed upon her she opened her eyes and quickly drew herself up but something strange must have happened to her visitor he remained standing at the same place by the door with a fixed and searching glance he looked mutely and persistently into her face perhaps that look was too grim perhaps there was an expression of aversion in it even a malignant enjoyment of her fright as if it were not a fancy left by her dreams but suddenly after almost a moment of expectation the poor woman's face wore a look of absolute terror it twitched convulsively she lifted her trembling hands and suddenly burst into tears exactly like a frightened child in another moment she would have screamed but nikolai vsyevolodovitch pulled himself together his face changed in one instant and he went up to the table with the most cordial and amiable smile i'm sorry marya timofyevna i frightened you coming in suddenly when you were asleep he said holding out his hand to her the sound of his caressing words produced their effect her fear vanished although she still looked at him with dismay evidently trying to understand something she held out her hands timorously also at last a shy smile rose to her lips how do you do prince she whispered looking at him strangely you must have had a bad dream he went on with a still more friendly and cordial smile but how do you know that i was dreaming about that and again she began trembling and started back putting up her hand as though to protect herself on the point of crying again calm yourself that's enough what are you afraid of surely you know me said nikolai vsyevolodovitch trying to soothe her but it was long before he could succeed she gazed at him dumbly with the same look of agonizing perplexity with a painful idea in her poor brain and she still seemed to be trying to reach some conclusion at one moment she dropped her eyes then suddenly scrutinized him in a rapid comprehensive glance at last though not reassured she seemed to come to a conclusion sit down beside me please that i may look at you thoroughly later on she brought out with more firmness evidently with a new object but don't be uneasy i won't look at you now i'll look down don't you look at me either till i ask you to sit down she added with positive impatience a new sensation was obviously growing stronger and stronger in her nikolai vsyevolodovitch sat down and waited rather a long silence followed hm it all seems so strange to me she suddenly muttered almost disdainfully of course i was depressed by bad dreams but why have i dreamt of you looking like that come let's have done with dreams he said impatiently turning to her in spite of her prohibition and perhaps the same expression gleamed for a moment in his eyes again he saw that she several times wanted very much in fact to look at him again but that she obstinately controlled herself and kept her eyes cast down listen prince she raised her voice suddenly listen prince why do you turn away why don't you look at me what's the object of this farce he cried losing patience but she seemed not to hear him listen prince she repeated for the third time in a resolute voice with a disagreeable fussy expression when you told me in the carriage that our marriage was going to be made public i was alarmed at there being an end to the mystery now i don't know i've been thinking it all over and i see clearly that i'm not fit for it at all i know how to dress and i could receive guests perhaps there's nothing much in asking people to have a cup of tea especially when there are footmen but what will people say though i saw a great deal that sunday morning in that house that pretty young lady looked at me all the time especially after you came in it was you came in wasn't it her mother's simply an absurd worldly old woman my lebyadkin distinguished himself too i kept looking at the ceiling to keep from laughing the ceiling there is finely painted 
his mother ought to be an abbess i'm afraid of her though she did give me a black shawl of course they must all have come to strange conclusions about me i wasn't vexed but i sat there thinking what relation am i to them of course from a countess one doesn't expect any but spiritual qualities for the domestic ones she's got plenty of footmen and also a little worldly coquetry so as to be able to entertain foreign travellers but yet that sunday they did look upon me as hopeless only dasha's an angel i'm awfully afraid they may wound him by some careless allusion to me don't be afraid and don't be uneasy said nikolai vsyevolodovitch making a wry face however that doesn't matter to me if he is a little ashamed of me for there will always be more pity than shame though it differs with people of course he knows to be sure that i ought rather to pity them than they me you seem to be very much offended with him marya timofyevna i oh no she smiled with simple-hearted mirth not at all i looked at you all then you were all angry you were all quarrelling they meet together and they don't know how to laugh from their hearts so much wealth and so little gaiety it all disgusts me though i feel for no one now except myself i've heard that you've had a hard life with your brother without me who told you that it's nonsense it's much worse now now my dreams are not good and my dreams are bad because you've come what have you come for i'd like to know tell me please wouldn't you like to go back into the nunnery i knew they'd suggest the nunnery again your nunnery is a fine marvel for me and why should i go to it what should i go for now i'm all alone in the world now it's too late for me to begin a third life you seem very angry about something surely you're not afraid that i've left off loving you i'm not troubling about you at all i'm afraid that i may leave off loving somebody she laughed contemptuously i must have done him some great wrong she added suddenly as it were to herself only i don't know what i've done wrong that's always what troubles me always always for the last five years i've been afraid day and night that i've done him some wrong i prayed and prayed and always thought of the great wrong i'd done him and now it turns out it was true what's turned out i'm only afraid whether there's something on his side she went on not answering his question not hearing it in fact and then again he couldn't get on with such horrid people the countess would have liked to eat me though she did make me sit in the carriage beside her they're all in the plot surely he's not betrayed me her chin and lips were twitching tell me have you read about grishka otropyov how he was cursed in seven cathedrals nikolai vsyevolodovitch did not speak but i'll turn round now and look at you she seemed to decide suddenly you turn to me too and look at me but more attentively i want to make sure for the last time i've been looking at you for a long time hm said marya timofyevna looking at him intently you've grown much fatter she wanted to say something more but suddenly for the third time the same terror instantly distorted her face and again she drew back putting her hand up before her what's the matter with you cried nikolai vsyevolodovitch almost enraged but her panic lasted only one instant her face worked with a sort of strange smile suspicious and unpleasant i beg you prince get up and come in she brought out suddenly in a firm emphatic voice come in where am i to come in i've been fancying for five years how he would come in get up and go out of the door into the other room i'll sit as though i weren't expecting anything and i'll take up a book and suddenly you'll come in after five years travelling i want to see what it will be like nikolai vsyevolodovitch ground his teeth and muttered something to himself enough he said striking the table with his open hand i beg you to listen to me marya timofyevna do me the favour to concentrate all your attention if you can you're not altogether mad you know he broke out impatiently to-morrow i shall make our marriage public you never will live in a palace get that out of your head you want to live with me for the rest of your life only very far away from here in the mountains in switzerland there's a place there don't be afraid i'll never abandon you or put you in a madhouse i shall have money enough to live without asking anyone's help you shall have a servant you shall do no work at all everything you want that's possible shall be got for you you shall pray go where you like and do what you like i won't touch you i won't go away from the place myself at all if you like i won't speak to you all my life 
or if you like you can tell me your stories every evening as you used to do in petersburg in the corners i'll read aloud to you if you like but it must be all your life in the same place and that place is a gloomy one will you are you ready you won't regret it torment me with tears and curses will you she listened with extreme curiosity and for a long time she was silent thinking it all seems incredible to me she said at last ironically and disdainfully i might live for forty years in those mountains she laughed what of it let's live forty years then said nikolai vsyevolodovitch scowling hm i won't come for anything not even with me and what are you that i should go with you i'm to sit on a mountain beside him for forty years on end a pretty story and upon my word how long-suffering people have become nowadays no it cannot be that a falcon has become an owl my prince is not like that she said raising her head proudly and triumphantly light seemed to dawn upon him what makes you call me a prince and for whom do you take me he asked quickly why aren't you the prince i never have been one so yourself yourself you tell me straight to my face that you're not the prince i tell you i never have been good lord she cried clasping her hands i was ready to expect anything from his enemies but such insolence never is he alive she shrieked in a frenzy turning upon nikolai vsyevolodovitch have you killed him confess whom do you take me for he cried jumping up from his chair with a distorted face but it was not easy now to frighten her she was triumphant who can tell who you are and where you've sprung from only my heart my heart had misgivings all these five years of all the intrigues and i've been sitting here wondering what blind owl was making up to me no my dear you're a poor actor worse than lebyadkin even give my humble greetings to the countess and tell her to send someone better than you has she hired you tell me have they given you a place in her kitchen out of charity i see through your deception i understand you all every one of you he seized her firmly above the elbow she laughed in his face you're like him very like perhaps you're a relation you're a sly lot only mine is a bright falcon and a prince and you're an owl and a shopman mine will bow down to god if it pleases him and won't if it doesn't and shatushka he's my dear my darling slapped you on the cheeks my lebyadkin told me and what were you afraid of then when you came in who had frightened you then when i saw your mean face after i'd fallen down and you picked me up it was like a worm crawling into my heart it's not he i thought not he my falcon would never have been ashamed of me before a fashionable young lady oh heavens that alone kept me happy for those five years that my falcon was living somewhere beyond the mountains soaring gazing at the sun tell me you impostor have you got much by it did you need a big bribe to consent i wouldn't have given you a farthing ha 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 ah oh, idiot snarled nikolai vsyevolodovitch still holding her tight by the arm go away impostor she shouted peremptorily i'm the wife of my prince i'm not afraid of your knife knife yes knife you've a knife in your pocket you thought i was asleep but i saw it when you came in just now you took out your knife what are you saying unhappy creature what dreams you have he exclaimed pushing her away from him with all his might so that her head and shoulders fell painfully against the sofa he was rushing away but she at once flew to overtake him limping and hopping and though lebyadkin panic-stricken held her back with all his might she succeeded in shouting after him into the darkness shrieking and laughing a curse on you grishka otropiev end of part two chapter two section three recording by expatriate in bangor maine part two chapter two section four of the possessed by fyodor dostoevsky translated by constance garnett this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine part two chapter two night continued section four a knife a knife he repeated with uncontrollable anger striding along through the mud and puddles without picking his way it is true that at moments he had a terrible desire to laugh aloud frantically 
but for some reason he controlled himself and restrained his laughter he recovered himself only on the bridge on the spot where fedka had met him that evening he found the man lying in wait for him again seeing nikolai vsyevolodovitch he took off his cap grinned gaily and began babbling briskly and merrily about something at first nikolai vsyevolodovitch walked on without stopping and for some time did not even listen to the tramp who was pestering him again he was suddenly struck by the thought that he had entirely forgotten him and had forgotten him at the very moment when he himself was repeating a knife a knife he seized the tramp by the collar and gave vent to his pent-up rage by flinging him violently against the bridge for one instant the man thought of fighting but almost at once realizing that compared with his adversary who had fallen upon him unawares he was no better than a wisp of straw he subsided and was silent without offering any resistance crouching on the ground with his elbows crooked behind his back the wily tramp calmly waited for what would happen next apparently quite incredulous of danger he was right in his reckoning nikolai vsyevolodovitch had already with his left hand taken off his thick scarf to tie his prisoner's arms but suddenly for some reason he abandoned him and shoved him away the man instantly sprang on to his feet turned round and a short broad boot knife suddenly gleamed in his hand away with that knife put it away at once nikolai vsyevolodovitch commanded with an impatient gesture and the knife vanished as instantaneously as it had appeared without speaking again or turning round nikolai vsyevolodovitch went on his way but the persistent vagabond did not leave him even now though now it is true he did not chatter and even respectfully kept his distance a full step behind they crossed the bridge like this and came out onto the river bank turning this time to the left again into a long deserted back street which led to the centre of the town by a shorter way than going through bogoyavlensky street is it true as they say that you robbed a church in the district the other day nikolai vsyevolodovitch asked suddenly i went in to say my prayers in the first place the tramp answered sedately and respectfully as though nothing had happened more than sedately in fact almost with dignity there was no trace of his former friendly familiarity all that was to be seen was a serious business-like man who had indeed been gratuitously insulted but who was capable of overlooking an insult but when the lord led me there he went on eh i thought what a heavenly abundance it was all owing to my helpless state as in our way of life there's no doing without assistance and now god be my witness sir it was my own loss the lord punished me for my sins and what with the censor and the deacon's halter i only got twelve roubles altogether the chin setting of st nikolai of pure silver went for next to nothing they said it was plated you killed the watchman that is i cleared the place out together with that watchman but afterwards next morning by the river we fell to quarrelling which should carry the sack i sinned i did lighten his load for him well you can rob and murder again that's the very advice pyotr stepanovitch gives me in the very same words for he's uncommonly mean and hard-hearted about helping a fellow-creature and what's more he hasn't a haperth of belief in the heavenly creator who made us out of earthly clay but he says it's all the work of nature even to the last beast he doesn't understand either that with our way of life it's impossible for us to get along without friendly assistance if you begin to talk to him he looks like a sheep at the water it makes one wonder would you believe at captain lebyadkin's out yonder whom your honour's just been visiting when he was living at Philippos before you came the door stood open all night long he'd be drunk and sleeping like the dead and his money dropping out of his pockets all over the floor i've chanced to see it with my own eyes for in our way of life it's impossible to live without assistance how do you mean with your own eyes did you go in at night then oh maybe i did go in but no one knows of it why didn't you kill him reckoning it out i steadied myself for once having learned for sure that i can always get one hundred and fifty roubles why should i go so far when i can get fifteen hundred roubles if i only bide my time for captain lebyadkin i've heard him with my own ears had great hopes of you when he was drunk and there isn't a tavern here not the lowest pot-house where he hasn't talked about it when he was in that state so that hearing it from many lips i began too to rest all my hopes on your excellency 
i speak to you sir as to my father or my own brother for pyotr stepanovitch will never learn that from me and not a soul in the world so won't your excellency spare me three roubles in your kindness you might set my mind at rest so that i might know the real truth for we can't get on without assistance nikolai vsyevolodovitch laughed aloud and taking out his purse in which he had as much as fifty roubles in small notes threw him one note out of the bundle then a second a third a fourth fedka flew to catch them in the air the notes dropped into the mud and he snatched them up crying ah ah nikolai vsyevolodovitch finished by flinging the whole bundle at him and still laughing went on down the street this time alone the tramp remained crawling on his knees in the mud looking for the notes which were blown about by the wind and soaking in the puddles and for an hour after his spasmodic cries of ah ah were still to be heard in the darkness end of part two chapter two recording by expatriate in bangor maine part two chapter three of the possessed by fyodor dostoevsky translated by constance garnett this librivox recording is in the public domain recorded by expatriate in bangor maine chapter three the duel section one the next day at two o'clock in the afternoon the duel took place as arranged things were hastened forward by gaganov's obstinate desire to fight at all costs he did not understand his adversary's conduct and was in a fury for a whole month he had been insulting him with impunity and had so far been unable to make him lose patience what he wanted was a challenge on the part of nikolai vsyevolodovitch as he had not himself any direct pretext for challenging him his secret motive for it that is his almost morbid hatred of stavrogin for the insult to his family four years before he was for some reason ashamed to confess and indeed he regarded this himself as an impossible pretext for a challenge especially in view of the humble apology offered by nikolai stavrogin twice already he privately made up his mind that stavrogin was a shameless coward and could not understand how he could have accepted shatov's blow so he made up his mind at last to send him the extraordinarily rude letter that had finally roused nikolai vsyevolodovitch himself to propose a meeting having dispatched this letter the day before he awaited a challenge with feverish impatience and while morbidly reckoning the chances at one moment with hope and at the next with despair he got ready for any emergency by securing a second to wit mavriki nikolaevitch drozdov who was a friend of his an old schoolfellow a man for whom he had a great respect so when kirillov came next morning at nine o'clock with his message he found things in readiness all the apologies and unheard-of condescension of nikolai vsyevolodovitch were at once at the first word rejected with extraordinary exasperation mavriki nikolaevitch who had only been made acquainted with the position of affairs the evening before opened his mouth with surprise at such incredible concessions and would have urged a reconciliation but seeing that gaganov guessing his intention was almost trembling in his chair refrained and said nothing if it had not been for the promise given to his old schoolfellow he would have retired immediately he only remained in the hope of being some help on the scene of action kirillov repeated the challenge all the conditions of the encounter made by stavrogin were accepted on the spot without the faintest objection only one addition was made and that a ferocious one if the first shots had no decisive effect they were to fire again and if the second encounter were inconclusive it was to be followed by a third kirillov frowned objected to the third encounter but gaining nothing by his efforts agreed on the condition however that three should be the limit and that a fourth encounter was out of the question this was conceded accordingly at two o'clock in the afternoon the meeting took place at brikov that is in a little copse in the outskirts of the town lying between skvoreshniki and the spigulin factory the rain of the previous night was over but it was damp grey and windy low ragged dingy clouds moved rapidly across the cold sky the treetops roared with a deep droning sound and creaked on their roots it was a melancholy morning 
Mavriki Nikolaevitch and Gaganov arrived on the spot in a smart charabanc with a pair of horses driven by the latter. They were accompanied by a groom. Nikolai Vsevolodovitch and Kirillov arrived almost at the same instant. They were not driving, they were on horseback, and were also followed by a mounted servant. Kirillov, who had never mounted a horse before, sat up boldly, erect in the saddle, grasping in his right hand the heavy box of pistols which he would not entrust to the servant. In his inexperience he was continually with his left hand tugging at the reins, which made the horse toss his head and show an inclination to rear. This, however, seemed to cause his rider no uneasiness gaganov who was morbidly suspicious and always ready to be deeply offended considered their coming on horseback as a fresh insult to himself inasmuch as it showed that his opponents were too confident of success since they had not even thought it necessary to have a carriage in case of being wounded and disabled he got out of his charabanc yellow with anger and felt that his hands were trembling as he told mavriki nikolaevitch he made no response at all to nikolai vsevolodovitch's bow and turned away the seconds cast lots the lot fell on kirillov's pistols they measured out the barrier and placed the combatants the servants with the carriage and horses were moved back three hundred paces the weapons were loaded and handed to the combatants i'm sorry that i have to tell my story more quickly and have no time for descriptions but i can't refrain from some comments mavriki nikolaevitch was melancholy and preoccupied kirillov on the other hand was perfectly calm and unconcerned very exact over the details of the duties he had undertaken but without the slightest fussiness or even curiosity as to the issue of the fateful contest that was so near at hand nikolai vsevolodovitch was paler than usual he was rather lightly dressed in an overcoat and a white beaver hat he seemed very tired he frowned from time to time and seemed to feel it superfluous to conceal his ill-humour but gaganov was at this moment more worthy of mention than any one so that it is quite impossible not to say a few words about him in particular section two i have hitherto not had occasion to describe his appearance he was a tall man of thirty-three and well fed as the common folk express it almost fat with lank flaxen hair and with features which might be called handsome he had retired from the service with the rank of colonel and if he had served till he reached the rank of general he would have been even more impressive in that position and would very likely have become an excellent fighting general i must add as characteristic of the man that the chief cause of his leaving the army was the thought of the family disgrace which had haunted him so painfully since the insult paid to his father by nikolai vsevolodovitch four years before at the club he conscientiously considered it dishonourable to remain in the service and was inwardly persuaded that he was contaminating the regiment and his companions although they knew nothing of the incident it's true that he had once before been disposed to leave the army long before the insult to his father and on quite other grounds but he had hesitated strange as it is to write the original design or rather desire to leave the army was due to the proclamation of the nineteenth of february of the emancipation of the serfs gaganov who was one of the richest landowners in the province and who had not lost very much by the emancipation and was moreover quite capable of understanding the humanity of the reform and its economic advantages suddenly felt himself personally insulted by the proclamation it was something unconscious a feeling but was all the stronger for being unrecognized he could not bring himself however to take any decisive step till his father's death but he began to be well known for his gentlemanly ideas to many persons of high position in petersburg with whom he strenuously kept up connections he was secretive and self-contained another characteristic he belonged to that strange section of the nobility still surviving in russia who set an extreme value on their pure and ancient lineage and take it too seriously at the same time he could not endure russian history and indeed looked upon russian customs in general as more or less piggish even in his childhood in the special military school for the sons of particularly wealthy and distinguished families in which he had the privilege of being educated from first to last certain poetic notions were deeply rooted in his mind 
he loved castles chivalry all the theatrical part of it he was ready to cry with shame that in the days of the moscow czars the sovereign had the right to inflict corporal punishment on the russian boyars and blushed at the contrast this stiff and extremely severe man who had a remarkable knowledge of military science and performed his duties admirably was at heart a dreamer it was said that he could speak at meetings and had the gift of language but at no time during the thirty-three years of his life had he spoken even in the distinguished circles in petersburg in which he had moved of late he behaved with extraordinary haughtiness his meeting in petersburg with nikolai vsyevolodovitch who had just returned from abroad almost sent him out of his mind at the present moment standing at the barrier he was terribly uneasy he kept imagining that the duel would somehow not come off the least delay threw him into a tremor there was an expression of anguish in his face when kirillov instead of giving the signal for them to fire began suddenly speaking only for form indeed as he himself explained aloud simply as a formality now that you have the pistols in your hands and i must give the signal i ask you for the last time will you not be reconciled it's the duty of a second as though to spite him mavriky nikolaevitch who had till then kept silence although he had been reproaching himself all day for his compliance and acquiescence suddenly caught up kirillov's thought and began to speak i entirely agree with mr kirillov's words this idea that reconciliation is impossible at the barrier is a prejudice only suitable for frenchmen besides with your leave i don't understand what the offence is i've been wanting to say so for a long time because every apology is offered isn't it he flushed all over he had rarely spoken so much and with such excitement i repeat again my offer to make every possible apology nikolai vsyevolodovitch interposed hurriedly this is impossible shouted gaganov furiously addressing mavriky nikolaevitch and stamping with rage explain to this man he pointed with his pistol at nikolai vsyevolodovitch if you are my second and not my enemy mavriky nikolaevitch that such overtures only aggravate the insult he feels it impossible to be insulted by me he feels it no disgrace to walk away from me at the barrier what does he take me for after that do you think and you you my second too you're simply irritating me that i may miss he stamped again there were flecks of foam on his lips negotiations are over i beg you to listen to the signal kirillov shouted at the top of his voice one two three at the word three the combatants took aim at one another gaganov at once raised his pistol and at the fifth or sixth step he fired for a second he stood still and making sure that he had missed advanced to the barrier nikolai vsyevolodovitch advanced too raising his pistol but somehow holding it very high and fired almost without taking aim then he took out his handkerchief and bound it round the little finger of his right hand only then they saw that gaganov had not missed him completely but the bullet had only grazed the fleshy part of his finger without touching the bone it was only a slight scratch kirillov at once announced that the duel would go on unless the combatants were satisfied i declare said gaganov hoarsely his throat felt parched again addressing mavriky nikolaevitch that this man again he pointed in stavrogin's direction fired in the air on purpose intentionally this is an insult again he wants to make the duel impossible i have the right to fire as i like so long as i keep the rules nikolai vsyevolodovitch asserted resolutely no he hasn't explain it to him explain it cried gaganov i'm in complete agreement with nikolai vsyevolodovitch proclaimed kirillov why does he spare me gaganov raged not hearing him i despise his mercy i spit on it i i give you my word that i did not intend to insult you cried nikolai vsyevolodovitch impatiently i shot high because i don't want to kill anyone else either you or anyone else it's nothing to do with you personally it's true that i don't consider myself insulted and i'm sorry that angers you but i don't allow anyone to interfere with my rights if he's so afraid of bloodshed ask him why he challenged me yelled gaganov still addressing mavriky nikolaevitch how could he help challenging you said kirillov intervening you wouldn't listen to anything how was one to get rid of you 
i'll only mention one thing observed mavriky nikolaevitch pondering the matter with painful effort if a combatant declares beforehand that he will fire in the air the duel certainly cannot go on for obvious and delicate reasons i haven't declared that i'll fire in the air every time cried stavrogin losing all patience you don't know what's in my mind or how i intend to fire again i'm not restricting the duel at all in that case the encounter can go on said mavriky nikolaevitch to gaganov gentlemen take your places kirillov commanded again they advanced again gaganov missed and stavrogin fired into the air there might have been a dispute as to his firing into the air nikolai vsyevolodovitch might have flatly declared that he'd fired properly if he had not admitted that he had missed intentionally he did not aim straight at the sky or at the trees but seemed to aim at his adversary though as he pointed the pistol the bullet flew a yard above his hat the second time the shot was even lower even less like an intentional miss nothing would have convinced gaganov now again he muttered grinding his teeth no matter i've been challenged and i'll make use of my rights i'll fire a third time whatever happens you have full right to do so kirillov rapped out mavriky nikolaevitch said nothing the opponents were placed a third time the signal was given this time gaganov went right up to the barrier and began from there taking aim at a distance of twelve paces his hand was trembling too much to take good aim stavrogin stood with his pistol lowered and awaited his shot without moving too long you've been aiming too long kirillov shouted impetuously fire fire but the shot rang out and this time stavrogin's white beaver hat flew off the aim had been fairly correct the crown of the hat was pierced very low down a quarter of an inch lower and all would have been over kirillov picked up the hat and handed it to nikolai vsyevolodovitch fire don't detain your adversary cried mavriky nikolaevitch in extreme agitation seeing that stavrogin seemed to have forgotten to fire and was examining the hat with kirillov stavrogin started looked at gaganov turned round and this time without the slightest regard for punctilio fired to one side into the copse the duel was over gaganov stood as though overwhelmed mavriky nikolaevitch went up and began saying something to him but he did not seem to understand kirillov took off his hat as he went away and nodded to mavriky nikolaevitch but stavrogin forgot his former politeness when he had shot into the copse he did not even turn towards the barrier he handed his pistol to kirillov and hastened towards the horses his face looked angry he did not speak kirillov too was silent they got on their horses and set off at a gallop section three why don't you speak he called impatiently to kirillov when they were not far from home what do you want replied the latter almost slipping off his horse which was rearing stavrogin restrained himself i didn't mean to insult that fool and i've insulted him again he said quietly yes you've insulted him again kirillov jerked out and besides he's not a fool i've done all i can anyway no what ought i to have done not have challenged him except another blow in the face yes except another i can't understand anything now said stavrogin wrathfully why does every one expect of me something not expected from any one else why am i to put up with what no one else puts up with and undertake burdens no one else can bear i thought you were seeking a burden yourself i seek a burden yes you've seen that yes is it so noticeable yes there was silence for a moment stavrogin had a very preoccupied face he was almost impressed i didn't aim because i didn't want to kill anyone there was nothing more in it i assure you he said hurriedly and with agitation as though justifying himself you ought not to have offended him what ought i to have done then you ought to have killed him are you sorry i didn't kill him i'm not sorry for anything i thought you really meant to kill him you don't know what you're seeking i seek a burden laughed stavrogin if you didn't want blood yourself why did you give him a chance to kill you if i hadn't challenged him he'd have killed me simply without a duel that's not your affair perhaps he wouldn't have killed you only have beaten me that's not your business bear your burden or else there's no merit hang your merit i don't seek anyone's approbation 
i thought you were seeking it kirillov commented with terrible unconcern they rode into the courtyard of the house do you care to come in said nikolai vsyevolodovitch no i'm going home good-bye he got off the horse and took his box of pistols under his arm anyway you're not angry with me said stavrogin holding out his hand to him not in the least said kirillov turning round to shake hands with him if my burden's light it's because it's from nature perhaps your burden's heavier because that's your nature there's no need to be much ashamed only a little i know i'm a worthless character and i don't pretend to be a strong one you'd better not you're not a strong person come and have tea nikolai vsyevolodovitch went into the house greatly perturbed section four he learned at once from alexey yegorytch that varvara petrovna had been very glad to hear that nikolai vsyevolodovitch had gone out for a ride the first time he had left the house after eight days illness she had ordered the carriage and had driven out alone for a breath of fresh air according to the habit of the past as she had forgotten for the last eight days what it meant to breathe fresh air alone or with darya pavlovna nikolai vsyevolodovitch interrupted the old man with a rapid question and he scowled when he heard that darya pavlovna had declined to go abroad on account of indisposition and was in her rooms listen old man he said as though suddenly making up his mind keep watch over her all to-day and if you notice her coming to me stop her at once and tell her that i can't see her for a few days at least that i ask her not to come myself i'll let her know myself when the time comes do you hear i'll tell her sir said alexey yegorytch with distress in his voice dropping his eyes not till you see clearly she's meaning to come and see me of herself though don't be afraid sir there shall be no mistake your interviews have all passed through me hitherto you've always turned to me for help i know not till she comes of herself anyway bring me some tea if you can at once the old man had hardly gone out when almost at the same instant the door reopened and darya pavlovna appeared in the doorway her eyes were tranquil though her face was pale where have you come from exclaimed stavrogin i was standing there and waiting for him to go out to come in to you i heard the order you gave him and when he came out just now i hid round the corner on the right and he didn't notice me i've long meant to break off with you dasha for a while for the present i couldn't see you last night in spite of your note i meant to write to you myself but i don't know how to write he added with vexation almost as though with disgust i thought myself that we must break it off varvara petrovna is too suspicious of our relations well let her be she mustn't be worried so now we part till the end comes you still insist on expecting the end yes i'm sure of it but nothing in the world ever has an end this will have an end then call me i'll come now good-bye and what sort of end will it be smiled nikolai vsyevolodovitch you're not wounded and have not shed blood she asked not answering his question it was stupid i didn't kill anyone don't be uneasy however you'll hear all about it to-day from everyone i'm not quite well i'm going the announcement of the marriage won't be to-day she added irresolutely it won't be to-day and it won't be to-morrow i can't say about the day after to-morrow perhaps we shall all be dead and so much the better leave me alone leave me alone do you won't ruin that other mad girl i won't ruin either of the mad creatures it seems to be the sane i'm ruining i'm so vile and loathsome dasha that i might really send for you at the latter end as you say and in spite of your sanity you'll come why will you be your own ruin i know that at the end i shall be the only one left you and i'm waiting for that and what if i don't send for you after all but run away from you that can't be you will send for me there's a great deal of contempt for me in that you know that there's not only contempt then there is contempt anyway i used the wrong word god is my witness it's my greatest wish that you may never have need of me one phrase is as good as another i should also have wished not to have ruined you you can never anyhow be my ruin and you know that yourself better than anyone darya pavlovna said rapidly and resolutely if i don't come to you i shall be a sister of mercy a nurse shall wait upon the sick or go selling the gospel i've made up my mind to that i cannot be anyone's wife i can't live in a house like this either 
that's not what i want you know all that no i never could tell what you want it seems to me that you're interested in me as some veteran nurses get specially interested in some particular invalid in comparison with the others or still more like some pious old women who frequent funerals and find one corpse more attractive than another why do you look at me so strangely are you very ill she asked sympathetically looking at him in a peculiar way good heavens and this man wants to do without me listen dasha now i'm always seeing phantoms one devil offered me yesterday on the bridge to murder lebyadkin and marya timofyevna to settle the marriage difficulty and to cover up all traces he asked me to give him three roubles on account but gave me to understand that the whole operation wouldn't cost less than fifteen hundred wasn't he a calculating devil a regular shopkeeper ha <laughs> ha but you're fully convinced that it was an hallucination oh no not a bit an hallucination it was simply fedka the convict the robber who escaped from prison but that's not the point what do you suppose i did i gave him all i had everything in my purse and now he's sure i've given him that on account you met him at night and he made such a suggestion surely you must see that you're being caught in their nets on every side well let them be but you've got some question at the tip of your tongue you know i see it by your eyes he added with a resentful and irritable smile dasha was frightened i've no question at all and no doubt whatever you'd better be quiet she cried in dismay as though waving off his question then you're convinced that i won't go to fedka's little shop oh god she cried clasping her hands why do you torture me like this oh forgive me my stupid joke i must be picking up bad manners from them do you know ever since last night i feel awfully inclined to laugh to go on laughing continually for ever so long it's as though i must explode with laughter it's like an illness oh my mother's coming in i always know by the rumble when her carriage has stopped at the entrance dasha seized his hand god save you from your demon and call me call me quickly oh a fine demon it's simply a little nasty scrofulous imp with a cold in his head one of the unsuccessful ones but you have something you don't dare to say again dasha she looked at him with pain and reproach and turned towards the door listen he called after her with a malignant and distorted smile if yes if in one word if you understand even if i did go to that little shop and if i called you after that would you come then she went out hiding her face in her hands and neither turning nor answering she will come even after the shop he whispered thinking a moment and an expression of scornful disdain came into his face a nurse hm but perhaps that's what i want end of chapter three recording by expatriate in bangor maine part two chapter four section one of the possessed by fyodor dostoevsky translated by constance garnett this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter four all in expectation section one the impression made on the whole neighbourhood by the story of the duel which was rapidly noised abroad was particularly remarkable from the unanimity with which every one hastened to take up the cudgel for nikolai vsyevolodovitch many of his former enemies declared themselves his friends the chief reason for this change of front in public opinion was chiefly due to one person who had hitherto not expressed her opinion but who now very distinctly uttered a few words which at once gave the event a significance exceedingly interesting to the vast majority this was how it happened on the day after the duel all the town was assembled at the marshal of nobilities in honour of his wife's name-day yulia mihailovna was present or rather presided accompanied by lizaveta nikolaevna radiant with beauty and peculiar gaiety which struck many of our ladies at once as particularly suspicious at this time and i may mention by the way her engagement to mavriky nikolaevitch was by now an established fact to a playful question from a retired general of much consequence of whom we shall have more to say later 
lizaveta nikolaevna frankly replied that evening that she was engaged and only imagine not one of our ladies would believe in her engagement they all persisted in assuming a romance of some sort some fatal family secret something that had happened in switzerland and for some reason imagined that yulia mihailovna must have had some hand in it it was difficult to understand why these rumours or rather fancies persisted so obstinately and why yulia mihailovna was so positively connected with it as soon as she came in all turned to her with strange looks brimful of expectation it must be observed that owing to the freshness of the event and certain circumstances accompanying it at the party people talked of it with some circumspection in undertones besides nothing yet was known of the line taken by the authorities as far as was known neither of the combatants had been troubled by the police every one knew for instance that gaganov had set off home early in the morning to duhovo without being hindered meanwhile of course all were eager for someone to be the first to speak of it aloud and so to open the door to the general impatience they rested their hopes on the general above mentioned and they were not disappointed this general a landowner though not a wealthy one was one of the most imposing members of our club and a man of an absolutely unique turn of mind he flirted in the old-fashioned way with the young ladies and was particularly fond in large assemblies of speaking aloud with all the weightiness of a general on subjects to which others were alluding in discreet whispers this was so to say his special role in local society he drawled too and spoke with peculiar suavity probably having picked up the habit from russians travelling abroad or from those wealthy landowners of former days who had suffered most from the emancipation stepan trofimovitch had observed that the more completely a landowner was ruined the more suavely he lisped and drawled his words he did as a fact lisp and drawl himself but was not aware of it in himself the general spoke like a person of authority he was besides a distant relation of gaganov's though he was on bad terms with him and even engaged in litigation with him he had moreover in the past fought two duels himself and had even been degraded to the ranks and sent to the caucasus on account of one of them some mention was made of varvara petrovna's having driven out that day and the day before after being kept indoors by illness though the allusion was not to her but to the marvellous matching of her four grey horses of the stavrogin's own breeding the general suddenly observed that he had met young stavrogin that day on horseback every one was instantly silent the general munched his lips and suddenly proclaimed twisting in his fingers his presentation gold snuff-box i'm sorry i wasn't here some years ago i mean when i was at carlsbad hm i'm very much interested in that young man about whom i heard so many rumours at that time hm and i say is it true that he's mad some one told me so then suddenly i'm told that he has been insulted by some student here in the presence of his cousins and he slipped under the table to get away from him and yesterday i heard from stepan vysotsky that stavrogin had been fighting with gaganov and simply with a gallant object of offering himself as a target to an infuriated man just to get rid of him hm quite in the style of the guards of the twenties is there any house where he visits here the general paused as though expecting an answer a way had been opened for the public impatience to express itself what could be simpler cried yulia mihailovna raising her voice irritated that all present had turned their eyes upon her as though at a word of command can one wonder that stavrogin fought gaganov and took no notice of the student he couldn't challenge a man who used to be his serf a noteworthy saying a clear and simple notion yet it had entered nobody's head till that moment it was a saying that had extraordinary consequences all scandal and gossip all the petty tittle-tattle was thrown into the background another significance had been detected a new character was revealed whom all had misjudged a character almost ideally severe in his standards mortally insulted by a student that is an educated man no longer a serf he despised the affront because his assailant had once been his serf society had gossiped and slandered him 
shallow-minded people had looked with contempt on a man who had been struck in the face he had despised a public opinion which had not risen to the level of the highest standards though it discussed them and meantime you and i ivan alexandrovitch sit and discuss the correct standards one old club member observed to another with a warm and generous glow of self-reproach yes pyotr mihailovitch yes the other chimed in with zest talk of the younger generation it's not a question of the younger generation observed the third putting in his spoke it's nothing to do with the younger generation he's a star not one of the younger generation that's the way to look at it and it's just that sort we need they're rare people the chief point in all this was that the new man besides showing himself an unmistakable nobleman was the wealthiest landowner in the province and was therefore bound to be a leading man who could be of assistance i have already alluded in passing to the attitude of the landowners of our province people were enthusiastic he didn't merely refrain from challenging the student he put his hands behind him note that particularly your excellency somebody pointed out and he didn't haul him up before the new law courts either added another in spite of the fact that for a personal insult to a nobleman he'd have got fifteen roubles damages he <laughs> he no i'll tell you a secret about the new courts cried a third in a frenzy of excitement if anyone's caught robbing or swindling and convicted he'd better run home while there's yet time and murder his mother he'll be acquitted of everything at once and ladies will wave their batiste handkerchiefs from the platform it's the absolute truth it's the truth it's the truth the inevitable anecdotes followed nikolai vsyevolodovitch's friendly relations with count k were recalled count k's stern and independent attitude to recent reforms was well known as well as his remarkable public activity though that had somewhat fallen off of late and now suddenly every one was positive that nikolai vsyevolodovitch was betrothed to one of the count's daughters though nothing had given grounds for such a supposition and as for some wonderful adventures in switzerland with lizaveta nikolaevna even the ladies quite dropped all reference to it i must mention by the way that the drozdovs had by this time succeeded in paying all the visits they had omitted at first every one now confidently considered lizaveta nikolaevna a most ordinary girl who paraded her delicate nerves her fainting on the day of nikolai vsyevolodovitch's arrival was explained now as due to her terror at the student's outrageous behaviour they even increased the prosaicness of that to which before they had striven to give such a fantastic colour as for a lame woman who had been talked of she was forgotten completely they were ashamed to remember her and if there had been a hundred lame girls we've all been young once nikolai vsyevolodovitch's respectfulness to his mother was enlarged upon various virtues were discovered in him people talked with approbation of the learning he had acquired in the four years he had spent in german universities gaganov's conduct was declared utterly tactless not knowing friend from foe yulia mihailovna's keen insight was unhesitatingly admitted so by the time nikolai vsyevolodovitch made his appearance among them he was received by every one with naive solemnity in all eyes fastened upon him could be read eager anticipation nikolai vsyevolodovitch at once wrapped himself in the most austere silence which of course gratified every one much more than if he had talked till doomsday in a word he was a success he was the fashion if once one has figured in provincial society there's no retreating into the background nikolai vsyevolodovitch began to fulfil all his social duties in the province punctiliously as before he was not found cheerful company a man who has seen suffering a man not like other people he has something to be melancholy about even the pride and disdainful aloofness for which he had been so detested four years before was now liked and respected varvara petrovna was triumphant i don't know whether she grieved much over the shattering of her dreams concerning lizaveta nikolaevna family pride of course helped her to get over it one thing was strange varvara petrovna was suddenly convinced that nikolai vsyevolodovitch really had made his choice at count k's and what was strangest of all 
she was led to believe it by rumours which reached her on no better authority than other people she was afraid to ask nikolay vsyevolodovitch a direct question two or three times however she could not refrain from slyly and good-humouredly reproaching him for not being open with her nikolay vsyevolodovitch smiled and remained silent the silence was taken as a sign of assent and yet all the time she never forgot the cripple the thought of her lay like a stone on her heart a nightmare she was tortured by strange misgivings and surmises and all this at the same time as she dreamed of count k s daughters but of this we shall speak later varvara petrovna began again of course to be treated with extreme deference and respect in society but she took little advantage of it and went out rarely she did however pay a visit of ceremony to the governor's wife of course no one had been more charmed and delighted by yulia mikhailovna's words spoken at the marshal's soiree than she they lifted a load of care off her heart and had at once relieved much of the distress she had been suffering since that luckless sunday i misunderstood that woman she declared and with her characteristic impulsiveness she frankly told yulia mikhailovna that she had come to thank her yulia mikhailovna was flattered but she behaved with dignity she was beginning about this time to be very conscious of her own importance too much so in fact she announced for example in the course of conversation that she had never heard of stepan trofimovitch as a leading man or a savant i know young verkovensky of course and make much of him he's imprudent but then he's young he's thoroughly well informed though he's not an out-of-date old-fashioned critic anyway varvara petrovna hastened to observe that stepan trofimovitch had never been a critic but had on the contrary spent all his life in her house he was renowned through circumstances of his early career only too well known to the whole world and of late for his researches in spanish history now he intended to write also on the position of modern german universities and she believed something about the dresden madonna too in short varvara petrovna refused to surrender stepan trofimovitch to the tender mercies of yulia mikhailovna the dresden madonna you mean the sistine madonna cher varvara petrovna i spent two hours sitting before that picture and came away utterly disillusioned i could make nothing of it and was in complete amazement karmazinov too says it's hard to understand it they all see nothing in it now russians and english alike all its fame is just the talk of the last generation fashions are changed then what i think is that one mustn't despise our younger generation either they cry out that they're communists but what i say is that we must appreciate them and mustn't be hard on them i read everything now the papers communism the natural sciences i get everything because after all one must know where one's living and with whom one has to do one mustn't spend one's whole life on the heights of one's own fancy i've come to the conclusion and adopted it as a principle that one must be kind to the young people and so keep them from the brink believe me varvara petrovna that none but we who make up good society can by our kindness and good influence keep them from the abyss towards which they are brought by the intolerance of all these old men i am glad though to learn from you about stepan trofimovitch you suggest an idea to me he may be useful at our literary matinee you know i'm arranging for a whole day of festivities a subscription entertainment for the benefit of the poor governesses of our province they are scattered about russia in our district alone we can reckon up six of them besides that there are two girls in the telegraph office two are being trained in the academy the rest would like to be but have not the means the russian woman's fate is a terrible one varvara petrovna it's out of that they're making the university question now and there's even been a meeting of the imperial council about it in this strange russia of ours one can do anything one likes and that again is why it's only by the kindness and the direct warm sympathy of all the better classes that we can direct this great common cause in the true path oh heavens have we many noble personalities among us there are some of course but they are scattered far and wide let us unite and we shall be stronger in one word i shall first have a literary matinee then a light luncheon then an interval and in the evening a ball 
we meant to begin the evening by living pictures but it would involve a great deal of expense and so to please the public there will be one or two quadrilles in masks and fancy dresses representing well-known literary schools this humorous idea was suggested by karmazinov he has been a great help to me you know he's going to read us the last thing he's written which no one has seen yet he is laying down the pen and will write no more this last essay is his farewell to the public it's a charming little thing called merci the title is french he thinks that more amusing and even subtler i do too in fact i advised it i think stepan trofimovitch might read us something too if it were quite short and not so very learned i believe pyotr stepanovitch and some one else too will read something pyotr stepanovitch shall run round to you and tell you the programme better still let me bring it to you myself allow me to put my name down in your subscription list too i'll tell stepan trofimovitch and will beg him to consent varvara petrovna returned home completely fascinated she was ready to stand up for yulia mihailovna through thick and thin and for some reason was already quite put out with stepan trofimovitch while he poor man sat at home all unconscious i'm in love with her i can't understand how i could be so mistaken in that woman she said to nikolai vsyevolodovitch and pyotr stepanovitch who dropped in that evening but you must make peace with the old man all the same pyotr stepanovitch submitted he's in despair you've quite sent him to coventry yesterday he met your carriage and bowed and you turned away we'll trot him out you know i'm reckoning on him for something and he may still be useful oh he'll read something i don't mean only that and i was meaning to drop in on him to-day so shall i tell him if you like i don't know though how you'll arrange it she said irresolutely i was meaning to have a talk with him myself and wanted to fix the time and place she frowned oh it's not worth while fixing a time i'll simply give him the message very well do add that i certainly will fix a time to see him though be sure to say that too pyotr stepanovitch ran off grinning he was in fact to the best of my recollection particularly spiteful all this time and ventured upon extremely impatient sallies with almost every one strange to say every one somehow forgave him it was generally accepted that he was not to be looked at from the ordinary standpoint i may remark that he took up an extremely resentful attitude about nikolai vsyevolodovitch's duel it took him unawares he turned positively green when he was told of it perhaps his vanity was wounded he only heard of it next day when every one knew of it you had no right to fight you know he whispered to stavrogin five days later when he chanced to meet him at the club it was remarkable that they had not once met during those five days though pyotr stepanovitch had dropped in at varvara petrovna's almost every day nikolai vsyevolodovitch looked at him in silence with an absent-minded air as though not understanding what was the matter and he went on without stopping he was crossing the big hall of the club on his way to the refreshment room you've been to see shatov too you mean to make it known about marya timofyevna pyotr stepanovitch muttered running after him and as though not thinking of what he was doing he clutched at his shoulder nikolai vsyevolodovitch shook his hand off and turned round quickly to him with a menacing scowl pyotr stepanovitch looked at him with a strange prolonged smile it all lasted only one moment nikolai vsyevolodovitch walked on End of Part 2, Chapter 4, Section 1 Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine Part 2, Chapter 4, Section 2 Of The Possessed by Fyodor Dostoevsky Translated by Constance Garnett This LibriVox recording is in the public domain Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine Chapter 4 all in expectation section two he went to the old man straight from varvara petrovna's and he was in such haste simply from spite that he might revenge himself for an insult of which i had no idea at that time the fact is that at their last interview on the thursday of the previous week stepan trofimovitch though the dispute was one of his own beginning had ended by turning pyotr stepanovitch out with his stick he concealed the incident from me at the time but now as soon as pyotr stepanovitch ran in with his everlasting grin 
which was so naively condescending and his unpleasantly inquisitive eyes peering into every corner stepan trofimovitch at once made a signal aside to me not to leave the room this was how their real relations came to be exposed before me for on this occasion i heard their whole conversation stepan trofimovitch was sitting stretched out on a lounge he had grown thin and sallow since that thursday pyotr stepanovitch seated himself beside him with a most familiar air unceremoniously tucking his legs up under him and taking up more room on the lounge than deference to his father should have allowed stepan trofimovitch moved aside in silence and with dignity on the table lay an open book it was the novel what's to be done alas i must confess one strange weakness in my friend the fantasy that he ought to come forth from his solitude and fight a last battle was getting more and more hold upon his deluded imagination i guessed that he had got the novel and was studying it solely in order that when the inevitable conflict with the shriekers came about he might know their methods and arguments beforehand from their very catechism and in that way be prepared to confute them all triumphantly before her eyes oh how that book tortured him he sometimes flung it aside in despair and leaping up paced about the room almost in a frenzy i agree that the author's fundamental idea is a true one he said to me feverishly but that only makes it more awful it's just our idea exactly ours we first sowed the seed nurtured it prepared the way and indeed what could they say new after us but heavens how it's all expressed distorted mutilated he exclaimed tapping the book with his fingers were these the conclusions we were striving for who can understand the original idea in this improving your mind sniggered pyotr stepanovitch taking the book from the table and reading the title it's high time i'll bring you better if you like stepan trofimovitch again preserved a dignified silence i was sitting on a sofa in the corner pyotr stepanovitch quickly explained the reason of his coming of course stepan trofimovitch was absolutely staggered and he listened in alarm which was mixed with extreme indignation and that yulia mihailovna counts on my coming to read for her well they're by no means in such need of you on the contrary it's by way of an attention to you so as to make up to varvara petrovna but of course you won't dare to refuse and i expect you want to yourself he added with a grin you old fogies are all so devilishly ambitious but i say though you must look out that it's not too boring what have you got spanish history or what is it you'd better let me look at it three days beforehand or else you'll put us to sleep perhaps the hurried and too barefaced coarseness of these thrusts was obviously premeditated he affected to behave as though it were impossible to talk to stepan trofimovitch in different and more delicate language stepan trofimovitch resolutely persisted in ignoring his insults but what his son told him made a more and more overwhelming impression upon him and she she herself sent me this message through you he asked turning pale well you see she means to fix a time and place for a mutual explanation the relics of your sentimentalizing you've been coquetting with her for twenty years and have trained her to the most ridiculous habits but don't trouble yourself it's quite different now she keeps saying herself that she's only beginning now to have her eyes opened i told her in so many words that all this friendship of yours is nothing but a mutual pouring forth of sloppiness she told me lots my boy Phew! what a flunkey's place you've been filling all this time i positively blushed for you i filling a flunkey's place cried stepan trofimovitch unable to restrain himself worse you've been a parasite that is a voluntary flunkey too lazy to work while you've an appetite for money she too understands all that now it's awful the things she's been telling me about you anyway i did laugh my boy over your letters to her shameful and disgusting but you're all so depraved so depraved there's always something depraving in charity you're a good example of it she showed you my letters all though of course one couldn't read them all foo what a lot of paper you've covered i believe there are more than two thousand letters there and do you know old chap i believe there was one moment when she'd have been ready to marry you you let slip your chance in the silliest way 
of course i'm speaking from your point of view though anyway it would have been better than now when you've almost been married to cover another man's sins like a buffoon for a jest for money for money she she says it was for money stepan trofimovitch wailed in anguish what else then but of course i stood up for you that's your only line of defence you know she sees for herself that you needed money like every one else and that from that point of view maybe you were right i proved to her as clear as twice two makes four that it was a mutual bargain she was a capitalist and you were a sentimental buffoon in her service she's not angry about the money though you have milked her like a goat she's only in a rage at having believed in you for twenty years at your having so taken her in over these noble sentiments and made her tell lies for so long she never will admit that she told lies of herself but you'll catch it the more for that i can't make out how it was you didn't see that you'd have to have a day of reckoning for after all you had some sense i advised her yesterday to put you in an almshouse a genteel one don't disturb yourself there'll be nothing humiliating i believe that's what she'll do do you remember your last letter to me three weeks ago can you have shown her that cried stepan trofimovitch leaping up in horror rather first thing the one in which you told me she was exploiting you envious of your talent oh yes and that about other man's sins you've got a conceit though my boy how i did laugh as a rule your letters are very tedious you write a horrible style i often don't read them at all and i've one lying about to this day unopened i'll send it to you to-morrow but that one that last letter of yours was the tip-top of perfection how i did laugh oh how i laughed monster monster wailed stepan trofimovitch foo damn it all there's no talking to you i say you're getting huffy again as you were last thursday stepan trofimovitch drew himself up menacingly how dare you speak to me in such language what language it's simple and clear tell me you monster are you my son or not you know that best to be sure all fathers are disposed to be blind in such cases silence silence cried stepan trofimovitch shaking all over you see you're screaming and swearing at me as you did last thursday you tried to lift your stick against me but you know i found that document i was rummaging all the evening in my trunk from curiosity it's true there's nothing definite you can take that comfort it's only a letter of my mother's to that pole but to judge from her character another word and i'll box your ears what a set of people said pyotr stepanovitch suddenly addressing himself to me you see this is how we've been ever since last thursday i'm glad you're here this time anyway and can judge between us to begin with a fact he reproaches me for speaking like this of my mother but didn't he egg me on to it in petersburg before i left the high school didn't he wake me twice in the night to embrace me and cry like a woman and what do you suppose he talked to me about at night why the same modest anecdotes about my mother it was from him i first heard them oh i meant that in a higher sense oh you didn't understand me you understood nothing nothing but anyway it was meaner in you than in me meaner acknowledge that you see it's nothing to me if you like i'm speaking from your point of view don't worry about my point of view i don't blame my mother if it's you then it's you if it's a pole then it's a pole it's all the same to me i'm not to blame because you and she managed so stupidly in berlin as though you could have managed things better aren't you an absurd set after that and does it matter to you whether i'm your son or not listen he went on turning to me again he's never spent a penny on me all his life till i was sixteen he didn't know me at all afterwards he robbed me here and now he cries out that his heart has been aching over me all his life and carries on before me like an actor i'm not varvara petrovna mind you he got up and took his hat i curse you henceforth stepan trofimovitch as pale as death stretched out his hand above him ah, what folly a man will descend to cried pyotr stepanovitch actually surprised well good-bye old fellow i shall never come and see you again send me the article beforehand don't forget and try and let it be free from nonsense facts 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 and above all let it be short good-bye end of part two chapter four section two recording by expatriate in bangor maine
part two chapter four section three of the possessed by fyodor dostoevsky translated by constance garnett this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter four all in expectation section three outside influences too had come into play in the matter however fyodor stepanovitch certainly had some designs on his parent in my opinion he calculated upon reducing the old man to despair and so to driving him to some open scandal of a certain sort this was to serve some remote and quite other object of his own of which i shall speak hereafter all sorts of plans and calculations of this kind were swarming in masses in his mind at that time and almost all of course of a fantastic character he had designs on another victim besides stepan trofimovitch in fact as appeared afterwards his victims were not few in number but this one he reckoned upon particularly and it was mr von lemke himself andrey antonovitch von lemke belonged to that race so favoured by nature which is reckoned by hundreds of thousands at the russian census and is perhaps unconscious that it forms throughout its whole mass a strictly organised union and this union of course is not planned and premeditated but exists spontaneously in the whole race without words or agreements as a moral obligation consisting in mutual support given by all members of the race to one another at all times and places and under all circumstances andrey antonovitch had the honour of being educated in one of those more exalted russian educational institutions which are filled with the youth from families well provided with wealth or connections almost immediately on finishing their studies the pupils were appointed to rather important posts in one of the government departments andrey antonovitch had one uncle a colonel of engineers and another a baker but he managed to get into this aristocratic school and met many of his fellow countrymen in a similar position he was a good-humoured companion was rather stupid at his studies but always popular and when many of his companions in the upper forms chiefly russians had already learnt to discuss the loftiest modern questions and looked as though they were only waiting to leave school to settle the affairs of the universe andrey antonovitch was still absorbed in the most innocent schoolboy interests he amused them all it is true by his pranks which were of a very simple character at the most a little coarse but he made it his object to be funny at one time he would blow his nose in a wonderful way when the professor addressed a question to him thereby making his schoolfellows and the professor laugh another time in the dormitory he would act some indecent living picture to the general applause or he would play the overture to fra diavolo with his nose rather skilfully he was distinguished too by intentional untidiness thinking this for some reason witty in his very last year at school he began writing russian poetry of his native language he had only an ungrammatical knowledge like many of his race in russia this turn for versifying drew him to a gloomy and depressed schoolfellow the son of a poor russian general who was considered in the school to be a great future light in literature the latter patronized him but it happened that three years after leaving school this melancholy schoolfellow who had flung up his official career for the sake of russian literature and was consequently going about in torn boots with his teeth chattering with cold wearing a light summer overcoat in the late autumn met one day on the nanichin bridge his former protege lemka as he always used to be called at school and what do you suppose he did not at first recognize him and stood still in surprise before him stood an irreproachably dressed young man with wonderfully well-kept whiskers of a reddish hue with pince-nez with patent leather boots and the freshest of gloves in a full overcoat from charmer's and with a portfolio under his arm lemke was cordial to his old schoolfellow gave him his address and begged him to come and see him some evening it appeared too that he was by now not lemke but von lemke the schoolfellow came to see him however simply from malice perhaps on the staircase which was covered with red felt and was rather ugly and by no means smart he was met and questioned by the house porter a bell rang loudly upstairs 
but instead of the wealth which the visitor expected he found lemke in a very little side room which had a dark and dilapidated appearance partitioned into two by a large dark green curtain and furnished with very old though comfortable furniture with dark green blinds on high narrow windows von lemke lodged in the house of a very distant relation a general who was his patron he met his visitor cordially was serious and exquisitely polite they talked of literature too but kept within the bounds of decorum a manservant in a white tie brought them some weak tea and little dry round biscuits the schoolfellow from spite asked for some seltzer water it was given him but after some delays and lemke was somewhat embarrassed at having to summon the footman a second time and give him orders but of himself he asked his visitor whether he would like some supper and was obviously relieved when he refused and went away in short lemke was making his career and was living in dependence on his fellow-countryman the influential general he was at that time sighing for the general's fifth daughter and it seemed to him that his feeling was reciprocated but amalia was none the less married in due time to an elderly factory owner a german and an old comrade of the general's andrey antonovitch did not shed many tears but made a paper theatre the curtain drew up the actors came in and gesticulated with their arms there were spectators in the boxes the orchestra moved their bows across their fiddles by machinery the conductor waved his baton and in the stalls officers and dandies clapped their hands it was all made of cardboard it was all thought out and executed by lemke himself he spent six months over this theatre the general arranged a friendly party on purpose the theatre was exhibited all the general's five daughters including the newly married amalia with her factory owner numerous fraus and frauleins with their menfolk attentively examined and admired the theatre after which they danced lemke was much gratified and was quickly consoled the years passed by and his career was secured he always obtained good posts and always under chiefs of his own race and he worked his way up at last to a very fine position for a man of his age he had for a long time been wishing to marry and looking about him carefully without the knowledge of his superiors he had sent a novel to the editor of a magazine but it had not been accepted on the other hand he cut out a complete toy railway and again his creation was most successful passengers came on to the platform with bags and portmanteaux with dogs and children and got into the carriages the guards and porters moved away the bell was rung the signal was given and the train started off he was a whole year busy over this clever contrivance but he had to get married all the same the circle of his acquaintance was fairly wide chiefly in the world of his compatriots but his duties brought him into russian spheres also of course finally when he was in his thirty-ninth year he came in for a legacy his uncle the baker died and left him thirteen thousand roubles in his will the one thing needful was a suitable post in spite of the rather elevated style of his surroundings in the service mr von lemke was a very modest man he would have been perfectly satisfied with some independent little government post with a right to as much government timber as he liked or something snug of that sort and he would have been content all his life long but now instead of the minna or ernestine he had expected yulia mihailovna suddenly appeared on the scene his career was instantly raised to a more elevated plane the modest and precise man felt that he too was capable of ambition yulia mihailovna had a fortune of two hundred serfs to reckon in the old style and she had besides powerful friends on the other hand lemke was handsome and she was already over forty it is remarkable that he fell genuinely in love with her by degrees as he became more used to being betrothed to her on the morning of his wedding day he sent her a poem she liked all this very much even the poem it's no joke to be forty he was very quickly raised to a certain grade and received a certain order of distinction and then was appointed governor of our province before coming to us yulia mihailovna worked hard at moulding her husband in her opinion he was not without abilities he knew how to make an entrance and to appear to advantage he understood how to listen and be silent with profundity 
had acquired a quite distinguished deportment could make a speech indeed had even some odds and ends of thought and had caught the necessary gloss of modern liberalism what worried her however was that he was not very open to new ideas and after the long everlasting plodding for a career was unmistakably beginning to feel the need of repose she tried to infect him with her own ambition and he suddenly began making a toy church the pastor came out to preach the sermon the congregation listened with their hands before them one lady was drying her tears with her handkerchief one old gentleman was blowing his nose finally the organ pealed forth it had been ordered from switzerland and made expressly in spite of all expense yulia mihailovna in positive alarm carried off the whole structure as soon as she knew about it and locked it up in a box in her own room to make up for it she allowed him to write a novel on condition of its being kept secret from that time she began to reckon only upon herself unhappily there was a good deal of shallowness and lack of judgment in her attitude destiny had kept her too long an old maid now one idea after another fluttered through her ambitious and rather over-excited brain she cherished designs she positively desired to rule the province dreamed of becoming at once the centre of a circle adopted political sympathies von lemke was actually a little alarmed though with his official tact he quickly divined that he had no need at all to be uneasy about the government of the province itself the first two or three months passed indeed very satisfactorily but now pyotr stepanovitch had turned up and something queer began to happen the fact was that young verkovensky from the first step had displayed a flagrant lack of respect for andrey antonovitch and had assumed a strange right to dictate to him while yulia mikhailovna who had always till then been so jealous of her husband's dignity absolutely refused to notice it or at any rate attached no consequence to it the young man became a favourite ate drank and almost slept in the house von lemke tried to defend himself called him young man before other people and slapped him patronizingly on the shoulder but made no impression pyotr stepanovitch always seemed to be laughing in his face even when he appeared on the surface to be talking seriously to him and he would say the most startling things to him before company returning home one day he found the young man had installed himself in his study and was asleep on the sofa there uninvited he explained that he had come in and finding no one at home had had a good sleep von lemke was offended and again complained to his wife laughing at his irritability she observed tartly that he evidently did not know how to keep up his own dignity and that with her anyway the boy had never permitted himself any undue familiarity he was naive and fresh indeed though not regardful of the conventions of society von lemke sulked this time she made peace between them pyotr stepanovitch did not go so far as to apologize but got out of it with a coarse jest which might at another time have been taken for a fresh offence but was accepted on this occasion as a token of repentance the weak spot in andrey antonovitch's position was that he had blundered in the first instance by divulging the secret of his novel to him imagining him to be an ardent young man of poetic feeling and having long dreamed of securing a listener he had during the early days of their acquaintance on one occasion read aloud two chapters to him the young man had listened without disguising his boredom had rudely yawned had vouchsafed no word of praise but on leaving had asked for the manuscript that he might form an opinion of it at his leisure and andrey antonovitch had given it him he had not returned the manuscript since though he dropped in every day and had turned off all inquiries with a laugh afterwards he declared that he had lost it in the street at the time yulia mihailovna was terribly angry with her husband when she heard of it perhaps you told him about the church too she burst out almost in dismay von lemke unmistakably began to brood and brooding was bad for him and had been forbidden by the doctors apart from the fact that there were signs of trouble in the province of which we will speak later he had private reasons for brooding his heart was wounded not merely his official dignity when andrey antonovitch had entered upon married life he had never conceived the possibility of conjugal strife or dissension in the future it was inconsistent with the dreams he had cherished all his life of his minna or ernestine he felt that he was unequal to enduring domestic storms 
yulia mihailovna had an open explanation with him at last you can't be angry at this she said if only because you've still as much sense as he has and are immeasurably higher in the social scale the boy still preserves many traces of his old free-thinking habits i believe it's simply mischief but one can do nothing suddenly in a hurry you must do things by degrees we must make much of our young people i treat them with affection and hold them back from the brink but he says such dreadful things von lemke objected i can't behave tolerantly when he maintains in my presence and before other people that the government purposely drenches the people with vodka in order to brutalize them and so keep them from revolution fancy my position when i'm forced to listen to that before everyone as he said this von lemke recalled a conversation he had recently had with pyotr stepanovitch with the innocent object of displaying his liberal tendencies he had shown him his own private collection of every possible kind of manifesto russian and foreign which he had carefully collected since the year eighteen fifty nine not simply from a love of collecting but from a laudable interest in them pyotr stepanovitch seeing his object expressed the opinion that there was more sense in one line of some manifestos than in a whole government department not even excluding yours maybe lemke winced but this is premature among us premature he pronounced almost imploringly pointing to the manifestos no it's not premature you see you're afraid so it's not premature but here for instance is an incitement to destroy churches and why not you're a sensible man and of course you don't believe in it yourself but you know perfectly well that you need religion to brutalize the people truth is honester than falsehood i agree i agree i quite agree with you but it is premature premature in this country said von lemke frowning and how can you be an official of the government after that when you agree to demolishing churches and marching on petersburg armed with staves and make it all simply a question of date lemke was greatly put out at being so crudely caught it's not so not so at all he cried carried away and more and more mortified in his amour propre you're young and know nothing of our aims and that's why you're mistaken you see my dear pyotr stepanovitch you call us officials of the government don't you independent officials don't you but let me ask you how are we acting ours is the responsibility but in the long run we serve the cause of progress just as you do we only hold together what you are unsettling and what but for us would go to pieces in all directions we are not your enemies not a bit of it we say to you go forward progress you may even unsettle things that is things that are antiquated and in need of reform but we will keep you when need be within necessary limits and so save you from yourselves for without us you would set russia tottering robbing her of all external decency while our task is to preserve external decency understand that we are mutually essential to one another in england the whigs and tories are in the same way mutually essential to one another well you're whigs and we're tories that's how i look at it andrey antonovitch rose to positive eloquence he had been fond of talking in a liberal and intellectual style even in petersburg and the great thing here was that there was no one to play the spy on him pyotr stepanovitch was silent and maintained an unusually grave air this excited the orator more than ever do you know that i the person responsible for the province he went on walking about the study do you know that i have so many duties i can't perform one of them and on the other hand i can say just as truly that there's nothing for me to do here the whole secret of it is that everything depends upon the views of the government suppose the government were ever to found a republic from policy or to pacify public excitement and at the same time to increase the power of the governors then we governors would swallow up the republic and not the republic only anything you like will swallow up i at least feel that i am ready in one word if the government dictates to me by telegram activite devorant i'll supply activite devorant i told them here straight in their faces dear sirs to maintain the equilibrium and to develop all the provincial institutions one thing is essential the increase of the power of the governor you see it's necessary that all these institutions the zemstvos the law courts should have a twofold existence that is on the one hand it's necessary they should exist i agree that it is necessary 
on the other hand it's necessary that they shouldn't it's all according to the views of the government if the mood takes them so that institutions seem suddenly necessary i shall have them at once in readiness the necessity passes and no one will find them under my rule that's what i understand by activite devorant and you can't have it without an increase of the governor's power we're talking tete-a-tete -tete. you know i've already laid before the government in petersburg the necessity of a special sentinel before the governor's house i'm awaiting an answer you ought to have two pyotr stepanovitch commented why two said von lemke stopping short before him one's not enough to create respect for you you certainly ought to have two andrey antonovitch made a wry face you there's no limit to the liberties you take pyotr stepanovitch you take advantage of my good nature you say cutting things and play the part of a bourreau bienfaisant well that's as you please muttered pyotr stepanovitch anyway you pave the way for us and prepare for our success now who are we and what success said von lemke staring at him in surprise but he got no answer yulia mihailovna receiving a report of the conversation was greatly displeased but i can't exercise my official authority upon your favourite andrey antonovitch protested in self-defence especially when we're tete-a-tete -tete. i may say too much in the goodness of my heart from too much goodness of heart i didn't know you'd got a collection of manifestos be so good as to show them to me but he asked to have them for one day and you've let him have them again cried yulia mihailovna getting angry how tactless i'll send someone to him at once to get them he won't give them up i'll insist on it cried von lemke boiling over and he jumped up from his seat who's he that we should be so afraid of him and who am i that i shouldn't dare to do anything sit down and calm yourself said yulia mihailovna checking him i will answer your first question he came to me with the highest recommendations he's talented and sometimes says extremely clever things karmazinov tells me that he has connections almost everywhere and extraordinary influence over the younger generation in petersburg and moscow and if through him i can attract them all and group them round myself i shall be saving them from perdition by guiding them into a new outlet for their ambitions he's devoted to me with his whole heart and is guided by me in everything but while they're being petted the devil knows what they may not do of course it's an idea said von lemke vaguely defending himself but but here i've heard that manifestos of some sort have been found in x district but there was a rumour of that in the summer manifestos false banknotes and all the rest of it but they haven't found one of them so far who told you i heard it from von blum ah oh, don't talk to me of your blum don't ever dare mention him again yulia mihailovna flew into a rage and for a moment could not speak von blum was a clerk in the governor's office whom she particularly hated of that later please don't worry yourself about verkovensky she said in conclusion if he had taken part in any mischief he wouldn't talk as he does to you and every one else here talkers are not dangerous and i will even go so far as to say that if anything were to happen i should be the first to hear of it through him he's quite fanatically devoted to me i will observe anticipating events that had it not been for yulia mihailovna's obstinacy and self-conceit probably nothing of all the mischief these wretched people succeeded in bringing about amongst us would have happened she was responsible for a great deal end of part two chapter four section three recording by expatriate in bangor maine part two chapter five section one of the possessed by fyodor dostoevsky translated by constance garnett this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter five on the eve of the fete section one the date of the fete which yulia mihailovna was getting up for the benefit of the governesses of our province had been several times fixed and put off she had invariably bustling round her pyotr stepanovitch and a little clerk lyamshin who used at one time to visit stepan trofimovitch and had suddenly found favour in the governor's house for the way he played the piano and now was of use running errands 
liputin was there a good deal too and yulia mihailovna destined him to be the editor of a new independent provincial paper there were also several ladies married and single and lastly even karmazinov who though he could not be said to bustle announced aloud with a complacent air that he would agreeably astonish every one when the literary quadrille began an extraordinary multitude of donors and subscribers had turned up all the select society of the town but even the unselect were admitted if only they produced the cash yulia mihailovna observed that sometimes it was a positive duty to allow the mixing of classes for otherwise who is to enlighten them a private drawing-room committee was formed at which it was decided that the fete was to be of a democratic character the enormous list of subscriptions tempted them to lavish expenditure they wanted to do something on a marvellous scale that's why it was put off they were still undecided where the ball was to take place whether in the immense house belonging to the marshal's wife which she was willing to give up to them for the day or at varvara petrovna's mansion at skvoreshniki it was rather a distance to skvoreshniki but many of the committee were of opinion that it would be freer there varvara petrovna would dearly have liked it to have been in her house it's difficult to understand why this proud woman seemed almost making up to yulia mihailovna probably what pleased her was that the latter in her turn seemed almost fawning upon nikolai vsyevolodovitch and was more gracious to him than to any one i repeat again that pyotr stepanovitch was always in continual whispers strengthening in the governor's household an idea he had insinuated there already that nikolai vsyevolodovitch was a man who had very mysterious connections with very mysterious circles and that he had certainly come here with some commission from them people here seemed in a strange state of mind at the time among the ladies especially a sort of frivolity was conspicuous and it could not be said to be a gradual growth certain very free and easy notions seemed to be in the air there was a sort of dissipated gaiety and levity and i can't say it was always quite pleasant a lax way of thinking was the fashion afterwards when it was all over people blamed yulia mihailovna her circle her attitude but it can hardly have been altogether due to yulia mihailovna on the contrary at first many people vied with one another in praising the new governor's wife for her success in bringing local society together and for making things more lively several scandalous incidents took place for which yulia mihailovna was in no way responsible but at the time people were amused and did nothing but laugh and there was no one to check them a rather large group of people it is true held themselves aloof and had views of their own on the course of events but even these made no complaint at the time they smiled in fact i remember that a fairly large circle came into existence as it were spontaneously the centre of which perhaps was really to be found in yulia mihailovna's drawing-room in this intimate circle which surrounded her among the younger members of it of course it was considered admissible to play all sorts of pranks sometimes rather free and easy ones and in fact such conduct became a principle among them in this circle there were even some very charming ladies the young people arranged picnics and even parties and sometimes went about the town in a regular cavalcade in carriages and on horseback they sought out adventures even got them up themselves simply for the sake of having an amusing story to tell they treated our town as though it were a sort of glupov people called them the jeerers or sneerers because they did not stick at anything it happened for instance that the wife of a local lieutenant a little brunette very young though she looked worn out from her husband's ill-treatment at an evening party thoughtlessly sat down to play whist for high stakes in the fervent hope of winning enough to buy herself a mantle and instead of winning lost fifteen roubles being afraid of her husband and having no means of paying she plucked up the courage of former days and ventured on the sly to ask for a loan on the spot at the party from the son of our mayor a very nasty youth precociously vicious the latter not only refused it but went laughing aloud to tell her husband the lieutenant who certainly was poor with nothing but his salary took his wife home and avenged himself upon her to his heart's content in spite of her shrieks wails and entreaties on her knees for forgiveness 
this revolting story excited nothing but mirth all over the town and though the poor wife did not belong to yulia mihailovna's circle one of the ladies of the cavalcade an eccentric and adventurous character who happened to know her drove round and simply carried her off to her own house here she was at once taken up by our madcaps made much of loaded with presents and kept for four days without being sent back to her husband she stayed at the adventurous ladies all day long drove about with her and all the sportive company in expeditions about the town and took part in dances and merry-making they kept egging her on to haul her husband before the court and to make a scandal they declared that they would all support her and would come and bear witness the husband kept quiet not daring to oppose them the poor thing realized at last that she had got into a hopeless position and more dead than alive with fright on the fourth day she ran off in the dusk from her protectors to her lieutenant it's not definitely known what took place between husband and wife but two shutters of the low-pitched little house in which the lieutenant lodged were not open for a fortnight yulia mihailovna was angry with the mischief-makers when she heard about it all and was greatly displeased with the conduct of the adventurous lady though the latter had presented the lieutenant's wife to her on the day she carried her off however this was soon forgotten another time a petty clerk a respectable head of a family married his daughter a beautiful girl of seventeen known to every one in the town to another petty clerk a young man who came from a different district but suddenly it was learned that the young husband had treated the beauty very roughly on the wedding night chastising her for what he regarded as a stain on his honour lyamshin who was almost a witness of the affair because he got drunk at the wedding and so stayed the night as soon as the day dawned ran round with the diverting intelligence instantly a party of a dozen was made up all of them on horseback some on hired cossack horses pyotr stepanovitch for instance and liputin who in spite of his grey hairs took part in almost every scandalous adventure of our reckless youngsters when the young couple appeared in the street in a droshky with a pair of horses to make the calls which are obligatory in our town on the day after a wedding in spite of anything that may happen the whole cavalcade with merry laughter surrounded the droshky and followed them about the town all the morning they did not it's true go into the house but waited for them outside on horseback they refrained from marked insult to the bride or bridegroom but still they caused a scandal the whole town began talking of it every one laughed of course but at this von lemke was angry and again had a lively scene with yulia mihailovna she too was extremely angry and formed the intention of turning the scapegraces out of her house but next day she forgave them all after persuasions from pyotr stepanovitch and some words from karmazinov who considered the affair rather amusing it's in harmony with the traditions of the place he said anyway it's characteristic and bold look everyone's laughing you're the only person indignant but there were pranks of a certain character that were absolutely past endurance a respectable woman of the artisan class who went about selling gospels came into the town people talked about her because some interesting references to these gospel women had just appeared in the petersburg papers again the same buffoon lyamshin with the help of a divinity student who was taking a holiday while waiting for a post in the school succeeded on the pretence of buying books from the gospel woman in thrusting into her bag a whole bundle of indecent and obscene photographs from abroad sacrificed expressly for the purpose as we learned afterwards by a highly respectable old gentleman i will omit his name with an order on his breast who to use his own words loved a healthy laugh and a merry jest when the poor woman went to take out the holy books in the bazaar the photographs were scattered about the place there were roars of laughter and murmurs of indignation a crowd collected began abusing her and would have come to blows if the police had not arrived in the nick of time the gospel woman was taken to the lock-up and only in the evening thanks to the efforts of mavriky nikolaevitch who had learned with indignation the secret details of this loathsome affair she was released and escorted out of the town at this point yulia mihailovna would certainly have forbidden lyamshin her house but that very evening the whole circle brought him to her with the intelligence that he had just composed a new piece for the piano and persuaded her at least to hear it 
the piece turned out to be really amusing and bore the comic title of the franco-prussian war it began with the menacing strains of the marseillaise con son ampour abruv nos sillons there is heard the pompous challenge the intoxication of future victories but suddenly mingling with the masterly variations on the national hymn somewhere from some corner quite close on one side come the vulgar strains of mein lieber augustin the marseillaise goes on unconscious of them the marseillaise is at the climax of its intoxication with its own grandeur but augustin gains strength augustin grows more and more insolent and suddenly the melody of augustin begins to blend with the melody of the marseillaise the latter begins as it were to get angry becoming aware of augustine at last she tries to fling him off to brush him aside like a tiresome insignificant fly but mein lieber augustine holds his ground firmly he is cheerful and self-confident he is gleeful and impudent and the marseillaise seems suddenly to become terribly stupid she can no longer conceal her anger and mortification it is a wail of indignation tears and curses with hands outstretched to providence pas un pouce de notre terrain pas une de nos forteresses but she is forced to sing in time with mein lieber augustine her melody passes in a sort of foolish way into augustine she yields and dies away and only by snatches there is heard again consung ampour but at once it passes very offensively into the vulgar waltz she submits altogether it is jules favre sobbing on bismarck's bosom and surrendering everything but at this point augustine too grows fierce hoarse sounds are heard there is a suggestion of countless gallons of beer of a frenzy of self-glorification demands for millions for fine cigars champagne and hostages augustine passes into a wild yell the franco-prussian war is over our circle applauded yulia mihailovna smiled and said now how is one to turn him out peace was made the rascal really had talent stepan trofimovitch assured me on one occasion that the very highest artistic talents may exist in the most abominable blackguards and that the one thing does not interfere with the other there was a rumour afterwards that lyamshin had stolen this burlesque from a talented and modest young man of his acquaintance whose name remained unknown but this is beside the mark this worthless fellow who had hung about stepan trofimovitch for years who used at his evening parties when invited to mimic jews of various types a deaf peasant woman making her confession or the birth of a child now at yulia mihailovna's caricatured stepan trofimovitch himself in a killing way under the title of a liberal of the forties everybody shook with laughter so that in the end it was quite impossible to turn him out he had become too necessary a person besides he fawned upon pyotr stepanovitch in a slavish way and he in his turn had obtained by this time a strange and unaccountable influence over yulia mihailovna i wouldn't have talked about this scoundrel and indeed he would not be worth dwelling upon but there was another revolting story so people declare in which he had a hand in this story i cannot omit from my record one morning the news of a hideous and revolting sacrilege was all over the town at the entrance to our immense market-place there stands the ancient church of our lady's nativity which was a remarkable antiquity in our ancient town at the gates of the precincts there is a large icon of the mother of god fixed behind a grating in the wall and behold one night the icon had been robbed the glass of the case was broken the grating was smashed and several stones and pearls i don't know whether they were very precious ones had been removed from the crown in the setting but what was worse besides the theft a senseless scoffing sacrilege had been perpetrated behind the broken glass of the icon they found in the morning so it was said a live mouse now four months since it has been established beyond doubt that the crime was committed by the convict fedka but for some reason it is added that lyamshin took part in it at the time no one spoke of lyamshin or had any suspicion of him but now every one says it was he who put the mouse there i remember all our responsible officials were rather staggered a crowd thronged round the scene of the crime from early morning there was a crowd continually before it not a very huge one but always about a hundred people some coming and some going 
as they approached they crossed themselves and bowed down to the ikon they began to give offerings and a church dish made its appearance and with the dish a monk but it was only about three o'clock in the afternoon it occurred to the authorities that it was possible to prohibit the crowd standing about and to command them when they had prayed bowed down and left their offerings to pass on upon von lemke this unfortunate incident made the gloomiest impression as i was told yulia mikhailovna said afterwards it was from this ill-omened morning that she first noticed in her husband that strange depression which persisted in him until he left our province on account of illness two months ago and i believe haunts him still in switzerland where he has gone for a rest after his brief career amongst us i remember at one o'clock in the afternoon i crossed the market-place the crowd was silent and their faces solemn and gloomy a merchant fat and sallow drove up got out of his carriage made a bow to the ground kissed the ikon offered a rouble sighing got back into his carriage and drove off another carriage drove up with two ladies accompanied by two of our scapegraces the young people one of whom was not quite young got out of their carriage too and squeezed their way up to the ikon pushing people aside rather carelessly neither of the young men took off his hat and one of them put a pince-nez on his nose in the crowd there was a murmur vague but unfriendly the dandy with a pince-nez took out of his purse which was stuffed full of banknotes a copper farthing and flung it into the dish both laughed and talking loudly went back to their carriage at that moment lizaveta nikolaevna galloped up escorted by mavriky nikolaevitch she jumped off her horse flung the reins to her companion who at her bidding remained on his horse and approached the ikon at the very moment when the farthing had been flung down a flush of indignation suffused her cheeks she took off her round hat and her gloves fell straight on her knees before the ikon on the muddy pavement and reverently bowed down three times to the earth then she took out her purse but as it appeared she had only a few small coins in it she instantly took off her diamond earrings and put them in the dish may i may i for the adornment of the setting she asked the monk it is permitted replied the latter every gift is good the crowd was silent expressing neither dissent nor approval liza got on her horse again in her muddy riding habit and galloped away End of part two, chapter five, section one. Recording by expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Part two, chapter five, section two of The Possessed by Fyodor Dostoevsky. Translated by Constance Garnett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Chapter five, on the eve of the fete section two two days after the incident i have described i met her in a numerous company who were driving out on some expedition in three coaches surrounded by others on horseback she beckoned to me stopped her carriage and pressingly urged me to join their party a place was found for me in the carriage and she laughingly introduced me to her companions gorgeously attired ladies and explained to me that they were all going on a very interesting expedition she was laughing and seemed somewhat excessively happy just lately she had been very lively even playful in fact the expedition was certainly an eccentric one they were all going to a house the other side of the river to the merchant sevastyanov's in the lodge of this merchant's house our saint and prophet semyon yakovlevitch who was famous not only amongst us but in the surrounding provinces and even in petersburg and moscow had been living for the last ten years in retirement ease and comfort every one went to see him especially visitors to the neighbourhood extracting from him some crazy utterance bowing down to him and leaving an offering these offerings were sometimes considerable and if semyon yakovlevitch did not himself assign them to some other purpose were piously sent to some church or more often to the monastery of our lady a monk from the monastery was always in waiting upon semyon yakovlevitch with this object all were in expectation of great amusement no one of the party had seen semyon yakovlevitch before except lyamshin 
who declared that the saint had given orders that he should be driven out with a broom and had with his own hand flung two big baked potatoes after him among the party i noticed pyotr stepanovitch again riding a hired cossack horse on which he sat extremely badly and nikolai vsyevolodovitch also on horseback the latter did not always hold aloof from social diversions and on such occasions always wore an air of gaiety although as always he spoke little and seldom when our party had crossed the bridge and reached the hotel of the town some one suddenly announced that in one of the rooms of the hotel they had just found a traveller who had shot himself and were expecting the police at once the suggestion was made that they should go and look at the suicide the idea met with approval our ladies had never seen a suicide i remember one of them said aloud on the occasion everything's so boring one can't be squeamish over one's amusements as long as they're interesting only a few of them remained outside the others went in a body into the dirty corridor and amongst the others i saw to my amazement lizaveta nikolaevna the door of the room was open and they did not of course dare to prevent our going in to look at the suicide he was quite a young lad not more than nineteen he must have been very good-looking with thick fair hair with a regular oval face and a fine pure forehead the body was already stiff and his white young face looked like marble on the table lay a note in his handwriting to the effect that no one was to blame for his death that he had killed himself because he had squandered four hundred roubles the word squandered was used in the letter in the four lines of his letter there were three mistakes in spelling a stout country gentleman evidently a neighbour who had been staying in the hotel on some business of his own was particularly distressed about it from his words it appeared that the boy had been sent by his family that is a widowed mother sisters and aunts from the country to the town in order that under the supervision of a female relation in the town he might purchase and take home with him various articles for the trousseau of his eldest sister who was going to be married the family had with sighs of apprehension entrusted him with the four hundred roubles the savings of ten years and had sent him on his way with exhortations prayers and signs of the cross the boy had till then been well behaved and trustworthy arriving three days before at the town he had not gone to his relations had put up at the hotel and gone straight to the club in the hope of finding in some back room a travelling banker or at least some game of cards for money but that evening there was no banker there or gambling going on going back to the hotel about midnight he asked for champagne havana cigars and ordered a supper of six or seven dishes but the champagne made him drunk and the cigar made him sick so that he did not touch the food when it was brought to him and went to bed almost unconscious waking next morning as fresh as an apple he went at once to the gypsies camp which was in a suburb beyond the river and of which he had heard the day before at the club he did not reappear at the hotel for two days at last at five o'clock in the afternoon of the previous day he had returned drunk had at once gone to bed and had slept till ten o'clock in the evening on waking up he had asked for a cutlet a bottle of chateau de Quim, and some grapes paper and ink and his bill no one noticed anything special about him he was quiet gentle and friendly he must have shot himself at about midnight though it was strange that no one had heard the shot and they only raised the alarm at midday when after knocking in vain they had broken in the door the bottle of chateau de quem was half empty there was half a plateful of grapes left too the shot had been fired from a little three-chambered revolver straight into the heart very little blood had flowed the revolver had dropped from his hand onto the carpet the boy himself was half lying in a corner of the sofa death must have been instantaneous there was no trace of the anguish of death in the face the expression was serene almost happy as though there were no cares in his life all our party stared at him with greedy curiosity in every misfortune of one's neighbour there is always something cheering for an onlooker whoever he may be our ladies gazed in silence their companions distinguished themselves by their wit and their superb equanimity one observed that his was the best way out of it 
and that the boy could not have hit upon anything more sensible another observed that he had had a good time if only for a moment a third suddenly blurted out the inquiry why people had begun hanging and shooting themselves among us of late as though they had suddenly lost their roots as though the ground were giving way under every one's feet people looked coldly at this raisonneur then lyamshin who prided himself on playing the fool took a bunch of grapes from the plate another laughing followed his example and a third stretched out his hand for the chateau de Quem. but the head of police arriving checked him and even ordered that the room should be cleared as every one had seen all they wanted they went out without disputing although lyamshin began pestering the police captain about something the general merry-making laughter and playful talk were twice as lively on the latter half of the way we arrived at semyon yakovlevitch's just at one o'clock the gate of the rather large house stood unfastened and the approach to the lodge was open we learnt at once that semyon yakovlevitch was dining but was receiving guests the whole crowd of us went in the room in which the saint dined and received visitors had three windows and was fairly large it was divided into two equal parts by a wooden lattice-work partition which ran from wall to wall and was three or four feet high ordinary visitors remained on the outside of this partition but lucky ones were by the saint's invitation admitted through the partition doors into his half of the room and if so disposed he made them sit down on the sofa or on his old leather chairs he himself invariably sat in an old-fashioned shabby voltaire armchair he was a rather big bloated-looking yellow-faced man of five-and-fifty with a bald head and scanty flaxen hair he wore no beard his right cheek was swollen and his mouth seemed somehow twisted awry he had a large wart on the left side of his nose narrow eyes and a calm stolid sleepy expression he was dressed in european style in a black coat but had no waistcoat or tie a rather coarse but white shirt peeped out below his coat there was something the matter with his feet i believe and he kept them in slippers i've heard that he had at one time been a clerk and received a rank in the service he had just finished some fish soup and was beginning his second dish of potatoes in their skins eaten with salt he never ate anything else but he drank a great deal of tea of which he was very fond three servants provided by the merchant were running to and fro about him one of them was in a swallow-tail the second looked like a workman and the third like a verger there was also a very lively boy of sixteen besides the servants there was present holding a jug a reverend grey-headed monk who was a little too fat on one of the tables a huge samovar was boiling and a tray with almost two dozen glasses was standing near it on another table opposite offerings had been placed some loaves and also some pounds of sugar two pounds of tea a pair of embroidered slippers a foulard handkerchief a length of cloth a piece of linen and so on money offerings almost all went into the monk's jug the room was full of people at least a dozen visitors of whom two were sitting with semyon yakovlevitch on the other side of the partition one was a grey-headed old pilgrim of the peasant class and the other a little dried-up monk who sat demurely with his eyes cast down the other visitors were all standing on the near side of the partition and were mostly two of the peasant class except one elderly and poverty-stricken lady one landowner and a stout merchant who had come from the district town a man with a big beard dressed in the russian style though he was known to be worth a hundred thousand all were waiting for their chance not daring to speak of themselves four were on their knees but the one who attracted most attention was the landowner a stout man of forty-five kneeling right at the partition more conspicuous than any one waiting reverently for a propitious word or look from semyon yakovlevitch he had been there for about an hour already but the saint still did not notice him our ladies crowded right up to the partition whispering gaily and laughingly together they pushed aside or got in front of all the other visitors even those on their knees except the landowner who remained obstinately in his prominent position even holding on to the partition merry and greedily inquisitive eyes were turned upon semyon yakovlevitch 
as well as lorgnettes pince-nez and even opera-glasses lyamshin at any rate looked through an opera-glass semyon yakovlevitch calmly and lazily scanned all with his little eyes milovzors milovzors he deigned to pronounce in a hoarse bass and slightly staccato all our party laughed what's the meaning of milovzors but semyon yakovlevitch relapsed into silence and finished his potatoes presently he wiped his lips with his napkin and they handed him tea as a rule he did not take tea alone but poured out some for his visitors but by no means for all usually pointing himself to those he wished to honour and his choice always surprised people by its unexpectedness passing by the wealthy and the high-placed he sometimes pitched upon a peasant or some decrepit old woman another time he would pass over the beggars to honour some fat wealthy merchant tea was served differently too to different people sugar was put into some of the glasses and handed separately with others while some got it without any sugar at all this time the favoured one was the monk sitting by him who had sugar put in and the old pilgrim to whom it was given without any sugar the fat monk with the jug from the monastery for some reason had none handed to him at all though up till then he had had his glass every day semyon yakovlevitch do say something to me i've been longing to make your acquaintance for ever so long carolled the gorgeously dressed lady from our carriage screwing up her eyes and smiling she was the lady who had observed that one must not be squeamish about one's amusements so long as they were interesting semyon yakovlevitch did not even look at her the kneeling landowner uttered a deep sonorous sigh like the sound of a big pair of bellows with sugar in it said semyon yakovlevitch suddenly pointing to the wealthy merchant the latter moved forward and stood beside the kneeling gentleman some more sugar for him ordered semyon yakovlevitch after the glass had already been poured out they put some more in more more for him more was put in a third time and again a fourth the merchant began submissively drinking his syrup heavens whispered the people crossing themselves the kneeling gentleman again heaved a deep sonorous sigh father semyon yakovlevitch the voice of the poor lady rang out all at once plaintively though so sharply that it was startling our party had shoved her back to the wall a whole hour dear father i've been waiting for grace speak to me consider my grace and my helplessness ask her said semyon yakovlevitch to the verger who went to the partition have you done what semyon yakovlevitch bade you last time he asked the widow in a soft and measured voice done it father semyon yakovlevitch how can one do it with them wailed the widow they're cannibals they are lodging a complaint against me in the court they threaten to take it to the senate that's how they treat their own mother give her semyon yakovlevitch pointed to a sugar loaf the boy skipped up seized the sugar loaf and dragged it to the widow ah father great is your merciful kindness what am i to do with so much wailed the widow more more said semyon yakovlevitch lavishly they dragged her another sugar loaf more more the saint commanded they took her a third and finally a fourth the widow was surrounded with sugar on all sides the monk from the monastery sighed all this might have gone to the monastery that day as it had done on former occasions what am i to do with so much the widow sighed obsequiously it's enough to make one person sick is it some sort of a prophecy father be sure it's by way of a prophecy said someone in the crowd another pound for her another semyon yakovlevitch persisted there was a whole sugar loaf still on the table but the saint ordered a pound to be given and they gave her a pound lord have mercy on us gasped the people crossing themselves it's surely a prophecy sweeten your heart for the future with mercy and loving-kindness and then come to make complaints against your own children bone of your bone that's what we must take this emblem to mean the stout monk from the monastery who had had no tea given to him said softly but self-complacently taking upon himself the role of interpreter in an access of wounded vanity what are you saying father cried the widow suddenly infuriated why they dragged me into the fire with a rope round me when the verhitian's house was burnt and they locked up a dead cat in my chest 
they are ready to do any villainy away with her away with her semyon yakovlevitch said suddenly waving his hands the verger and the boy dashed through the partition the verger took the widow by the arm and without resisting she trailed to the door keeping her eyes fixed on the loaves of sugar that had been bestowed on her which the boy dragged after her one to be taken away take it away semyon yakovlevitch commanded to the servant like a workman who remained with him the latter rushed after the retreating woman and the three servants returned somewhat later bringing back one loaf of sugar which had been presented to the widow and now taken away from her she carried off three however semyon yakovlevitch said a voice at the door i dreamt of a bird a jackdaw it flew out of the water and flew into the fire what does the dream mean frost semyon yakovlevitch pronounced semyon yakovlevitch why don't you answer me all this time i've been interested in you ever so long the lady of our party began again ask him said semyon yakovlevitch not heeding her but pointing to the kneeling gentleman the monk from the monastery to whom the order was given moved sedately to the kneeling figure how have you sinned and was not some command laid upon you not to fight not to give the rein to my hands answered the kneeling gentleman hoarsely have you obeyed asked the monk i cannot obey my own strength gets the better of me away with him away with him with a broom with a broom cried semyon yakovlevitch waving his hands the gentleman rushed out of the room without waiting for this penalty he's left a gold piece where he knelt observed the monk picking up a half imperial for him said the saint pointing to the rich merchant the latter dared not refuse it and took it gold to gold the monk from the monastery could not refrain from saying and give him some with sugar in it said the saint pointing to mavriky nikolaevitch the servant poured out the tea and took it by mistake to the dandy with a pince-nez the long one the long one semyon yakovlevitch corrected him mavriky nikolaevitch took the glass made a military half bow and began drinking it i don't know why but all our party burst into peals of laughter mavriky nikolaevitch cried liza addressing him suddenly that kneeling gentleman has gone away you kneel down in his place mavriky nikolaevitch looked at her in amazement i beg you to you'll do me the greatest favour listen mavriky nikolaevitch she went on speaking in an emphatic obstinate excited and rapid voice you must kneel down i must see you kneel down if you won't don't come near me i insist i insist i don't know what she meant by it but she insisted upon it relentlessly as though she were in a fit mavriky nikolaevitch as we shall see later set down these capricious impulses which had been particularly frequent of late to outbreaks of blind hatred for him not due to spite for on the contrary she esteemed him loved him and respected him and he knew that himself but from a peculiar unconscious hatred which at times she could not control in silence he gave his cup to an old woman standing behind him opened the door of the partition and without being invited stepped into semyon yakovlevitch's private apartment and knelt down in the middle of the room in sight of all i imagine that he was deeply shocked in his candid and delicate heart by liza's coarse and mocking freak before the whole company perhaps he imagined that she would feel ashamed of herself seeing his humiliation on which she had so insisted of course no one but he would have dreamt of bringing a woman to reason by so naive and risky a proceeding he remained kneeling with his imperturbable gravity long tall awkward and ridiculous but our party did not laugh the unexpectedness of the action produced a painful shock everyone looked at liza anoint anoint muttered semyon yakovlevitch liza suddenly turned white cried out and rushed through the partition then a rapid and hysterical scene followed she began pulling mavriky nikolaevitch up with all her might tugging at his elbows with both hands get up get up she screamed as though she were crazy get up at once at once how dare you mavriky nikolaevitch got up from his knees she clutched his arms above the elbow and looked intently into his face there was terror in her expression milos vors milos vors semyon yakovlevitch repeated again 
she dragged mavriky nikolaevitch back to the other part of the room at last there was some commotion in all our company the lady from our carriage probably intending to relieve the situation loudly and shrilly asked the saint for the third time with an affected smile well semyon yakovlevitch won't you utter some saying for me i've been reckoning so much on you out with the out with the said semyon yakovlevitch suddenly addressing her with an extremely indecent word the words were uttered savagely and with horrifying distinctness our lady shrieked and rushed headlong away while the gentlemen escorting them burst into homeric laughter so ended our visit to semyon yakovlevitch at this point however there took place i am told an extremely enigmatic incident and i must own it was chiefly on account of it that i have described this expedition so minutely i am told that when all flocked out liza supported by mavriky nikolaevitch was jostled against nikolai vsyevolodovitch in the crush in the doorway i must mention that since that sunday morning when she fainted they had not approached each other nor exchanged a word though they had met more than once i saw them brought together in the doorway i fancied they both stood still for an instant and looked as it were strangely at one another but i may not have seen rightly in the crowd it is asserted on the contrary and quite seriously that liza glancing at nikolai vsyevolodovitch quickly raised her hand to the level of his face and would certainly have struck him if he had not drawn back in time perhaps she was displeased with the expression of his face or the way he smiled particularly just after such an episode with mavriky nikolaevitch i must admit i saw nothing myself but all the others declared they had though they certainly could not all have seen it in such a crush though perhaps some may have but i did not believe it at the time i remember however that nikolai vsyevolodovitch was rather pale all the way home end of part two chapter five section two recording by expatriate in bangor maine part two chapter five section three of the possessed by fyodor dostoevsky translated by constance garnett this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter five on the eve of the fete section three almost at the same time and certainly on the same day the interview at last took place between stepan trofimovitch and varvara petrovna she had long had this meeting in her mind and had sent word about it to her former friend but for some reason she had kept putting it off till then it took place at skvoreshniki varvara petrovna arrived at her country house all in a bustle it had been definitely decided the evening before that the fete was to take place at the marshal's but varvara petrovna's rapid brain at once grasped that no one could prevent her from afterwards giving her own special entertainment at skvoreshniki and again assembling the whole town then every one could see for themselves whose house was best and in which more taste was displayed in receiving guests and giving a ball altogether she was hardly to be recognized she seemed completely transformed and instead of the unapproachable noble lady stepan trofimovitch's expression seemed changed into the most commonplace whimsical society woman but perhaps this may only have been on the surface when she reached the empty house she had gone through all the rooms accompanied by her faithful old butler alexey yegoritch and by fomushka a man who had seen much of life and was a specialist in decoration they began to consult and deliberate what furniture was to be brought from the town house what things what pictures where they were to be put how the conservatories and flowers could be put to the best use where to put new curtains where to have the refreshment rooms whether one or two and so on and so on and behold in the midst of this exciting bustle she suddenly took it into her head to send for stepan trofimovitch the latter had long before received notice of this interview and was prepared for it and he had every day been expecting just such a sudden summons as he got into the carriage he crossed himself his fate was being decided he found his friend in the big drawing-room on the little sofa in the recess before a little marble table with a pencil and paper in her hands fomushka with a yard measure 
was measuring the height of the galleries and the windows while varvara petrovna herself was writing down the numbers and making notes on the margin she nodded in stepan trofimovitch's direction without breaking off from what she was doing and when the latter muttered some sort of greeting she hurriedly gave him her hand and without looking at him motioned him to a seat beside her i sat waiting for five minutes mastering my heart he told me afterwards i saw before me not the woman whom i had known for twenty years an absolute conviction that all was over gave me a strength which astounded even her i swear that she was surprised at my stoicism in that last hour varvara petrovna suddenly put down her pencil on the table and turned quickly to stepan trofimovitch stepan trofimovitch we have to talk of business i'm sure you have prepared all your fervent words in various phrases but we'd better go straight to the point hadn't we she had been in too great a hurry to show the tone she meant to take and what might not come next wait be quiet let me speak afterwards you shall though really i don't know what you can answer me she said in a rapid patter the twelve hundred roubles of your pension i consider a sacred obligation to pay you as long as you live though why a sacred obligation simply a contract that would be a great deal more real wouldn't it if you like we'll write it out special arrangements have been made in case of my death but you are receiving from me at present lodgings servants and your maintenance in addition reckoning that in money it would amount to fifteen hundred roubles wouldn't it i will add another three hundred roubles making three thousand roubles in all will that be enough a year for you i think that's not too little in any extreme emergency i would add something more and so take your money send me back my servants and live by yourself where you like in petersburg in moscow abroad or here only not with me do you hear only lately those lips dictated to me as imperatively and as suddenly very different demands said stepan trofimovitch slowly and with sorrowful distinctness i submitted and danced the cossack dance to please you oui la comparaison peut être permise c'était comme un petit cossack du don qui sautait sur sa propre tombe now stop stepan trofimovitch you are horribly long-winded you didn't dance but came to see me in a new tie new linen gloves scented and pomatumed i assure you that you were very anxious to get married yourself it was written on your face and i assure you a most unseemly expression it was if i did not mention it to you at the time it was simply out of delicacy but you wished it you wanted to be married in spite of the abominable things you wrote about me and your betrothed now it's very different and what has the cossack du don to do with it and what tomb do you mean i don't understand the comparison on the contrary you have only to live live as long as you can i shall be delighted in an almshouse in an almshouse people don't go into almshouses with three thousand roubles a year ah i remember she laughed pyotr stepanovitch did joke about an almshouse once bah there certainly is a special almshouse which is worth considering it's for persons who are highly respectable there are colonels there and there's positively one general who wants to get into it if you went into it with all your money you would find peace comfort servants to wait on you there you could occupy yourself with study and could always make up a party for cards passons passons varvara petrovna winced but if so that's all you've been informed that we shall live henceforward entirely apart and that's all he said all that's left of twenty years our last farewell you're awfully fond of these exclamations stepan trofimovitch it's not at all the fashion nowadays people talk roughly but simply you keep harping on our twenty years twenty years of mutual vanity and nothing more every letter you've written me was written not for me but for posterity you're a stylist and not a friend and friendship is only a splendid word in reality a mutual exchange of sloppiness good heavens how many sayings not your own lessons learned by heart they've already put their uniform on you too you too are rejoicing you too are basking in the sunshine cher cher for what a mess of pottage you have sold them your freedom i'm not a parrot to repeat other people's phrases cried varvara petrovna boiling over you may be sure i have stored up many sayings of my own 
what have you been doing for me all these twenty years you refused me even the books i ordered for you though except for the binder they would have remained uncut what did you give me to read when i asked you during those first years to be my guide always kopfig and nothing but kopfig you were jealous of my culture even and took measures and all the while every one's laughing at you i must confess i always considered you only as a critic you are a literary critic and nothing more when on the way to petersburg i told you that i meant to found a journal and to devote my whole life to it you looked at me ironically at once and suddenly became horribly supercilious that was not that not that we were afraid then of persecution it was just that and you couldn't have been afraid of persecution in petersburg at that time do you remember that in february too when the news of the emancipation came you ran to me in a panic and demanded that i should at once give you a written statement that the proposed magazine had nothing to do with you that the young people had been coming to see me and not you that you were only a tutor who lived in the house only because he had not yet received his salary isn't that so do remember that you have distinguished yourself all your life stepan trofimovitch that was only a moment of weakness a moment when we were alone he exclaimed mournfully but is it possible is it possible to break off everything for the sake of such petty impressions can it be that nothing more has been left between us after those long years you are horribly calculating you keep trying to leave me in your debt when you came back from abroad you looked down upon me and wouldn't let me utter a word but when i came back myself and talked to you afterwards of my impressions of the madonna you wouldn't hear me you began smiling condescendingly into your cravat as though i were incapable of the same feelings as you it was not so it was probably not so j'ai oublié no it was so she answered and what's more you've nothing to pride yourself on that's all nonsense and one of your fancies now there's no one absolutely no one in ecstasies over the madonna no one wastes time over it except old men who are hopelessly out of date that's established established is it it's of no use whatever this jug's of use because one can pour water into it this pencil's of use because you can write anything with it but that woman's face is inferior to any face in nature try drawing an apple and put a real apple beside it which would you take you wouldn't make a mistake i'm sure this is what all our theories amount to now that the first light of free investigation has dawned upon them indeed indeed you laugh ironically and what used you to say to me about charity yet the enjoyment derived from charity is a haughty and immoral enjoyment the rich man's enjoyment in his wealth his power and in the comparison of his importance with the poor charity corrupts giver and taker alike and what's more does not attain its object as it only increases poverty fathers who don't want to work crowd round the charitable like gamblers round the gambling table hoping for gain while the pitiful farthings that are flung them are a hundred times too little have you given away much in your life less than a rouble if you try and think try to remember when last you gave away anything it'll be two years ago maybe four you make an outcry and only hinder things charity ought to be forbidden by law even in the present state of society in the new regime there'll be no poor at all oh what an eruption of borrowed phrases so it's come to the new regime already unhappy woman god help you yes it has stepan trofimovitch you carefully concealed all these new ideas from me though every one's familiar with them nowadays and you did it simply out of jealousy so as to have power over me so that now even that yulia is a hundred miles ahead of me but now my eyes have been opened i have defended you stepan trofimovitch all i could but there is no one who does not blame you enough said he getting up from his seat enough and what can i wish you now unless it's repentance sit still a minute stepan trofimovitch i have another question to ask you you've been told of the invitation to read at the literary matinee it was arranged through me tell me what you're going to read why about that very queen of queens that ideal of humanity the sistine madonna who to your thinking is inferior to a glass or a pencil so you're not taking something historical said varvara petrovna in mournful surprise but they won't listen to you 
you've got that madonna on your brain you seem bent on putting every one to sleep let me assure you stepan trofimovitch i am speaking entirely in your own interest it would be a different matter if you would take some short but interesting story of medieval court life from spanish history or better still some anecdote and pad it out with other anecdotes and witty phrases of your own there were magnificent courts then ladies you know poisonings karmazinov says it would be strange if you couldn't read something interesting from spanish history karmazinov that fool who has written himself out looking for a subject for me karmazinov that almost imperial intellect you are too free in your language stepan trofimovitch your karmazinov is a spiteful old woman whose day is over cher cher how long have you been so enslaved by them oh god i can't endure him even now for the airs he gives himself but i do justice to his intellect i repeat i have done my best to defend you as far as i could and why do you insist on being absurd and tedious on the contrary come on to the platform with a dignified smile as the representative of the last generation and tell them two or three anecdotes in your witty way as only you can tell things sometimes though you may be an old man now though you may belong to a past age though you may have dropped behind them in fact yet you'll recognize it yourself with a smile in your preface and all will see that you're an amiable good-natured witty relic in brief a man of the old savour in so far advanced as to be capable of appreciating at their value all the absurdities of certain ideas which you have hitherto followed come as a favour to me i beg you cher enough don't ask me i can't i shall speak of the madonna but i shall raise a storm that will either crush them all or shatter me alone it will certainly be you alone stepan trofimovitch such is my fate i will speak of the contemptible slave of the stinking depraved flunkey who will first climb a ladder with scissors in his hands and slash to pieces the divine image of the great ideal in the name of equality envy and digestion let my curse thunder out upon them and then then the madhouse perhaps but in any case whether i shall be left vanquished or victorious that very evening i shall take my bag my beggar's bag i shall leave all my goods and chattels all your presents all your pensions and promises of future benefits and go forth on foot to end my life a tutor in a merchant's family or to die somewhere of hunger in a ditch i have said it alea yacta est he got up again i've been convinced for years said varvara petrovna getting up with flashing eyes that your only object in life is to put me and my house to shame by your calumnies what do you mean by being a tutor in a merchant's family or dying in a ditch it's spite calumny and nothing more you have always despised me but i will end like a knight faithful to my lady your good opinion has always been dearer to me than anything from this moment i will take nothing but will worship you disinterestedly how stupid that is you have never respected me i may have had a mass of weaknesses yes i have sponged on you i speak the language of nihilism but sponging has never been the guiding motive of my action it has happened so of itself i don't know how i always imagined there was something higher than meat and drink between us and i've never never been a scoundrel and so to take the open road to set things right i set off late late autumn out of doors the mist lies over the fields the hoar-frost of old age covers the road before me and the wind howls about the approaching grave but so forward forward on my new way filled with purest love and fervour faith which my sweet dream did yield oh my dreams farewell twenty years alea yacta est his face was wet with a sudden gush of tears he took his hat i don't understand latin said varvara petrovna doing her best to control herself who knows perhaps she too felt like crying but caprice and indignation once more got the upper hand i know only one thing that all this is childish nonsense you will never be capable of carrying out your threats which are a mass of egoism you will set off nowhere to no merchant you'll end very peaceably on my hands taking your pension and receiving your utterly impossible friends on tuesdays good-bye stepan trofimovitch 
alia yakta est he made her a deep bow and returned home almost dead with emotion end of chapter five recording by expatriate in bangor maine part two chapter six sections one and two of the possessed by fyodor dostoevsky translated by constance garnett this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine part two chapter six fyodor stepanovitch is busy section one the date of the fete was definitely fixed and von lemke became more and more depressed he was full of strange and sinister forebodings and this made yulia mihailovna seriously uneasy indeed things were not altogether satisfactory our mild governor had left the affairs of the province a little out of gear at the moment we were threatened with cholera serious outbreaks of cattle plague had appeared in several places fires were prevalent that summer in towns and villages whilst among the peasantry foolish rumours of incendiarism grew stronger and stronger cases of robbery were twice as numerous as usual but all this of course would have been perfectly ordinary had there been no other and more weighty reason to disturb the equanimity of andrey antonovitch who had till then been in good spirits what struck yulia mihailovna most of all was that he became more silent and strange to say more secretive every day yet it was hard to imagine what he had to hide it is true that he rarely opposed her and as a rule followed her lead without question at her instigation for instance two or three regulations of a risky and hardly legal character were introduced with the object of strengthening the authority of the governor there were several ominous instances of transgressions being condoned with the same end in view persons who deserved to be sent to prison in siberia were solely because she insisted recommended for promotion certain complaints and inquiries were deliberately and systematically ignored all this came out later on not only did lemka sign everything but he did not even go into the question of the share taken by his wife in the execution of his duties on the other hand he began at times to be restive about the most trifling matters to the surprise of yulia mihailovna no doubt he felt the need to make up for the days of suppression by brief moments of mutiny unluckily yulia mihailovna was unable for all her insight to understand this honourable punctiliousness in an honourable character alas she had no thought to spare for that and that was the source of many misunderstandings there are some things of which it is not suitable for me to write and indeed i am not in a position to do so it is not my business to discuss the blunders of administration either and i prefer to leave out this administrative aspect of the subject altogether in the chronicle i have begun i have set before myself a different task moreover a great deal will be brought to light by the commission of inquiry which has just been appointed for our province it is only a matter of waiting a little certain explanations however cannot be omitted but to return to yulia mihailovna the poor lady i feel very sorry for her might have attained all that attracted and allured her renown and so on without any such violent and eccentric actions as she resolved upon at the very first step but either from an exaggerated passion for the romantic or from the frequently blighted hopes of her youth she felt suddenly at the change of her fortunes that she had become one of the specially elect almost god's anointed over whom there gleamed a burning tongue of fire and this tongue of flame was the root of the mischief for after all it is not like a chignon which will fit any woman's head but there is nothing of which it is more difficult to convince a woman than of this on the contrary any one who cares to encourage the delusion in her will always be sure to meet with success and people vied with one another in encouraging the delusion in yulia mihailovna the poor woman became at once the sport of conflicting influences while fully persuaded of her own originality many clever people feathered their nests and took advantage of her simplicity during the brief period of her rule in the province and what a jumble there was under this assumption of independence she was fascinated at the same time by the aristocratic element 
and the system of big landed properties and the increase of the governor's power and the democratic element and the new reforms and discipline and free thinking and stray socialistic notions and the correct tone of the aristocratic salon and the free and easy almost pothouse manners of the young people that surrounded her she dreamed of giving happiness and reconciling the irreconcilable or rather of uniting all and everything in the adoration of her own person she had favourites too she was particularly fond of pyotr stepanovitch who had recourse at times to the grossest flattery in dealing with her but she was attracted by him for another reason an amazing one and most characteristic of the poor lady she was always hoping that he would reveal to her a regular conspiracy against the government difficult as it is to imagine such a thing it really was the case she fancied for some reason that there must be a nihilist plot concealed in the province by his silence at one time and his hints at another pyotr stepanovitch did much to strengthen this strange idea in her she imagined that he was in communication with every revolutionary element in russia but at the same time passionately devoted to her to discover the plot to receive the gratitude of the government to enter on a brilliant career to influence the young by kindness and to restrain them from extremes all these dreams existed side by side in her fantastic brain she had saved pyotr stepanovitch she had conquered him of this she was for some reason firmly convinced she would save others none none of them should perish she should save them all she would pick them out she would send in the right report of them she would act in the interests of the loftiest justice and perhaps posterity and russian liberalism would bless her name yet the conspiracy would be discovered every advantage at once still it was essential that andrey antonovitch should be in rather better spirits before the festival he must be cheered up and reassured for this purpose she sent pyotr stepanovitch to him in the hope that he would relieve his depression by some means of consolation best known to himself perhaps by giving him some information so to speak first hand she put implicit faith in his dexterity it was some time since pyotr stepanovitch had been in mr von lemke's study he popped in on him just when the sufferer was in a most stubborn mood section two a combination of circumstances had arisen which mr von lemke was quite unable to deal with in the very district where pyotr stepanovitch had been having a festive time a sub-lieutenant had been called up to be censured by his immediate superior and the reproof was given in the presence of the whole company the sub-lieutenant was a young man fresh from petersburg always silent and morose of dignified appearance though small stout and rosy-cheeked he resented the reprimand and suddenly with a startling shriek that astonished the whole company he charged at his superior officer with his head bent down like a wild beast struck him and bit him on the shoulder with all his might they had difficulty in getting him off there was no doubt that he had gone out of his mind anyway it became known that of late he had been observed performing incredibly strange actions he had for instance flung two icons belonging to his landlady out of his lodgings and smashed up one of them with an axe in his own room he had on three stands resembling lecterns laid out the works of Vok, Moleschot and buchner and before each lectern he used to burn a church wax candle from the number of books found in his rooms it could be gathered that he was a well-read man if he had had fifty thousand francs he would perhaps have sailed to the island of marquisas like the cadet to whom herzen alludes with such sprightly humour in one of his writings when he was seized whole bundles of the most desperate manifestos were found in his pockets and his lodgings manifestos are a trivial matter too and to my thinking not worth troubling about we have seen plenty of them besides they were not new manifestos they were it was said later just the same as had been circulated in the x province and liputin who had travelled in that district and the neighbouring province six weeks previously declared that he had seen exactly the same leaflets there then but what struck andrey antonovitch most was that the overseer of spiegelin's factory had brought the police just at the same time two or three packets of exactly the same leaflets as had been found on the lieutenant 
the bundles which had been dropped in the factory in the night had not been opened and none of the factory hands had had time to read one of them the incident was a trivial one but it set andrey antonovitch pondering deeply the position presented itself to him in an unpleasantly complicated light in this factory the famous spiegelin scandal was just then brewing which made so much talk among us and got into the petersburg and moscow papers with all sorts of variations three weeks previously one of the hands had fallen ill and died of asiatic cholera then several others were stricken down the whole town was in a panic for the cholera was coming nearer and nearer and had reached the neighbouring province i may observe that satisfactory sanitary measures had been so far as possible taken to meet the unexpected guest but the factory belonging to the spiegelins who were millionaires and well-connected people had somehow been overlooked and there was a sudden outcry from every one that this factory was the hotbed of infection that the factory itself and especially the quarters inhabited by the workpeople were so inveterately filthy that even if cholera had not been in the neighbourhood there might well have been an outbreak there steps were immediately taken of course and andrey antonovitch vigorously insisted on their being carried out without delay within three weeks the factory was cleansed but the spiegelins for some unknown reason closed it one of the spiegelin brothers always lived in petersburg and the other went away to moscow when the order was given for cleansing the factory the overseer proceeded to pay off the workpeople and as it appeared cheated them shamelessly the hands began to complain among themselves asking to be paid fairly and foolishly went to the police though without much disturbance for they were not so very much excited it was just at this moment that the manifestos were brought to andrey antonovitch by the overseer pyotr stepanovitch popped into the study unannounced like an intimate friend and one of the family besides he had a message from yulia mihailovna seeing him lemke frowned grimly and stood still at the table without welcoming him till that moment he had been pacing up and down the study and had been discussing something tete-a-tete with his clerk bloom a very clumsy and surly german whom he had brought with him from petersburg in spite of the violent opposition of yulia mihailovna on pyotr stepanovitch's entrance the clerk had moved to the door but had not gone out pyotr stepanovitch even fancied that he exchanged significant glances with his chief aha i've caught you at last you secretive monarch of the town pyotr stepanovitch cried out laughing and laid his hand over the manifesto on the table this increases your collection eh andrey antonovitch flushed crimson his face seemed to twitch leave off leave off at once he cried trembling with rage and don't you dare sir what's the matter with you you seem to be angry allow me to inform you sir that i've no intention of putting up with your sans façon henceforward and i beg you to remember why damn it all he is in earnest hold your tongue hold your tongue von lemke stamped on the carpet and don't dare god knows what it might have come to alas there was one circumstance involved in the matter of which neither pyotr stepanovitch nor even yulia mihailovna herself had any idea the luckless andrey antonovitch had been so greatly upset during the last few days that he had begun to be secretly jealous of his wife and pyotr stepanovitch in solitude especially at night he spent some very disagreeable moments well i imagined that if a man reads you his novel two days running till after midnight and wants to hear your opinion of it he has of his own act discarded official relations anyway yulia mihailovna treats me as a friend there's no making you out pyotr stepanovitch brought out with a certain dignity indeed here is your novel by the way he laid on the table a large heavy manuscript rolled up in blue paper lemka turned red and looked embarrassed where did you find it he asked discreetly with a rush of joy that he was unable to suppress though he did his utmost to conceal it only fancy done up like this it rolled under the chest of drawers i must have thrown it down carelessly on the chest when i went out it was only found the day before yesterday when the floor was scrubbed you did set me a task though lemka dropped his eyes sternly i haven't slept for the last two nights thanks to you it was found the day before yesterday but i kept it and have been reading it ever since i've no time in the day so i've read it at night well i don't like it it's not my way of looking at things but that's no matter 
i've never set up for being a critic but i couldn't tear myself away from it my dear man though i didn't like it the fourth and fifth chapters are they really are damn it all they are beyond words and what a lot of humour you've packed into it it made me laugh how you can make fun of things sans que cela pares as for the ninth and tenth chapters it's all about love that's not my line but it's effective though i was nearly blubbering over egrinov's letter though you've shown him up so cleverly you know it's touching though at the same time you want to show the false side of him as it were don't you have i guessed right but i could simply beat you for the ending what are you setting up why the same old idol of domestic happiness begetting children and making money they were married and lived happy ever afterwards come it's too much you will enchant your readers for even i couldn't put the book down but that makes it all the worse the reading public is as stupid as ever but it's the duty of sensible people to wake them up while you but that's enough good-bye don't be cross another time i came in to you because i had a couple of words to say to you but you are so unaccountable andrey antonovitch meantime took his novel and locked it up in an oak bookcase seizing the opportunity to wink to bloom to disappear the latter withdrew with a long mournful face i am not unaccountable i am simply nothing but annoyances he muttered frowning but without anger and sitting down to the table sit down and say what you have to say it's a long time since i've seen you pyotr stepanovitch only don't burst upon me in the future with such manners sometimes when one has business it's my manners are always the same i know and i believe that you mean nothing by it but sometimes one is worried sit down pyotr stepanovitch immediately lolled back on the sofa and drew his legs under him end of chapter six sections one and two recording by expatriate in bangor maine part two chapter six section three of the possessed by fyodor dostoevsky translated by constance garnett this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine part two chapter six pyotr stepanovitch is busy section three what sort of worries surely not these trifles he nodded towards the manifesto i can bring you as many of them as you like i made their acquaintance in x province you mean at the time you were staying there of course it was not in my absence i remember there was a hatchet printed at the top of it allow me he took up the manifesto yes there's the hatchet here too that's it the very same yes here's a hatchet you see a hatchet well is it the hatchet that scares you no it's not and i am not scared but this business it is a business there are circumstances what sort that it's come from the factory <laughs> but do you know at that factory the workpeople will soon be writing manifestos for themselves what do you mean von lemke stared at him severely what i say you've only to look at them you are too soft andrey antonovitch you write novels but this has to be handled in the good old way what do you mean by the good old way what do you mean by advising me the factory has been cleaned i gave the order and they've cleaned it and the workmen are in rebellion they ought to be flogged every one of them that would be the end of it in rebellion that's nonsense i gave the order and they've cleaned it ah you are soft andrey antonovitch in the first place i am not so soft as you think and in the second place von lemke was piqued again he had exerted himself to keep up the conversation with the young man from curiosity wondering if he would tell him anything new ha ha an old acquaintance again pyotr stepanovitch interrupted pouncing on another document that lay under a paperweight something like a manifesto obviously printed abroad and in verse oh come i know this one by heart a noble personality let me have a look at it yes a noble personality it is i made acquaintance with that personality abroad where did you unearth it you say you've seen it abroad von lemke said eagerly i should think so four months ago or maybe five you seem to have seen a great deal abroad von lemke looked at him subtly pyotr stepanovitch not heeding him unfolded the document and read the poem aloud a noble personality he was not of rank exalted he was not of noble birth he was bred among the people in the breast of mother earth 
but the malice of the nobles and the czar's revengeful wrath drove him forth to grief and torture on the martyr's chosen path he set out to teach the people freedom love equality to exhort them to resistance but to flee the penalty of the prison whip and gallows to a foreign land he went while the people waited hoping from smolensk to far tashkent waited eager for his coming to rebel against their fate to arouse and crush the tsardom and the nobles vicious hate to share all the wealth in common and the antiquated thrall of the church the home and marriage to abolish once for all you got that from that officer i suppose eh asked pyotr stepanovitch why do you know that officer then too i should think so i had a gay time with him there for two days he was bound to go out of his mind perhaps he did not go out of his mind you think he didn't because he began to bite but excuse me if you saw those verses abroad and then it appears at that officer's what puzzling is it you are putting me through an examination andrey antonovitch i see you see he began suddenly with extraordinary dignity as to what i saw abroad i have already given explanations and my explanations were found satisfactory otherwise i should not have been gratifying this town with my presence i consider that the question as regards me has been settled and i am not obliged to give any further account of myself not because i am an informer but because i could not help acting as i did the people who wrote to yulia mihailovna about me knew what they were talking about and they said i was an honest man but that's neither here nor there i've come to see you about a serious matter and it's as well you've sent your chimney-sweep away it's a matter of importance to me andrey antonovitch i shall have a very great favour to ask of you a favour hm by all means i am waiting and i confess with curiosity and i must add pyotr stepanovitch that you surprise me not a little von lemke was in some agitation pyotr stepanovitch crossed his legs in petersburg he began i talked freely of most things but there were things this for instance he tapped the noble personality with his finger about which i held my tongue in the first place because it wasn't worth talking about and secondly because i only answered questions i don't care to put myself forward in such matters in that i see the distinction between a rogue and an honest man forced by circumstances well in short we'll dismiss that but now now that these fools now that this has come to the surface and is in your hands and i see that you'll find out all about it for you are a man with eyes and one can't tell beforehand what you'll do and these fools are still going on i i well the fact is i've come to ask you to save one man a fool too most likely mad for the sake of his youth his misfortunes in the name of your humanity you can't be so humane only in the novels you manufacture he said breaking off with coarse sarcasm and impatience in fact he was seen to be a straightforward man awkward and impolitic from excess of humane feeling and perhaps from excessive sensitiveness above all a man of limited intelligence as von lemke saw at once with extraordinary subtlety he had indeed long suspected it especially when during the previous week he had sitting alone in his study at night secretly cursed him with all his heart for the inexplicable way in which he had gained yulia mihailovna's good graces for whom are you interceding and what does all this mean he inquired majestically trying to conceal his curiosity it's it's oh, damn it it's not my fault that i trust you is it my fault that i look upon you as a most honourable and above all a sensible man capable that is of understanding damn the poor fellow evidently could not master his emotion you must understand at last he went on you must understand that in pronouncing his name i am betraying him to you i am betraying him am i not i am am i not but how am i to guess if you don't make up your mind to speak out that's just it you always cut the ground from under one's feet with your logic damn it well here goes this noble personality this student is shatov that's all shatov how do you mean it's shatov shatov is the student who is mentioned in this he lives here he was once a serf the man who gave that slap i know i know lemka screwed up his eyes but excuse me what is he accused of precisely and above all what is your petition 
i beg you to save him do you understand i used to know him eight years ago i might almost say i was his friend cried pyotr stepanovitch completely carried away but i am not bound to give you an account of my past life he added with a gesture of dismissal all this is of no consequence it's the case of three men and a half and with those that are abroad you can't make up a dozen but what i am building upon is your humanity and your intelligence you will understand and you will put the matter in its true light as the foolish dream of a man driven crazy by misfortunes by continued misfortunes and not as some impossible political plot or god knows what he was almost gasping for breath hm i see that he is responsible for the manifestos with the axe lemke concluded almost majestically excuse me though if he were the only person concerned how could he have distributed it both here and in other districts and in the x province and above all where did he get them but i tell you that at the utmost there are not more than five people in it a dozen perhaps how can i tell you don't know how should i know damn it all well you knew that shatov was one of the conspirators ah pyotr stepanovitch waved his hand as though to keep off the overwhelming penetration of the inquirer well listen i'll tell you the whole truth of the manifestos i know nothing that is absolutely nothing damn it all don't you know what nothing means that sub-lieutenant to be sure and somebody else and someone else here and shatov perhaps and someone else too well that's the lot of them a wretched lot but i've come to intercede for shatov he must be saved for this poem is his his own composition and it was through him it was published abroad that i know for a fact but of the manifestos i really know nothing if the poem is his work no doubt the manifestos are too but what data have you for suspecting mr shatov pyotr stepanovitch with the air of a man driven out of all patience pulled a pocket-book out of his pocket and took a note out of it here are the facts he cried flinging it on the table lemke unfolded it it turned out to be a note written six months before from here to some address abroad it was a brief note only two lines i can't print a noble personality here and in fact i can do nothing print it abroad lemke looked intently at pyotr stepanovitch varvara petrovna had been right in saying that he had at times the expression of a sheep you see it's like this pyotr stepanovitch burst out he wrote this poem here six months ago but he couldn't get it printed here in a secret printing press and so he asked to have it printed abroad that seems clear yes that's clear but to whom did he write that's not clear yet lemka observed with the most subtle irony why kirillov of course the letter was written to kirillov abroad surely you knew that what's so annoying is that perhaps you are only putting it on before me and most likely you knew all about this poem and everything long ago how did it come to be on your table it found its way there somehow why are you torturing me if so he feverishly mopped his forehead with his handkerchief i know something perhaps lemke parried dexterously but who is this kirillov an engineer who has lately come to the town he was stavrogin's second a maniac a madman your sub-lieutenant may really only be suffering from temporary delirium but kirillov is a thoroughgoing madman thoroughgoing that i guarantee ah andrey antonovitch if the government only knew what sort of people these conspirators all are they wouldn't have the heart to lay a finger on them every single one of them ought to be in an asylum i had a good look at them in switzerland and at the congresses from which they direct the movement here why who directs it three men and a half it makes one sick to think of them and what sort of movement is there here manifestos and what recruits have they made sub-lieutenants in brain fever and two or three students you are a sensible man answer this question why don't people of consequence join their ranks why are they all students and half-baked boys of twenty-two and not many of those i dare say there are thousands of bloodhounds on their track but have they tracked out many of them seven i tell you it makes one sick lemke listened with attention but with an expression that seemed to say you don't feed nightingales on fairy tales excuse me though you asserted that the letter was sent abroad but there's no address on it how do you come to know that it was addressed to mr kirillov and abroad too and and that it really was written by mr shatov 
why fetch some specimen of shatov's writing and compare it you must have some signature of his in your office as for its being addressed to kirillov it was kirillov himself showed it me at the time then you were yourself of course i was myself they showed me lots of things out there and as for this poem they say it was written by herzen to shatov when he was still wandering abroad in memory of their meeting so they say by way of praise and recommendation damn it all and shatov circulates it among the young people as much as to say this was herzen's opinion of me aha cried lemke feeling he had got to the bottom of it at last that's just what i was wondering one can understand the manifesto but what's the object of the poem of course you'd see it goodness knows why i've been babbling to you listen spare shatov for me and the rest may go to the devil even kirillov who is in hiding now shut up in filipov's house where shatov lodges too they don't like me because i've turned round but promise me shatov and i'll dish them all up for you i shall be of use andrey antonovitch i reckon nine or ten men make up the whole wretched lot i am keeping an eye on them myself on my own account we know of three already shatov kirillov and that sub-lieutenant the others i am only watching carefully though i am pretty sharp-sighted too it's the same over again as it was in the x province two students a schoolboy two noblemen of twenty a teacher and a half-pay major of sixty crazy with drink have been caught with manifestos that was all you can take my word for it that was all it was quite a surprise that that was all but i must have six days i have reckoned it out six days not less if you want to arrive at any result don't disturb them for six days and i can kill all the birds with one stone for you but if you flutter them before the birds will fly away but spare me shatov i speak for shatov the best plan would be to fetch him here secretly in a friendly way to your study and question him without disguising the facts i have no doubt he'll throw himself at your feet and burst into tears he is a highly strung and unfortunate fellow his wife is carrying on with stavrogin be kind to him and he will tell you everything but i must have six days and above all above all not a word to yulia mihailovna it's a secret may it be a secret what cried lemke opening wide his eyes do you mean to say you said nothing of this to yulia mihailovna to her heaven forbid Ech, andrey antonovitch you see i value her friendship and i have the highest respect for her and all the rest of it but i couldn't make such a blunder i don't contradict her for as you know yourself it's dangerous to contradict her i may have dropped a word to her for i know she likes that but to suppose that i mention names to her as i have to you or anything of that sort my good sir why am i appealing to you because you are a man anyway a serious person with old-fashioned firmness and experience in the service you've seen life you must know by heart every detail of such affairs i expect from what you've seen in petersburg but if i were to mention those two names for instance to her she'd stir up such a hubbub you know she would like to astonish petersburg no she's too hot-headed she really is yes she has something of that fougue andrey antonovitch muttered with some satisfaction though at the same time he resented this unmannerly fellow's daring to express himself rather freely about yulia mihailovna but pyotr stepanovitch probably imagined that he had not gone far enough and that he must exert himself further to flatter lemke and make a complete conquest of him fougue is just it he assented she may be a woman of genius a literary woman but she would scare our sparrows she wouldn't be able to keep quiet for six hours let alone six days Ech, andrey antonovitch don't attempt to tie a woman down for six days you do admit that i have some experience in this sort of thing i mean i know something about it and you know that i may very well know something about it i am not asking for six days for fun but with an object i have heard lemke hesitated to utter his thought i have heard that on your return from abroad you made some expression as it were of repentance in the proper quarter well that's as it may be and of course i don't want to go into it but it has seemed to me all along that you've talked in quite a different style about the christian faith for instance about social institutions about the government even oh, i've said lots of things no doubt i am saying them still but such ideas mustn't be applied as those fools do it that's the point 
what's the good of biting his superior's shoulder you agreed with me yourself only you said it was premature i didn't mean that when i agreed and said it was premature you weigh every word you utter though <laughs> you are a careful man pyotr stepanovitch observed gaily all of a sudden listen old friend i had to get to know you that's why i talked in my own style you are not the only one i get to know like that maybe i needed to find out your character what's my character to you how can i tell what it may be to me he laughed again you see my dear and highly respected andrey antonovitch you are cunning but it's not come to that yet and it certainly never will come to it you understand perhaps you do understand though i did make an explanation in the proper quarter when i came back from abroad and i really don't know why a man of certain convictions should not be able to work for the advancement of his sincere convictions but nobody there has yet instructed me to investigate your character and i've not undertaken any such job from them consider i need not have given those two names to you i might have gone straight there that is where i made my first explanations and if i'd been acting with a view to financial profit or my own interest in any way it would have been a bad speculation on my part for now they'll be grateful to you and not to me at headquarters i've done it solely for shatov's sake pyotr stepanovitch added generously for shatov's sake because of our old friendship but when you take up your pen to write to headquarters you may put in a word for me if you like i'll make no objection <laughs> adieu though i've stayed too long and there was no need to gossip so much he added with some amiability and he got up from the sofa on the contrary i am very glad that the position has been defined so to speak von lemke too got up and he too looked pleasant obviously affected by the last words i accept your services and acknowledge my obligation and you may be sure that anything i can do by way of reporting your zeal six days the great thing is to put it off for six days and that you shouldn't stir for those six days that's what i want so be it of course i don't tie your hands and shouldn't venture to you are bound to keep watch only don't flutter the nest too soon i rely on your sense and experience for that but i think you've plenty of bloodhounds and trackers of your own in reserve pyotr stepanovitch blurted out with the gaiety and irresponsibility of youth not quite so lemke parried amiably young people are apt to suppose that there is a great deal in the background but by the way allow me one little word if this kirillov was stavrogin's second then mr stavrogin too what about stavrogin i mean if they are such friends oh no 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 there you are quite out of it though you are cunning you really surprise me i thought that you had some information about it hm stavrogin it's quite the opposite quite avis au lecteur do you mean it and can it be so lemke articulated mistrustfully yulia mihailovna told me that from what she heard from petersburg he is a man acting on some sort of instructions so to speak i know nothing about it i know nothing absolutely nothing adieu avis au lecteur abruptly and obviously pyotr stepanovitch declined to discuss it he hurried to the door stay pyotr stepanovitch stay cried lemke one other tiny matter and i won't detain you he drew an envelope out of a table drawer here is a little specimen of the same kind of thing and i let you see it to show how completely i trust you here and tell me your opinion in the envelope was a letter a strange anonymous letter addressed to lemke and only received by him the day before with intense vexation pyotr stepanovitch read as follows your excellency for such you are by rank herewith i make known that there is an attempt to be made on the life of personages of general's rank and on the fatherland for it's working up straight for that i myself have been disseminating unceasingly for a number of years there's infidelity too there's a rebellion being got up and there are some thousands of manifestos and for every one of them there will be a hundred running with their tongues out unless they've been taken away beforehand by the police for they've been promised a mighty lot of benefits and the simple people are foolish and there's vodka too the people will attack one after another taking them to be guilty and fearing both sides i repent of what i had no share in my circumstances being what they are if you want information to save the fatherland and also the church and the icons i am the only one that can do it 
but only on condition that i get a pardon from the secret police by telegram at once me alone but the rest may answer for it put a candle every evening at seven o'clock in the porter's window for a signal seeing it i shall believe and come to kiss the merciful hand from petersburg but on condition there's a pension for me for else how am i to live you won't regret it for it will mean a star for you you must go secretly or they'll wring your neck your excellency's desperate servant falls at your feet signed repentant free thinker incognito von lemke explained that the letter had made its appearance in the porter's room when it was left empty the day before so what do you think pyotr stepanovitch asked almost rudely i think it's an anonymous skit by way of a hoax most likely it is there's no taking you in what makes me think that is that it's so stupid have you received such documents here before once or twice anonymous letters oh of course they wouldn't be signed in a different style in different handwritings yes and were they buffoonery like this one yes and you know very disgusting well if you had them before it must be the same thing now especially because it's so stupid because these people are educated and wouldn't write so stupidly of course of course but what if this is someone who really wants to turn informer it's not very likely pyotr stepanovitch rapped out dryly what does he mean by a telegram from the secret police and a pension it's obviously a hoax yes yes lemka added abashed i tell you what you leave this with me i can certainly find out for you before i track out the others take it lemka assented though with some hesitation have you shown it to anyone is it likely no not to yulia mihailovna oh heaven forbid and for god's sake don't you show it to her lemka cried in alarm she'll be so upset and will be dreadfully angry with me yes you'll be the first to catch it she'd say you brought it on yourself if people write like that to you i know what women's logic is well good-bye i dare say i shall bring you the writer in a couple of days or so above all our compact end of part two chapter six section three recording by expatriate in bangor maine part two chapter six sections four and five of the possessed by fyodor dostoevsky translated by constance garnett this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine part two chapter six pyotr stepanovitch is busy section four though pyotr stepanovitch was perhaps far from being a stupid man fedka the convict had said of him truly that he would make up a man himself and go on living with him too he came away from lemka fully persuaded that for the next six days anyway he had put his mind at rest and this interval was absolutely necessary for his own purposes but it was a false idea and founded entirely on the fact that he had made up for himself once for all an andrey antonovitch who was a perfect simpleton like every morbidly suspicious man andrey antonovitch was always exceedingly and joyfully trustful the moment he got on to sure ground the new turn of affairs struck him at first in a rather favourable light in spite of some fresh and troublesome complications anyway his former doubts fell to the ground besides he had been so tired for the last few days so exhausted and helpless that his soul involuntarily yearned for rest but alas he was again uneasy the long time he had spent in petersburg had left ineradicable traces in his heart the official and even the secret history of the younger generation was fairly familiar to him he was a curious man and used to collect manifestos but he could never understand a word of it now he felt like a man lost in a forest every instinct told him that there was something in pyotr stepanovitch's words utterly incongruous anomalous and grotesque though there's no telling what may not happen with this younger generation and the devil only knows what's going on among them he mused lost in perplexity and at this moment to make matters worse bloom poked his head in he had been waiting not far off through the whole of pyotr stepanovitch's visit this bloom was actually a distant relation of andrey antonovitch though the relationship had always been carefully and timorously concealed i must apologize to the reader for devoting a few words here 
to this insignificant person blum was one of that strange class of unfortunate germans who are unfortunate not through lack of ability but through some inexplicable ill luck unfortunate germans are not a myth but really do exist even in russia and are of a special type andrey antonovitch had always had a quite touching sympathy for him and wherever he could as he rose himself in the service had promoted him to subordinate positions under him but bloom had never been successful either the post was abolished after he had been appointed to it or a new chief took charge of the department once he was almost arrested by mistake with other people he was precise but he was gloomy to excess and to his own detriment he was tall and had red hair he stooped and was depressed and even sentimental and in spite of his being humbled by his life he was obstinate and persistent as an ox though always at the wrong moment for andrey antonovitch he as well as his wife and numerous family had cherished for many years a reverent devotion except andrey antonovitch no one had ever liked him yulia mihailovna would have discarded him from the first but could not overcome her husband's obstinacy it was the cause of their first conjugal quarrel it had happened soon after their marriage in the early days of their honeymoon when she was confronted with bloom who together with the humiliating secret of his relationship had been until then carefully concealed from her andrey antonovitch besought her with clasped hands told her pathetically all the story of bloom and their friendship from childhood but yulia mihailovna considered herself disgraced for ever and even had recourse to fainting von lemke would not budge an inch and declared that he would not give up bloom or part from him for anything in the world so that she was surprised at last and was obliged to put up with bloom it was settled however that the relationship should be concealed even more carefully than before if possible and that even bloom's christian name and patronymic should be changed because he too was for some reason called andrey antonovitch bloom knew no one in the town except the german chemist had not called on any one and led as he always did a lonely and niggardly existence he had long been aware of andrey antonovitch's literary peccadilloes he was generally summoned to listen to secret tete-a-tete readings of his novel he would sit like a post for six hours at a stretch perspiring and straining his utmost to keep awake and smile on reaching home he would groan with his long-legged and lanky wife over their benefactor's unhappy weakness for russian literature andrey antonovitch looked with anguish at bloom i beg you to leave me alone bloom he began with agitated haste obviously anxious to avoid any renewal of the previous conversation which had been interrupted by pyotr stepanovitch and yet this may be arranged in the most delicate way and with no publicity you have full power bloom respectfully but obstinately insisted on some point stooping forward and coming nearer and nearer by small steps to andrey antonovitch bloom you are so devoted to me and so anxious to serve me that i am always in a panic when i look at you you always say witty things and sleep in peace satisfied with what you've said but that's how you damage yourself bloom i have just convinced myself that it's quite a mistake quite a mistake not from the words of that false vicious young man whom you suspect yourself he has won you by his flattering praise of your talent for literature bloom you understand nothing about it your project is absurd i tell you we shall find nothing and there will be a fearful upset and laughter too and then yulia mihailovna we shall certainly find everything we are looking for bloom advanced firmly towards him laying his right hand on his heart we will make a search suddenly early in the morning carefully showing every consideration for the person himself and strictly observing all the prescribed forms of the law the young men lyamshin and telyatnikov assert positively that we shall find all we want they were constant visitors there nobody is favourably disposed to mr verkovensky madame stavrogin has openly refused him her graces and every honest man if only there is such a one in this coarse town is persuaded that a hotbed of infidelity and social doctrines has always been concealed there he keeps all the forbidden books Relioff's reflections all herzen's works i have an approximate catalogue in case of need oh heavens every one has these books 
how simple you are my poor bloom and many manifestos bloom went on without heeding the observation we shall end by certainly coming upon traces of the real manifestos here that young verkovensky i feel very suspicious of but you are mixing up the father and the son they are not on good terms the son openly laughs at his father that's only a mask bloom you've sworn to torment me think he is a conspicuous figure here after all he's been a professor he is a well-known man he'll make such an uproar and there will be such jibes all over the town and we shall make a mess of it all and only think how yulia mihailovna will take it bloom pressed forward and did not listen he was only a lecturer only a lecturer and of a low rank when he retired he smote himself on the chest he has no marks of distinction he was discharged from the service on suspicion of plots against the government he has been under secret supervision and undoubtedly still is so and in view of the disorders that have come to light now you are undoubtedly bound in duty you are losing your chance of distinction by letting slip the real criminal yulia mihailovna get away bloom von lemke cried suddenly hearing the voice of his spouse in the next room bloom started but did not give in allow me allow me he persisted pressing both hands still more tightly on his chest get away hissed andrey antonovitch do what you like afterwards oh my god the curtain was raised and yulia mihailovna made her appearance she stood still majestically at the sight of bloom casting a haughty and offended glance at him as though the very presence of this man was an affront to her bloom respectfully made her a deep bow without speaking and doubled up with veneration moved towards the door on tiptoe with his arms held a little away from him either because he really took andrey antonovitch's last hysterical outbreak as a direct permission to act as he was asking or whether he strained a point in this case for the direct advantage of his benefactor because he was too confident that success would crown his efforts anyway as we shall see later on this conversation of the governor with his subordinate led to a very surprising event which amused many people became public property moved yulia mihailovna to fierce anger utterly disconcerting andrey antonovitch and reducing him at the crucial moment to a state of deplorable indecision section five it was a busy day for pyotr stepanovitch from von lemke he hastened to bogoyavlensky street but as he went along bikovy street past the house where karmazinov was staying he suddenly stopped grinned and went into the house the servant told him that he was expected which interested him as he had said nothing beforehand of his coming but the great writer really had been expecting him not only that day but the day before and the day before that three days before he had handed him his manuscript merci which he had meant to read at the literary matinee at yulia mihailovna's fete he had done this out of amiability fully convinced that he was agreeably flattering the young man's vanity by letting him read the great work beforehand pyotr stepanovitch had noticed long before that this vainglorious spoiled gentleman who was so offensively unapproachable for all but the elect this writer with the intellect of a statesman was simply trying to curry favour with him even with avidity i believe the young man guessed at last that karmazinov considered him if not the leader of the whole secret revolutionary movement in russia at least one of those most deeply initiated into the secrets of the russian revolution who had an incontestable influence on the younger generation the state of mind of the cleverest man in russia interested pyotr stepanovitch but hitherto he had for certain reasons avoided explaining himself the great writer was staying in the house belonging to his sister who was the wife of a kammerherr and had an estate in the neighbourhood both she and her husband had the deepest reverence for their illustrious relation but to their profound regret both of them happened to be in moscow at the time of his visit so that the honour of receiving him fell to the lot of an old lady a poor relation of the kammerherrs who had for years lived in the family and looked after the housekeeping all the household had moved about on tiptoe since karmazinov's arrival the old lady sent news to moscow almost every day how he had slept what he had deigned to eat 
and had once sent a telegram to announce that after a dinner-party at the mayor's he was obliged to take a spoonful of a well-known medicine she rarely plucked up courage to enter his room though he behaved courteously to her but dryly and only talked to her of what was necessary when pyotr stepanovitch came in he was eating his morning cutlet with half a glass of red wine pyotr stepanovitch had been to see him before and always found him eating this cutlet which he finished in his presence without ever offering him anything after the cutlet a little cup of coffee was served the footman who brought in the dishes wore a swallow-tail coat noiseless boots and gloves ha ha karmazinov got up from the sofa wiping his mouth with a table napkin and came forward to kiss him with an air of unmixed delight after the characteristic fashion of russians if they are very illustrious but pyotr stepanovitch knew by experience that though karmazinov made a show of kissing him he really only proffered his cheek and so this time he did the same the cheeks met karmazinov did not show that he noticed it sat down on the sofa and affably offered pyotr stepanovitch an easy-chair facing him in which the latter stretched himself at once you don't wouldn't like some lunch inquired karmazinov abandoning his usual habit but with an air of course which would prompt a polite refusal pyotr stepanovitch at once expressed a desire for lunch a shade of offended surprise darkened the face of his host but only for an instant he nervously rang for the servant and in spite of all his breeding raised his voice scornfully as he gave orders for a second lunch to be served what will you have cutlet or coffee he asked once more a cutlet and coffee and tell him to bring some more wine i am hungry answered pyotr stepanovitch calmly scrutinizing his host's attire mr karmazinov was wearing a sort of indoor wadded jacket with pearl buttons but it was too short which was far from becoming to his rather comfortable stomach and the solid curves of his hips but tastes differ over his knees he had a checkered woolen plaid reaching to the floor though it was warm in the room are you unwell commented pyotr stepanovitch no not unwell but i am afraid of being so in this climate answered the writer in his squeaky voice though he uttered each word with a soft cadence and agreeable gentlemanly lisp i've been expecting you since yesterday why i didn't say i'd come no but you have my manuscript have you read it manuscript which one karmazinov was terribly surprised but you brought it with you haven't you he was so disturbed that he even left off eating and looked at pyotr stepanovitch with a face of dismay ah that bonjour you mean merci oh all right i'd quite forgotten it and hadn't read it i haven't had time i really don't know it's not in my pockets it must be on my table don't be uneasy it will be found no i'd better send you to your rooms at once it might be lost besides it might be stolen oh who'd want it but why are you so alarmed why yulia mikhailovna told me you always have several copies made one kept at a notary's abroad another in petersburg a third in moscow and then you send some to a bank i believe but moscow might be burnt again and my manuscript with it no i'd better send at once stay here it is pyotr stepanovitch pulled a roll of note-paper out of a pocket at the back of his coat it's a little crumpled only fancy it's been lying there with my pocket-handkerchief ever since i took it from you i forgot it karmazinov greedily snatched the manuscript carefully examined it counted the pages and laid it respectfully beside him on a special table for the time in such a way that he would not lose sight of it for an instant you don't read very much it seems he hissed unable to restrain himself no not very much and nothing in the way of russian literature in the way of russian literature hm let me see i have read something on the way or away or at the parting of the ways something of the sort i don't remember it's a long time since i read it five years ago i've no time a silence followed when i came i assured every one that you were a very intelligent man and now i believe every one here is wild over you thank you pyotr stepanovitch answered calmly lunch was brought in 
pyotr stepanovitch pounced on the cutlet with extraordinary appetite had eaten it in a trice tossed off the wine and swallowed his coffee this boor thought karmazinov looking at him askance as he munched the last morsel and drained the last drops this boor probably understood the biting taunt in my words and no doubt he has read the manuscript with eagerness he is simply lying with some object but possibly he is not lying and is only genuinely stupid i like a genius to be rather stupid mayn't he be a sort of genius among them devil take the fellow he got up from the sofa and began pacing from one end of the room to the other for the sake of exercise as he always did after lunch leaving here soon asked pyotr stepanovitch from his easy chair lighting a cigarette i really came to sell an estate and i am in the hands of my bailiff you left i believe because they expected an epidemic out there after the war no not entirely for that reason mr karmazinov went on uttering his phrases with an affable intonation and each time he turned round in pacing the corner there was a faint but jaunty quiver of his right leg i certainly intend to live as long as i can he laughed not without venom there is something in our russian nobility that makes them wear out very quickly from every point of view but i wish to wear out as late as possible and now i am going abroad for good there the climate is better the houses are of stone and everything stronger europe will last my time i think what do you think how can i tell hm if the babylon out there really does fall and great will be the fall thereof about which i quite agree with you yet i think it will last my time there's nothing to fall here in russia comparatively speaking there won't be stones to fall everything will crumble into dirt holy russia has less power of resistance than anything in the world the russian peasantry is still held together somehow by the russian god but according to the latest accounts the russian god is not to be relied upon and scarcely survived the emancipation it certainly gave him a severe shock and now what with railways what with you i've no faith in the russian god and how about the european one i don't believe in any i've been slandered to the youth of russia i've always sympathized with every movement among them i was shown the manifestos here every one looks at them with perplexity because they are frightened at the way things are put in them but every one is convinced of their power even if they don't admit it to themselves everybody has been rolling downhill and every one has known for ages that they have nothing to clutch at i am persuaded of the success of this mysterious propaganda if only because russia is now pre-eminently the place in all the world where anything you like may happen without any opposition i understand only too well why wealthy russians all flock abroad and more and more so every year it's simply instinct if the ship is sinking the rats are the first to leave it holy russia is a country of wood of poverty and of danger the country of ambitious beggars in its upper classes while the immense majority live in poky little huts she will be glad of any way of escape you have only to present it to her it's only the government that still means to resist but it brandishes its cudgel in the dark and hits its own men everything here is doomed and awaiting the end russia as she is has no future i have become a german and i am proud of it but you began about the manifestos tell me everything how do you look at them every one is afraid of them so they must be influential they openly unmask what is false and prove that there is nothing to lay hold of among us and nothing to lean upon they speak aloud while all is silent what is most effective about them in spite of their style is the incredible boldness with which they look the truth straight in the face to look facts straight in the face is only possible to russians of this generation no in europe they are not yet so bold it is a realm of stone there there is still something to lean upon so far as i see and am able to judge the whole essence of the russian revolutionary idea lies in the negation of honour i like its being so boldly and fearlessly expressed no in europe they wouldn't understand it yet but that's just what we shall clutch at for a russian a sense of honour is only a superfluous burden and it always has been a burden through all his history the open right to dishonour will attract him more than anything 
i belong to the older generation and i must confess still cling to honour but only from habit it is only that i prefer the old forms granted it's from timidity you see one must live somehow what's left of one's life he suddenly stopped i am talking he thought while he holds his tongue and watches me he has come to make me ask him a direct question and i shall ask him yulia mihailovna asked me by some stratagem to find out from you what the surprise is that you are preparing for the ball to-morrow pyotr stepanovitch asked suddenly yes there really will be a surprise and i certainly shall astonish said karmazinov with increased dignity but i won't tell you what the secret is pyotr stepanovitch did not insist there is a young man here called shatov observed the great writer would you believe it i haven't seen him a very nice person what about him oh nothing he talks about something isn't he the person who gave stavrogin that slap in the face yes and what's your opinion of stavrogin i don't know he is such a flirt karmazinov detested stavrogin because it was the latter's habit not to take any notice of him that flirt he said chuckling if what is advocated in your manifestos ever comes to pass will be the first to be hanged perhaps before pyotr stepanovitch said suddenly quite right too karmazinov assented not laughing and with pronounced gravity you have said so once before and do you know i repeated it to him what you surely didn't repeat it karmazinov laughed again he said that if he were to be hanged it would be enough for you to be flogged not simply as a compliment but to hurt as they flog the peasants pyotr stepanovitch took his hat and got up from his seat karmazinov held out both his hands to him at parting and what if all that you are plotting for is destined to come to pass he piped suddenly in a honeyed voice with a peculiar intonation still holding his hands in his how soon could it come about how could i tell pyotr stepanovitch answered rather roughly they looked intently into each other's eyes at a guess approximately karmazinov piped still more sweetly you'll have time to sell your estate and time to clear out too pyotr stepanovitch muttered still more roughly they looked at one another even more intently there was a minute of silence it will begin early next may and will be over by october pyotr stepanovitch said suddenly i thank you sincerely karmazinov pronounced in a voice saturated with feeling pressing his hands you will have time to get out of the ship you rat pyotr stepanovitch was thinking as he went out into the street well if that imperial intellect inquires so confidently of the day and the hour and thanks me so respectfully for the information i have given we mustn't doubt of ourselves he grinned hm but he really isn't stupid and he is simply a rat escaping men like that don't tell tales he ran to filipov's house in bogoyavlensky street end of part two chapter six section five recording by expatriate in bangor maine